Ten. Keisha decided that the most important things to pack were her books, the ones that had baffled and frustrated her for so long. Hopefully, Nightwind would be able to explain them as well as she had explained shielding. She wrapped them carefully, then packed up enough of her clothing for a few days, and as an afterthought, added her work basket. She doubted that she'd have any time to do any fancy work, but if she found herself with time on her hands and nothing to do, she'd be angry at herself for not bringing it. That didn't take very long, and she looked around for anything else to take with her: plants, seeds. Presumably, the Hawk brothers had plenty of medicinal plants of their own. The herbal. We can compare notes, and if they don't have some of my plants, we can get young plants out of the garden when they bring me back. So into the bag of books went the herbal, and she considered bringing a gift with her. After all, that was the only polite thing for a guest to do: bringing a guesting gift. But what could she bring that they didn't already have, and plenty of it? The scarlet dye. After all, everyone liked a good, strong scarlet, and she had a brand new cake bought at a very generous discount, besides the ample portion left from her experiments. She wrapped the cake carefully in paper, then in a scrap of cloth, and tucked that in with the rest. With nothing more that she could think of, she went out to set up the garden to take care of itself for a few days. She and the potter had an arrangement. All of the big storage jars that came out of the kiln with hairline cracks became hers, and she tested them to ensure that the leaks were very slow indeed. Then she moved them into the garden and placed them at intervals along the rows of plants. Normally she kept them covered and empty, but if she knew she was going to be busy for several days running, she filled them with water and left them. The slow leaks would drip water into the ground, keeping the plants watered without her needing to ask someone to tend them. Tedious as the job was, well, it was time to fill the jars, then transplant all the seedlings she had in the cottage into the garden. At least it would fill the time and keep her from chewing her nails waiting. The jars were full, and she was mindlessly arranging and rearranging her shelves when Nightwind finally tapped on the door again. "Are you ready?" the woman asked as Keisha turned to face her. Keisha licked dry lips and nodded. "It's almost sunset. Are you really going to travel in the dark?" she asked, not quite certain of the journey ahead of her. "Darkness doesn't make much difference to the Daihili," Nightwind replied as Keisha took up her bundled belongings and hurried outside. "Are we going to follow Daihili?" Keisha asked, right on Nightwind's heels. "No, dear." We're going to ride them," the woman said, managing somehow not to sound patronizing. Keisha halted abruptly when she realized that the entire group was right at her doorstep, patiently waiting for her. Her usual hesitation around strangers came back redoubled. She felt too frozen to move with all those eyes on her, but Darion came to her rescue, taking the bundles from her hands before she could drop them, smiling encouragingly at her. "Come on, I'll introduce you to your Daihili," he said, taking her hand and giving it a little tug to get her moving. As soon as she took the first step, he dropped her hand again as casually as he had taken it. She followed him to one of the horned animals, who looked at her with interest from intelligent brown eyes. Keisha, this is Miri," he said, exactly as if he was introducing two people. She'll be taking you to Kevaldemar Vale. You have a quiet mind," said a clear voice in her head. "I shall enjoy bearing you." Keisha felt her eyes widening. She talks," Keisha blurted without meaning to. Darion, bless him, did not laugh at her. Just like a companion," he said cheerfully. Though Daihili talk to anyone that they choose to, and companions normally only talk to their heralds. You'll like Marie. She's very interested in herb healing. 
You might know some things growing around here that she doesn't, and vice versa. You'll have plenty to talk about as you travel, at least. The notion of trading herb knowledge with a deer almost made her laugh nervously, yet she kept it back. But after all, why not discuss herb knowledge with someone who happened to have four feet instead of two? Certainly she ought to warn Marie about the sheep sorrel fungus. Darion made a cup of his hands and boosted Keisha up into the saddle. There were stirrups, though they were loops of leather rather than metal, and she had a little trouble getting her feet into them. He fastened her belongings behind the odd saddle. The Daihili did not have a bridle or reins, only a kind of handle at the front of the saddle for her to slip her hand into. She hadn't ridden enough to feel comfortable, even on so familiar a creature as a pony, so she did just that immediately. Darion swung into a saddle on a handsome stag with such effortless grace that she felt embarrassed that she had been so clumsy. But after all, she consoled herself, he's been riding around Valdemar for four years. He ought to be good at this. Don't worry, child, Marie said sympathetically into her mind. Taledras are masters at making people feel self-conscious. They don't mean to. It just happens. Oddly enough, the remark made her feel a bit better, and she settled herself, trying to get the feel of the saddle. That seemed to be the signal to move out. Darion hadn't even settled into his saddle, and the entire group launched off with a great leap, at a pace that left her hanging on for dear life. She'd expected an easy amble. Instead, it was a bounding lope that bounced her backward and forward, throwing her alternately toward the Daihili's rump, then toward the wickedly dangerous horns. This can't be comfortable for either of us. Move with me, came the patient voice in her head. Here, like this. This was unlike the way that Nightwind had simply touched her mind. The Daihili seized her mind in a gentle but implacable mental grip, and she found her body moving under someone else's control for a few moments. It happened too quickly for her to panic. She took note of the way her body now felt, how it moved, for she could feel, even if she didn't have control, and just as abruptly, Marie released her. It took a few moments for her to get herself properly coordinated, but once she got the knack of it, everything fell into place and she began to enjoy herself. She was going far faster than she herself could run, with the wind of their passing in her face and hair, the forest all around her. She felt the Daihili's powerful muscles moving under her legs and hands, and the thought came to her that Marie was far stronger than she looked. By the time she was comfortable with riding, they were well into the forest, far enough that she didn't immediately recognize exactly where they were. They might even be past the areas she was familiar with by now. It was already dusk beneath the trees, a thick blue dusk with a flavor of its own, of old leaves, crushed evergreen needles, a touch of damp, and the scent of sap. Overhead was the sound of wings. As she looked around, she saw that many of the riders had a perch built onto the fronts or backs of their saddles, and their birds perched there, taking the movement of the Daihili as easily as the movement of a branch in the wind. If they weren't asleep, they were comfortable and relaxed. So if the bond birds were down here with their riders, what was flying above? Kel, the griffin, Marie answered. He's the one you hear. There are three owls as well, but you won't hear them. Owls fly silently. Can you hear everything, I think? Keisha asked, feeling a little nettled at this intrusion on her thoughts. You aren't shielded, so of course I can. I'll stop if you want me to. 
Miri sounded perfectly indifferent, as if such a thing wouldn't matter to the Daihili, but maybe that was just Keisha's own shading on the answer. Good question. Would it matter? Miri was unlikely to gossip about Keisha's innermost thoughts, after all. Your innermost thoughts are of very little interest to me. Now, if you were a member of Kevaldemar Heard, it would be different, but gossip about humans is, at the most, not even entertaining for one of us. Keisha had a vision of a pair of Daihili with their heads together over a back fence, kerchiefs tied over their horns, gossiping like a pair of Erald's Grove matrons, and giggled. That destroyed any annoyance she'd been feeling, and she attempted to frame her answer in thought rather than speech. What about gossip about plants? Do you know about the fungus that grows on sheep sorrel? Speaking this way was easier than she had thought. Instead of having to say sheep sorrel and then attempt to describe it and the fungus, she found she could just picture them clearly. Sheep sorrel, yes, but what of this fungus? Marie replied, and they were off, with both Keisha and Marie becoming more and more animated as the ride progressed. Keisha learned about half a dozen plants that she recognized but hadn't known uses for. Marie learned even more from Keisha. Marie referred to things not only by how they looked, but how they tasted. Keisha wished she had her herbal handy. She wanted badly to make some notes in the blank pages. We can go over this later, when you can write and draw, Marie promised. You will have the time. I will see to it, and I will not forget what you want to record. Keisha realized she had learned more about the gift of mind speech in a few hours conversing with Marie than she had gleaned in all the books sent her by the Collegium. For instance, along with that simple statement came attached information that the Daihili, as a species that had no way of recording information, relied entirely on trained memory, so much so that Miri literally could not forget unless she chose to, or a stronger mind took the memory from her, that another race, the Kairi, also trained their memories in the same way. This extra information just tagged along with the rest, like lambs behind their you, but just popped up in Keisha's memory as she examined the statement. The idea made Keisha dizzy. Imagine having entire libraries of knowledge right in your mind, instead of having to look things up. How could anyone manage all that? How did Marie keep it all straight? Look and see, was Marie's reply, and she obligingly opened her mind to Keisha without a second thought. Keisha could only bear a few moments, but it was fascinating, with all the information neatly arranged in a flexible web, so that many trains of thought would lead to a particular bit of knowledge. Each bit led to others that were related, and new bits could be fitted in without stress. Like game trails in the forest, she thought, dizzied, as Marie closed off her mind again. Very like, Marie agreed. Now, have you come across anything as a cure for wet tail? By that time, it was so dark that Keisha couldn't see anything, and she allowed herself to trust to the Hawk brothers around her and not worry about what might lie out there under the cover of shadows. The conversation with Marie was fascinating enough to keep her attention, so much so that the time passed without her noticing how long the ride had been, until Marie said, If you look ahead, you will see the beacons atop the two rock spires that mark the entrance to Kevaldemar Vale. 
She rose a little in her stirrups to look past the rider ahead of her, and sure enough, there were two blue-white lights in the distance, shining beneath the branches of the trees with huge clouds of bugs swarming around them, winking in and out of sight as the light reflected from their wings. Now and again, something larger flashed through, a bat taking advantage of this insect feast. As they neared, she saw that the lights were not as bright as she had thought. They only seemed that way in contrast to the darkness. Nearer still, and she realized that they weren't lanterns or any other sort of light that she knew. They were round balls, about the size of her fist, perched somehow on the tops of two rough-hewn pillars of rock about three times the height of a man. This was certainly nothing like Erold's Grove. The Dihele slowed as they neared the pillars until they were moving no faster than a walk. You will soon see Hertasi, so do not be alarmed, Marie warned, and the image of the Hertasi came to Keisha along with the name. She was glad for that warning, for she would certainly have been alarmed otherwise. A man-like lizard with rows of sharp, pointed teeth that walked on its hind legs would qualify as a monster by Erold's Grove standards, and probably a dangerous one at that. But when the little lizard people crowded around the arriving riders at the entrance to the Vale, she managed to smile at them, albeit a little nervously. Darion joined her as soon as Marie stopped moving and helped her to dismount. She completely lost her nervousness in the unexpected pain of her legs as she swung her offside leg over the saddle and tried to slide down to the ground. Her legs absolutely refused to bear her weight, and they hurt. Only hanging on to the saddle and Darion's support kept her from ending in a heap on the ground. Ooh, she groaned indignantly. What happened? I thought I was in good shape. You are, Darion said with sympathy. You just aren't a Dihele rider yet. He held her steady as her legs wobbled under her, and she took a couple of tentative steps away from Miri. I guess I'm not any kind of rider, she replied, as one of the lizards took her bundles and the Dihele's tack, and Marie moved off. Finally, her legs stopped rebelling, though they were still horribly sore, and she was able to hobble without assistance. The lizard whispered something musically to Darion. He replied in the same language, and it scampered off with her things before she could stop it. I'll take you to the guest lodge, Darion offered. That's where the Herr Tassi is taking your bundles. It has a bed, I hope, she groaned. There must be wonders all around her, but at the moment she was in no condition to enjoy them. He laughed. I think you need a soak in hot water more than a bed. The idea of a hot bath was heavenly, but she thought she remembered something about the Hawk Brothers and communal bathing, which did not appeal to her at all. I have an offer for you, he said, interrupting the thought. My home is nearer than the guest lodge, and you aren't used to the customs of our hot pools. I'll set you up with a private bath and go on to the lodge and see everything is ready there for you. Then I'll come back and get you. Disrobing in a stranger's house and taking a bath there, and not just a stranger, but a strange male? Her mother would be scandalized, but again, this wasn't Errol's Grove. The promise of a hot bath and the state of her sore muscles decided her. Besides, even if I were as pretty as Shandi, which I'm not, at the moment I'm sweaty, dirty, and staggering. That's hardly enticing. Thank you. You are the most considerate person I have ever met, she said fervently. Oh, you should meet some of the others before you say that, he replied lightly. Here, come this way. Other than the two pillars, so far she hadn't seen any signs that this place was inhabited. 
As she followed him up a twisting path, she still didn't see any kind of housing, though the path itself was man-made and very ornamental, with a sparkling little stream crossing it several times, all manner of fragrant flora and baroque lanterns hanging from carved posts. I thought you were settling here, she said. Where is everyone? Up there, he pointed, and she looked upward toward the trunk of the tree he indicated. There's a house up there, she exclaimed involuntarily, stopping and staring in fascination. Warm rounds and rectangles of light betrayed windows, and through the branches she glimpsed bits of walls and floor and a stair spiraling around the trunk. An ekele, he corrected. Almost everyone has an ekele. Hawk brothers prefer to roost, he grinned. The exceptions are the Hertasi, who'd rather burrow, the Kairi, who like caves, the Keleshia Kaledain, like night wind, who like homes built into the sides of cliffs, and me. She was relieved to discover she wasn't going to have to climb one of those twisting staircases. With the way her legs felt, she wasn't certain she'd be able to make the trip. And here we are, he announced just then, gesturing grandly at a tall mound of leaves, a mound with windows glowing warmly beneath the leaves, that is. He opened an otherwise invisible door, and they stepped into one of the oddest and yet most inviting houses Keisha had ever seen. There wasn't a single straight line in it, though, and that was a bit disconcerting. One of the Hertasi designed this place, he said, as he led her through the first room, which was so neat and clean she could hardly believe it belonged to a male. A second, obviously a bedroom, and a bit more cluttered, and into the third. There was a single oil lamp, turned low, hanging from a wall sconce. He turned it up and busied himself with a metal spout in the wall. The whole room was tiled in white, pale blue, and pale green ceramic. Even the ceiling, what there was of it, was tiled. Most of the ceiling was actually a window, and around the four sides of this window were boxes with vines growing in them. Sunken into the floor was a tile-lined bathtub. Darion had just turned a spigot and put a plug in a hole in the bottom of it, and water poured in. Clear, clean, and very chilly-looking, the spray made her shiver. Darion watched as the water filled the tub and turned the spigot again when it was within a thumb length of the rim. But then, before Keisha could ask him how the water was supposed to be heated, he held his hand out over it. Something was happening, something she felt rather than saw, until she closed her eyes and did that little trick with vision. Then she saw light energy moving from Darion to the water. But what did that mean? Wait, it was getting warmer in this little room and more humid. A moment later, she knew where the heat was coming from, for the water in the tub had started to steam. Try that with your hand, and tell me if it's hot enough, Darion said, just as she blinked and lost the oversight. She knelt at the side of the tub and gingerly put her hand in. A little more and it would have been too hot. Definitely, she told him. He grinned. I like it a lot hotter, but I'm used to the Hawk Brother pools. Now, just wait a moment and I'll bring you something to wear when you get out." He ducked into the bedroom and came back with a loose, gauzy shirt and breeches of the same materials. You can keep these. They're too small for me now. He opened a wickerwork chest next to the tub. Clean, dry towels are in here. He turned and pointed to a series of stone boxes at the side of the tub. Gourd sponges are in there, a scrub brush, and soap. There's a couple of different scents, so you've got a choice. I'll be back in a while. He didn't wait for her reply, he just left, and she heard the outer door close after him. She peeked out, just to make sure that he'd really gone, but the little house was absolutely empty, except for herself. Well, 
There was no point in letting the water cool. She stripped to the skin and eased gingerly down into the hot tub, which was long enough for her to stretch completely out and deep enough that the water came up to her chin. Immediately, the heat eased the sore muscles of her legs, and she sighed and relaxed against the sloped, tiled back of the tub. If anyone had told me about what this place was like, I would never have believed them. Would she be too spoiled by this veil to want to go home again? I could put some comforts together with help. A bathing room of her own, for instance, wouldn't be too difficult to add to the cottage. The potter could make the tiles. If I built an oven underneath the tub, instead of sinking the tub into the floor, I could heat my own water. A rainwater cistern on the roof would give me water for the tub, or I could tap into the irrigation system, or I could pump it from the well at the sink and carry it. The cistern would be the least work. That would be a good way to warm someone up who was badly chilled, too. A reasonable excuse for me to ask for help building it. She grinned to herself. No, she probably wouldn't be so spoiled she wouldn't want to go back, not as long as she could figure out ways to reproduce the aspects of this place that she liked. When she'd soaked long enough that she thought she'd be able to move again without moaning, she finished her bath with rosemary soap and allowed the water to drain. Darion's old clothing, lightly scented with juniper, was a bit big on her, but it was so good to put on clean clothes that it didn't matter. She rolled up the waistband and arms so she didn't look too much like a child playing dress-up. She decided to wait for him in the outermost room and bundled up her old clothes and took them with her. When he arrived, he looked pleased to find her there. Your room is ready in the guest lodge, and the Hertasi are bringing you something to eat there in the morning. That will be easier for you than trying to find our dining hall right off. You can leave your clothes here, if you'd like, he added. The Hertasi will clean them and bring them back to you by morning. I could get to enjoy having Hertasi doing everything, she sighed, as she laid her clothing to one side. It's a good trade for them— and for us, he agreed, as she followed him out on to the dimly lit trail. They get safety, protection, and share our food and supplies, and we get their service. Out there, they wouldn't have a chance. Cold slows them down. They'd make prime prey for the slave trade, and they'd wear their little lives away trying to grow enough food to stay alive. In here, they don't have to worry about any of that. We even have a festival twice a year to thank them, where we take care of them and give them gifts, he grinned. They are very tolerant of our cooking, but twice a year is all they can stand. How are you getting food and supplies, she asked curiously. Trade and hunting, he replied promptly. There are some things we grow for ourselves, but staples we trade for. It makes more sense for us to grow very exotic and rare things than to try to cultivate acres of wheat. We've already set up a pact with Lord Breon, for instance. He's quite pleased to be getting some of our goods in trade for flour and so forth. And here is the guest lodge. They had just gone around a twist in the trail, and there, beneath the shade of an enormous tree that supported an ekele around its trunk, was a building similar to Darion's little home, with rounded walls and a tiled roof. The main difference seemed to be that this place was not screened by a growth of vines, and that it looked to be bigger than Darion's. Young vines at the base of the walls promised that soon this building would be camouflaged, too. There are six rooms here for now, though you're the only guest, Darion told her. We went ahead and put you in the first one. He opened the door as he spoke and ushered her into a kind of common room, lit by another oil lamp with several doorways radiating from it. The nearest was open with a light inside. There will be more lights around here when Lord Breon gets our lamp oil to us. Night wind or fire song will send someone for you in the morning. 
She yawned hugely, covering her mouth in embarrassment. I was going to ask you to introduce me to the griffin and your owl, but I don't think I can stay awake that long. That's what the morning is for, Darion replied genially. You go get some sleep. After your first Dihili ride, I'm sure you need it. Sleep as long as you need to. He left her alone in the building, which now seemed much larger than it had a few moments ago. She entered the lit room and found that her things had been unpacked, the clothing hung neatly on a bar mounted to the wall or folded and set in a basket beneath the hanging clothes. The books were all stacked on a table next to the bed with a quill pen, ink, and paper. The only other thing on the table was the lamp. Her work basket waited beside the table. It was all rather spare compared to Darion's home, but then this was only supposed to be guest quarters. The bed, however, looked soft and inviting, and she climbed right into it without undressing to find it was as comfortable as it looked. She thought about getting up and changing into a sleeping shift, but it was too comfortable. She didn't want to do anything but blow out the lamp and fall into dreamless sleep. So that was precisely what she did. When she awoke the next day, it was with a feeling of excitement and anticipation that was enhanced by an aroma so mouth-watering that her stomach growled loudly and insisted she must get up and get dressed to investigate the source. Light filtered in through the gauze curtains of the window over the head of her bed. She leaped out of bed and changed out of the clothing she'd borrowed from Darion, which had been wonderfully comfortable to sleep in, and into one of her healer trainee uniforms. That was mostly what she had packed for this trip. She felt a little self-conscious about them, but they were the best clothing she had, bar her festival clothes, and she really was a trainee now. Still brushing her hair and barefoot, she opened the door to the common room, and on a table was the source of the fragrant aromas. Three rounds of bread that by the scent were stuffed with something— Beside the plate of bread rounds stood a cup and pitcher of cold, sweet tea. The first roll she bit into was still warm and stuffed with onion and sage-spiced sausage, the second with rosemary-spiced vegetables, and the third with berry jam. She ate every crumb and drank half the tea. When she had finished her meal, she noticed a familiar-looking pile of neatly folded fabric on a chair near the outer door. Sure enough, it was yesterday's clothing, clean again. Now what? she wondered, and finally brought out her work basket, opening the outer door to let in some fresh air and signal that she was awake and ready to go to work. She was left in peace for a little and had come to the end of a pattern when a faint scratching sound made her look up. One of the lizard creatures stood in the doorway and it nodded when it saw that she had noticed it. Now in the daylight she saw it more clearly, with its huge expressive eyes and intelligent look. It was unexpectedly appealing. In fact, it's awfully cute, she thought, softening toward it. She put her work away and stood up. The lizard beckoned with an outstretched talon, and she followed it out into the veil. She was glad that Nightwind had sent a guide. The place seemed to be a maze of little paths. Eventually the trees ahead thinned out and disappeared, and they emerged on the edge of a small lake with a cliff on the opposite side. The lizard vanished, and Keisha looked around in confusion. Over here, Nightwind called, waving from atop an expanse of rock. Beside her lounged the griffin. Keisha walked toward them, slowly, taking it all in. The griffin was perhaps the most stunning creature she had ever seen, barring fire song. His head had a definite eagle look to it, though he had a pair of real feather-tufted ears. His fingers were a gleaming golden brown with gold markings, and he was huge. 
His bright gold eyes were fixed on her as she approached. They were like enormous rounds of tiger-eye stone come to miraculous life. Darion reminded me that you wanted to meet Kel, Nightwind said as she neared. So, this is Kelvrin, our resident senior griffin. Kel, this is Keisha Alder, the healer of Erold's Grove. I am pleased to make your acquaintance, the griffin said politely, bowing his head. And I yours, Keisha replied, with a little genuflection of her own. My title, my job, is Trondirin, which means that I primarily take care of and heal those who are not human, Nightwind went on, especially the griffins. Kel and I have been partners in that way since we were both accepted into the Silver Griffins. In a small group like this one, I also heal the humans. When we grow larger, we will have separate healer and trondirin, though they will both be expected to work together and assist each other. Keisha nodded, but couldn't think of a response. Nightwind patted the rock beside her, inviting Keisha to join her. Keisha climbed up and sat down, with the griffin within touching distance of both of them. There were long, stiff feathers, much like guard hairs around the nostrils and eyes. The great beak was polished or waxed, gleaming in the sun, like a raptor. He had double eyelids, the inner one probably to protect his eyes during a fight or a kill. He had a spicy, sweet scent to him, a hint of ginger and cinnamon, which rather surprised her. He wore jeweled ear studs in each ear, and the shafts of each crest feather had been decorated in jewel tones and gold leaf to match the ear studs. "'You aren't maintaining your shield,' Nightwind observed. "'You are going to have to get into that habit.' Any time you think about it, make sure it's there. If you're checking it a hundred times each day, that's not too many. Use a mnemonic if you have to. Associate the checking with something you see a lot of. Fallen leaves, stones in the path. Already feeling guilty, Keisha put her shield up and Nightwind nodded. That's better. Now. I'm going to ask you some questions, because I suspect that you have already done some things with your gift that you aren't really aware of doing, and I want to find out what they are. She began to question Keisha closely, asking her all sorts of odd things. Had she ever known what was wrong with a human or animal by just looking? Had she ever found herself knowing that she had given a human or animal enough medicine without measuring? Had she ever felt drained and tired after helping someone, even though she hadn't done a great deal of physical labor? The list of questions went on and on. Some seemed quite senseless, but others were surprising, because Keisha had felt or done those things and hadn't known how or why. Finally, night wind was through, and she looked down at the notes she had taken with a wax board and stylus. You're using your gift with animals, rarely with children, never with adults, she said. You're using it mostly to determine what exactly is wrong with them and what dosages of medicines are sufficient. You are not using your gift to heal without medicine. That's about normal for someone who's untrained, but who is developing a powerful healing gift. She seemed to be waiting for a response. It's nice to know that I'm normal in something, at least, Keisha replied dryly, and Nightwind laughed. I've asked Kel to help me this morning, in part because I'm intimately familiar with him, and in part because the way he's put together is going to give you some surprises. She raised a brow, and Kel chuckled. Remember how I touched your mind, and you saw through my eyes yesterday? Lower your shield, and we'll do that again, but this time we'll be looking at Kel using healing oversight. 
So began the most intense mourning that Keisha had ever spent in her life. She learned that there were many kinds of oversight, many ways of using it, and how to use all the kinds that she had. Specifically, she began to learn how to use it to discover what was wrong with someone, whether it was injury or illness. But I'm mostly treating either familiar animal diseases or humans who can tell me what's wrong, she protested. Nightwind raised that eyebrow again. Oh, indeed. What about someone who is unconscious, someone with multiple injuries who isn't aware of all of them, a child too young to talk? Do you always treat just the obvious symptoms without looking for anything further? She dropped her eyes and had to admit that this was exactly what she had been doing. That's acceptable for a beginner, for a trainee, but you can't stay a beginner forever, Nightwind said, softening her rebuke. At some point, you're going to have to function as a full healer, and the sooner that can happen, the better. By the end of the morning, Keisha had a dull headache, unlike anything she had ever experienced before, and Nightwind called a halt to the lessons. For this afternoon, I think you should go through your texts and see if now you understand some of what confused you before, her teacher told her. The headache you have now is due to using that part of your mind and gift that you haven't exercised before. "'rather like riding muscles. "'Keisha giggled a little at that, and Nightwind smiled. "'So this afternoon should be devoted to your books, "'and when your headache eases, "'I'd like you to start examining people and creatures around you "'in this new way. "'Stop when it starts to hurt again, "'but the more exercise you give this talent, "'the stronger it will become and the easier to use.' and remember to keep your shield up otherwise. Keisha felt dizzy with all the orders, but nodded anyway. Now we'll go get something to eat. I'll show you the common dining hall. Nightwind slid off the rock. Keisha followed her. Kel, thank you. We're done with you. Go fly your patrols. Happy to be of service, the griffin said genially, then took straight off from the rock in a thunder of wings that sent dirt and bits of debris flying in all directions. Nightwind also gave her the clue to following the paths, which turned out to be absurdly simple once you knew it. Paths leading to the entrance had reddish markers which were often colored stones beside the path. Paths leading to private residences had black markers. Paths leading to the water had greenish ones. Paths leading to the buildings housing the common areas, dining hall, kitchens, laundry, baths, and soaking pools, had gray markers. The paths themselves were made up of substances reflecting their key colors, bark, pebbles, sand, and so forth. Just follow all the gray paths, and eventually you'll come to what you're looking for, Nightwind told her. The guest lodge is on a gray path, too. Where paths met, there were marker stones in the appropriate colors, so sooner or later, no matter how lost she got, she'd eventually be able to straighten herself out. The dining hall turned out to be one of the few wooden buildings in the Vale, a long, low structure that was nothing like Keisha imagined it would be inside. One single room, with the ceiling supported by slender pillars, there was no real sign of what the room's function should be. It could have been used for any purpose required— Instead of rows of tables and benches, there were a few tables with stools, a great many cushions, some couches, and some individual chairs. Part of one corner had been built up with three raised tiers, also covered with cushions. At the far end, food had been laid out for people to help themselves, which they did, then taking their choices to sit however they chose to eat. 
There is almost always food here, even between meals, but hot food is only served at mealtime, Night Wind told her, as she directed Keisha in getting a wooden platter and helping herself. Things tend to happen in a veil that upset schedules, so there are plenty of folk missing the regular meals who need feeding at any given time. They found seats. Keisha felt much more comfortable eating at a table, and Nightwind began asking her questions about herself. Keisha discovered that she and the Trondiran had more in common than she would have guessed— both of them had a swarm of male relatives to put up with. In Nightwind's case, it was a horde of cousins rather than brothers, and both had younger sisters that they liked and missed enormously. Though Nightbird may come here anyway, but not until her training is finished. Both of them seem to have the same slightly cynical outlook on life as well. Nightwind had a better sense of the absurd, though, and Keisha wished she had Nightwind's ability to see humor in things. It looked to her as if Nightwind got more enjoyment from things by not taking them too seriously. I have to get back to work, Nightwind told her, when they'd finished eating and put their platters in the bin for dirty dishes. Keep following this grey path, and you'll eventually come to the guest lodge. She frowned slightly. At some point in the next couple of days, I'll have to get Tercel to give you our language. The Heratasi, for the most part, don't understand Valdemarin. If you see Darion and your headache is gone, tell him I said that. I will she promised, though she couldn't imagine how she was to learn a language on top of everything else. She wandered the grey path, enjoying the sights, and eventually did come to the guest lodge. With a sigh, she went inside and obediently got out her texts. To her delight, a large part of the things she had not understood did come clear, although the texts often used slightly different terms for things than Nightwind did. Oversight, for instance, was called Mage Sight or Healing Sight. Now that she knew some of the basics, though, she was amazed at how much the texts actually told her, occasionally explaining things better than Nightwind had. She became so absorbed in her studies that she barely noted the passage of time until she found she was straining to read, looked up, and realized that it was growing dark. More than that, her foot was asleep, and she was starving. She put the book down and decided to get some dinner on her own. She walked to the dining hall through a dusk lit softly by lanterns and scented with the perfumes of night-blooming flowers— a different sort of fragrance coming from the dining hall made her move a bit faster, though, and she shyly took her place amid a tangle of strange hawk brothers to get her platter and fill it. With a little searching, she found a quiet corner out of everyone's way and sat there, watching and listening to the strange music of their unfamiliar tongue. She was just about to leave when she almost literally ran into Darion. He caught her by the elbow as she passed him with a contagious grin for her when she realized who it was. Working hard? he asked with a wink. She made a face. Hard enough to get a headache, she replied, sighing. I wish I'd known this was going to be so difficult. Well, that's good. It means you're stretching new talents, he told her, without a hint of pity. Almost everything worth doing is hard, at least at first. Do you still want to meet Kuari? Absolutely. She remembered then what her teacher had told her. Oh, and Nightwind said to let you know if I saw you that she wanted, uh, someone to give me the hawk brother tongue. That would be Tercel. Darion identified, nodding, so that a wisp of hair dropped into his eyes, and he brushed it back with an absent-minded wave of his hand. Tercel is the king stag of the Daihili herd. He's the one I was riding yesterday. A Daihili teaching her a language? That doesn't seem right. They don't talk. I mean, 
Not allowed, she responded with a frown. How can he do that? Oh, you'll understand soon enough. Still have the headache? he asked, and she shook her head. Good. Let me bolt something down, and I'll take you to the Daihili Meadow. The sooner you have Taledras, the better. The Hertasi mostly don't understand Valdemarin. That's what Nightwind said. She followed him as he got bread rounds that looked very like her breakfast this morning and waited while he inhaled his dinner. Sorry about my manners, he said between bites. I got used to eating quickly, because things are always happening quickly around a veil. He grinned again. Maybe that's why we take our leisure so seriously, because most of the time we're madly scrambling to get things done. You've got to keep a balance in life, so that you can enjoy your pleasures completely, and then go and enjoy your work completely. Hela, when you rest well, you work better, right? She nodded. He led her down another series of twisting paths, coming out into a moon-gilded meadow full of the horned Daihili. One was patiently waiting for them where the path met the meadow. He wasn't all that much bigger than the rest, but there was a sense of power about him that Miri hadn't had. Darion has told me that Nightwind wishes you to have Taledra's tongue, rang a solemn voice in her mind. Will you lower your shield for me? She'd been diligent in remembering to check that she had it up, and lowering it was a little like relaxing her grip on something. She sighed as it came down, feeling something inside her head relaxing as well. Will I ever really do this without thinking about it? Tercel stood over her, a silver statue in the moonlight. Now sit, please. This will not take long. Obediently, she sat down on the grass. A moment later, she found herself looking up at Darion from a prone position with her head aching all over again and no notion how she'd wound up lying down when she'd been sitting just the heartbeat before. Sorry about that, Darion said apologetically. If I'd warned you what was going to happen, you'd have tensed up. Then it would have been harder on both you and Tercel. I know exactly how you feel right now. This is how they gave me the language years ago. It took her a moment to realize that he was speaking in the Hawk Brother language, and she understood it. How does he do that? she asked, sitting up and rubbing her head. How can he shove a language into my head when he doesn't actually speak it? Darion shrugged. I don't know exactly how. Being able to take over someone's mind like that is a special Daihili gift. The king stags use it to control the herd if they panic. It feels like he ran the whole herd through my head, she complained. Darion chuckled, and she got the sense that Tercel was amused as well. I know. I remember all too clearly how I felt after my turn, and it took me months to get comfortable with all the new concepts that showed up in my head along with the words. Come on, I'll show you back to the guest lodge and get a Herr Tassi to bring you a headache potion. He helped her to her feet. She had the presence of mind to turn to the Daihili before they left. I hope I didn't seem ungrateful. Thank you very much, Tercel, she said carefully. This is going to make things endlessly easier for all of us. You are welcome, and thank you for your courtesy. It will serve you well with my people, the stag said. Then he turned and walked calmly off into the moonlit meadow, just as if he hadn't just worked something very like a miracle. How are you coming with your studies? Darion asked her as they turned back onto the path. The good news is that I haven't got anything to unlearn, she replied, one hand to her aching temple. The bad news is that I have a lot to learn in a short time. From what the books say, I think it was a good thing Nightwind made her offer. I would never have worked this out on my own. You might have, he offered, surprising her. After all, somebody did. There had to be a first healer. 
I suppose so. The books had also told her just how close she had come to losing control of her gift and what that would have meant. No wonder she had thought longingly of becoming a hermit. She had very nearly been forced to do just that in order to stay sane. Nightwind is awfully kind, and a lot more encouraging than I thought she'd be, Keisha continued. And the best thing is that Nightwind says that I was right all along to say I couldn't go to the Collegium. She says that even untrained, I was doing things that Gil can't, and that my primary duty was to the people I take care of. I can see that. The lights of the guest lodge appeared ahead of them, and just as Keisha noticed them, a Herr Tassi also approached them on the path. Do you want to make the request? Darion continued. Or shall I? I'd like to, she decided. When the Herr Tassi neared, it seemed to sense that she was going to say something, and stopped, waiting attentively. If you would be so kind, I have just been given this tongue by Tercel the King Stag, and my head hurts dreadfully, she told it. It hissed with sympathy. I know just the thing, Keisha guessed, it replied. Shall I bring it to the lodging? Please, she replied with gratitude, and it whisked away so fast it almost seemed to vanish. Very good, Darion applauded. You're going to make a hawk brother yet. She thought about that, after Darion left her and the Herr Tassi had come and gone with her headache medicine. She hadn't really considered becoming a hawk brother, but Darion had, so obviously outsiders could. Could she come to serve both the Vale and the village as a healer in time? It was at least as intriguing as becoming a herald like her sister. 11. Kuari roused all his feathers with a full-body shake, then tucked up a foot and closed his eyes. He knew Darion wouldn't be going anywhere for a while. Well, what do you think of our little healer? Nightwind asked Darion as they gathered to meet with Lord Brion and Val. The Valdemarans had taken to coming over with the wagons full of trade goods rather than asking the Taledras to come to Kelmskeep. Darion had a notion that this was as much because both Lord Brion and his son were fascinated with the new veil as it was to save the Taledras the inconvenience of making the trip. I think she isn't little at all. Darion responded, deciding that Nightwind was fishing, and he wasn't going to take the bait. She's the same age as me. Nightwind laughed. Point taken. I think she's going to be quite competent. She's easy to get along with, and I wish I could persuade her to live here instead of Erald's Grove. We could certainly use her. I don't think there's any way you could get her to forsake the village, Darion replied thoughtfully, pulling his hair behind his ears. She takes her responsibilities awfully seriously. Oh, I didn't mean she should give up tending the villagers, Nightwind corrected, shaking her head. I just don't think they need to have her there to handle every hangnail and black eye. She could get there from here within a candle mark by Griffin Carrier, and for anything less than serious, she could visit once or twice a week, easily enough. He had to laugh at that. Nightwind sounded as if she'd already decided for Keisha, and if he understood Keisha at all, he doubted she cared for anyone making up her mind for her. I don't know. You'd have to persuade her first. At least they're taking her more seriously than they did Justin, and they're treating her quite well. Having to do without can make people astonishingly appreciative, Nightwind said dryly. The conversation might have continued in the same interesting vein, but at that point the voices of several people in discussion drew nearer, and in a moment he and Nightwind were joined by the rest. Bond birds flew in to roost ahead of their bondmates. Wheel and her took perches near Kuari and began preening each other, while Aya joined Starfall's bird, who had been there all along. 
As Aya settled himself, the rest of the group entered the garden. They met in Starfall's garden beneath his ekele, a miniature version of the various garden spots within Kevala Vale, except that all of the plants here were cold-hardy, either evergreens or plants that would have a leafless, dormant period during the winter. Right now, of course, they were flourishing mightily, coaxed into accelerated growth and quick maturity by Steelmind and some of his apprentices— Tough vines had been woven and trained to form the frames for comfortable seats, holding cushions stuffed with dried grasses and fragrant herbs. Canopies of more vines shaded the occupants, while tall shrubs, climbing plants, and young trees gave the place privacy. A tiny waterfall plunging into a pool, filled with young fish, sent cooling spray into the air and lent the soothing music of falling water to the setting. Though, thanks to some of the bond birds, the pool had to be restocked regularly. Yet, with that art that was the hallmark of the Taledras, all of this carefully contrived work of man seemed to have been magically wrought by nature. By common consent, most meetings with Lord Brion were held here. The Herr Tassi provided anything in the way of refreshment that might be needed, shade and water cooled the air, and no one really wanted to be inside on days of good weather. Meetings weren't held in bad weather, because a delay in the arrival of the Valdemarin trade supplies meant nothing, and if the weather was going to be bad, why risk the chance of accident or spoilage? With so many mages here in Kevaldemar, it was a simple matter to read the weather, then make certain that Lord Brion got warning of any storm that could not be delayed or hurried on. It was a pity that the discussions here in this oasis of tranquility had little to do with peace and growth. "'I have word back from the capital,' Lord Brion said, when they were all seated." Besides Nightwind and Darion, the usual participants from Kevaldemar were all in attendance. Aishin, Kel, Starfall, Snowfire, Hashi, and Firesong. They are sending us the small force we asked for, under the direction of a herald with experience in diplomacy. Two Herr Tassi made the rounds, offering cool drinks, and vanished when everyone had been served. Starfall nodded, and his face betrayed the relief he felt. I am glad to hear that, the more so because of what Kelvrin saw on his patrol this morning. Kel? Yes. The griffin took up the thread, sitting up very straight, intense and serious. I have seen the barbarians. They are at the farthest point in my patrols. They continue in their pattern. This was no news to Darion or Nightwind, who'd heard it directly from Kel before the meeting. Aishin had no expression, Snowfire looked resigned, and behind his mask there was no telling what Firesong thought. Lord Brion nodded. After all, he had probably been expecting to hear this for some time. That would be making a fortified camp, remaining until the hunting and grazing are down, then moving on? Exactly so, Kel agreed, bowing his head in Lord Brion's direction. And as reported, they do have children, women, old people— even babes in arms and pregnant women, not what I would call an army. Lord Brion frowned as if this wasn't altogether good news. But it is an invading and occupying force, especially if they are sending out scouts ahead of the main group and intend to keep the non-combatants in a protected camp while the fighters deal with any resistance. He does have to think of these things, Darion reminded himself, and took note for the future. Some day, presumably, so would he. It's also the pattern of nomadic herders, like the Shinain, Snowfire pointed out, to cover all possibilities. They may not even know there is a settlement anywhere near. 
It simply could be that they've depleted their old grazing grounds too much to recover in a single season, or that all the magical weather disruption of the past decade has caused a drought in the north. Lord Brian nodded. Also true. But really, we can't have them coming into Valdemar or the Pelagirs and establishing new grazing grounds without asking permission first. It is our land, after all. The Crown says that in accordance with our long-established tradition, if they are peaceful and agree to settle, we are to welcome them. But they will have to follow the law." True enough, Snowfire agreed. If we ignore them and let them proceed as they wish, we simply send a message that whoever else wants to flood down here will meet no resistance and no law. If we choose to let them remain here, it must be by treaty, with agreed-upon limits and on our terms. I think we ought to fight them, Val burst out. Why should we let them just wander in and take over? Why should we even tolerate them near our border? They're barbarians. Why should we want them here at all? We don't intend to let them wander in and take over. Haven't you been listening? Darion suppressed impatience with an effort. Look, I have the most reason of any of us to want to fight these people. Remember what they did the last time they came here? They hurt and killed people that I knew people I cared about. If it were up to my feelings, I'd lure them all under a cliff and drop it on them, pregnant women, grandmothers, babies and all. But those feelings should have nothing to do with this, and there are women and children, at least in that group, that had nothing to do with what happened the last time, and certainly don't deserve to be judged by me. For all we know, this isn't even the same tribe. They may know nothing about what happened years ago. They could be peaceful. They could be running away from the same lot that overran us. Val cast a glance at him that was part contempt, part incredulity. But since the rest were all nodding agreement, including his father, Val said nothing more. Darion had the feeling that the subject wasn't finished, though, and he'd hear more from Val about it. Starfall let his gaze rest on Darion, but Darion had the feeling his words were meant for Val. The greatest leaders in both our histories were always those who understood the motivations of those they faced, he said. When you understand why they move, then you know what to offer and what to withhold. The discussion continued as if Val's outburst had never occurred. I think we ought to first contact them in a way that impresses them, Firesong said thoughtfully. Today his mask was of thin, pale doe skin that fit like a second skin, giving a more uncanny impression somehow than any of his more elaborate masks. A show of strength of all kinds, if you will. We should make it quite clear that we can handle anything they have with ease. I tend to agree, Lord Brian said, looking keenly at Firesong. Quite. I assume you mean a display of magic will be included in this? That, and the Bondbirds, perhaps some of our other allies. Firesong turned towards Snowfire. Didn't you say that these tribes have totemic animals? If we include apparently wild animals in the display, it might gain us a great deal of respect, spiritually as well as physically. As far as I know, they do, and they attempt to imitate the behavior of those animals. Bringing the birds, even the Daihili and Kairi, could very well impress them. The last lot had a bear totem, and their shaman had managed to partially change them to match that totem. Snowfire's eyes took on the sharp look that meant he was thinking quickly. If they have another such, we will need to get the upper hand magically at once. Creating change, children, in these days... Or he managed to partially control the change within a change circle, Firesong pointed out and both Snowfire and Starfall looked startled, then slowly nodded. 
That could have been simply a matter of caging bears in the same change circle as the warriors he wanted to change and hope that a melding took place. Just because he had specifically changed people doesn't imply great power or control. Master Levi is still taking a survey of the circles to discover if there is a pattern there, one as to which circles were exchanges of territory, which created monsters, and which simply melded the animals that were already within them. It wasn't, he added dryly, a priority at the time they were occurring to find that kind of pattern, but it might have occurred to others to look for one. But if there was a pattern, and the barbarians noticed it, that was Aishan. Or they simply took their chances, and it worked once, Darion put in. Given the behavior that we witnessed with the last lot, that wouldn't be out of character. The shaman didn't seem too worried about wasting lives. He'd have been perfectly happy with a single success, and one success would be all he'd have needed to impress the rest. There is that, agreed Starfall, as the rest who had been involved in that confrontation seconded Darion's observation. He sighed, and it is an interesting thought, but it doesn't explain why this lot has women, children, and oldsters along. Oh, why won't these people stay home? Because we have something they want, replied Firesong, with inescapable logic and they think they can just take it away from us. They're not interested in challenging us to a game of riddles to win it, or a bardic contest, or paying for it. That's why we call them barbarians. The rest chuckled, though the attempt at humor was a little strained, and so was the response. Even Val laughed uneasily. Now, we don't know yet whether they'll challenge us, or offer us something in trade, or give tribute, Aishan pointed out. Still, better we be more careful than less. The main thing now is to delay them if they come too close, I think, Lord Brion offered, which brings us back to Firesong's show of strength. Once the reinforcements arrive, we'll have a better idea of what their tactics will be, and exactly how forceful we'll have to be in order to impress them. And just how large our reinforcements will be, added Snowfire. Hopefully we'll be able to back our show, and not have to resort to bluff. Bluffing makes me very nervous. He shook his head. You know what the Shinain say. Bluffs either cost you half or twice. Kel, tomorrow I want you to do a thorough count if you can. Non-combatants, people who might fight, real warriors, and what their herds are. Kelvred nodded, hissing agreement. It will delay me. I will not return until nearly sunset. Snowfire waved that caution away. That's all right if you can manage to accomplish it. We need those counts to make reasonable decisions. Kel snorted contemptuously. If I can manage, I am not one of those elderly layabouts at Kevala, you know. Fear not, I shall have your counts, and they will be accurate in every detail. He paused. I will be seen, however. Fly high, though I will, the size and body shape will differ from a mere eagle, as it should be. Darion's lips twitched, and he watched Nightwind hide a smile. Oh, Griffins, how dull life would be without them. Now... Just to change the subject briefly, Starfall interjected, before anyone could laugh at Kel and hurt his feelings. How is our trade balance with you, Lord Brion? Dead even with this load. His face relaxed, but Val took on a look of boredom, rolling his eyes upward. It was obvious that Brion's son and heir would much rather have been discussing possible battle plans— is there any way we could get some of that patterned silk from you? Starfall pursed his lips thoughtfully. 
We aren't set up to make any here yet, but if we don't have what you want in stores, I don't doubt we can get it made up from Kevala. What did you have in mind? It isn't me, it's my lady. He looked sheepish. The wedding, you know. She's got a notion that we should all have new wedding clothes in the same patterned silk, but different colors. I don't think she cares what pattern, but I'd look damned silly in flowers. Val groaned, his attention recaptured. Darion didn't blame him. It was his wedding, after all, but his mother was obviously arranging it to suit her liking, not his. Poor bride. It obviously didn't matter what her taste was, either, for Val's mother was making all the decisions. Not flowers, and not rabbits, or cute little baby anything, or— How about a simple geometric, Nightwind interjected, before Val could wax eloquent on the subject of what he didn't want. Or water patterns, or leaves, feathers— "'Feathers would be good, or leaves, or water patterns,' Val told her, relief suffusing his features. "'As long as it doesn't make a girl squeal, "'Oh, that's adorable! It'll be all right.' "'Oh, dear. Obviously some of the arrangements have been getting that response. "'After taking part in the joining ceremony and vetoing a few such arrangements himself, "'Darion had sudden sympathy for poor Val.' Nightwind laughed. I think we can manage, she promised. She studied Brion and his son. I think a rich golden brown for your side of the wedding, and what's the bride's coloring? Val started to get a love-struck look in his eyes, and Brion caught it. He interrupted swiftly before Val could go into a flowery description. She's brown-haired, fair, pinkish fair. Val looked indignant at such a callously abbreviated depiction of his beloved, but Nightwind sailed on, settling the question of color for the benefit of trade. Blue, then, for the bridal party. We've got good silk dyes for both those colors, and both are popular with us. If we don't have something here, Kevala will have it in stores. Silk is light, especially silks for a warm weather wedding. I can ask for a griffin to fly them straight to Kelm's keep. It will be a good excuse for Kelvrin's lady friend to fly in for a visit. She cast a sly look at Kel, who contrived to look as if he hadn't heard her, but twitched his tail and shifted his hips. Tell your good lady she'll have her fabrics in a week at the very most. No one mentioned that in a week they might be facing off against the barbarians. Worry about that when we know what we're facing. No point in getting ahead of ourselves. Besides, taking care of wedding arrangements will keep non-combatant minds off the barbarians. And you'll want what? Brion asked. Same as the last time. Our needs don't change much. Have your seneschal or factor negotiate with Aishan for the price, Starfall said offhandedly, and Brion nodded with satisfaction. Since Kevaldemar had already presented Brion with the Vale's official wedding present, an exquisite set of colored glass goblets in sufficient quantity to allow the young couple to hold a reception for the queen and her entire council, brought for the purpose from Kevala, he wasn't looking for anything but a reasonable trade. Right. Now, barring a war with barbarians, we've got Harvest Festival coming up at the same time as the wedding. What had your people planned to bring to the fair? This was the signal for a far more mundane discussion, and Kel excused himself, and so did Val and Darion. Darion chose a direction at random, and Val followed him. I think I'm about to hear more from the would-be warrior. Val's thoughts had obviously turned back to the barbarians, and he accosted Darion as soon as they were out of hearing of the adults. Say, Darion, you've fought before, right? Darion made a sour face, fought the barbarians the first time around, and had some skirmishes with bandits in Valdemar. That's fighting people. 
We took out some change beasts in Valdemar too, but that isn't what you meant, is it? He continued walking, and Val kept right up with him. No, I meant combat, real fighting, the clash of sword on sword, the thrill of meeting man to man, facing your enemy and bringing him down. The clichés poured from Val as his face grew more and more animated. He obviously suffered from a surfeit of heroic ballads and tales. Darion decided to quash him. It wasn't that he disliked Val, that was far from the truth. If anything, he liked Brion's heir too much to let him go down that particular path of delusion. That path leads to an early grave, given bad odds. I've done that, he said flatly. You want to know what it's like? Val nodded eagerly, his earnest face alight. All right, here, sit down. They'd come as far as the lake while talking, and Darion gestured to a boulder. He took his seat on another and gave careful thought to exactly how he was going to say his say. First off, this isn't a duel. It's a combat. No rules. Do you know what that means at all? When Val shook his head, he continued. It means that the enemy is going to try to kill you before you can get close to him, so he'll be flinging, mucking great rocks at you, shooting at you, doing everything he can to keep you from getting close. He would much rather kill you from a distance, given the choice. If you get stuck with an arrow or knocked out by a rock, he's going to rush at you and try and whack something off while you're down and helpless, because it's easier to kill you then. If you don't get taken out by flying objects, every fellow on the other side is checking out the people coming at him, and he's going to try to make sure that he is bigger than you. If you've got fancy armor or weapons, he's going to want them too, so his best bet is to cut a leg out from under you or whack off an arm and leave you lying there screaming and bleeding to death. The other thing is that he's a greedy bastard, and anyone who looks even slightly important is going to have a lot of people coming at him all at once, all trying to be the one to get that fancy sword and armor. If he can't manage to cut off a limb, or at least cut it half off, he'll try to bash in your skull because that's the second easiest way to kill you. There's no fancy sword work going on. There's no room for it. You're mashed in with a bunch of other people, all whacking away. Meanwhile, as you're trying to keep him from doing awful things to you, and trying to do awful things to him, you're stepping on and stumbling over all the poor beggars who didn't manage to keep that from happening. They're bleeding, screaming, and dying. If they don't have fancy armor, their guts are spilling out, and you're stepping right in them. Some of them are people you know. Some of them are friends. Some might be relatives. And you'll be seeing them as nothing more than things you don't want to fall over. Val's face had gone rather sick, which Darion was extremely grateful for. Brion's son, thank all the gods, was intelligent and had imagination. That was probably why he'd gotten all caught up in the idea of adventure in fighting in the first place. That imagination would save him from his misguided notions of honor and glory if Darion had any say in the matter. When it's all over, if you're on the winning side, you're absolutely sticky with blood, ready to drop with exhaustion, and every place on your body aches. Hopefully the blood you're covered with is other people's. If some of it's yours, this is when you realize just how much even a little wound hurts. If you got a big wound, if you aren't on the ground already, or you aren't dying, you generally fall down when everything's over, screaming with the pain. You could have broken bones sticking through your skin, and you're seeing parts of the inside of yourself you never wanted to see. If you are really, really lucky... Someone recognizes that you're an important fellow and gets the healer to you in a hurry. If not, you'll be lucky to get yourself to the healer's tent somehow to wait for candle marks while he works his way down to you. This is also when the excitement and fear and so forth that carried you through wears off, and you start to remember that you stepped in your cousin's face, you saw your uncle's head caved in, and you're not sure if your best friend is still alive. 
There's stuff besides blood on you that used to be parts of people. That's when you look around, see all the dead, dying and wounded, and you throw up. Practically everyone else who never fought before, and some who have, is doing the same thing. That's what real combat is like. He stopped for a moment. Oh, and after a fight, healing takes second place to wound closure, so you may wait days or weeks before that wound in your leg that was cauterized closed, burned closed with a red-hot poker gets properly healed up. Val licked his lips, which were just a shade greenish. It's not like that in... I mean, I've never heard anyone talk about it like that. He seemed shaken, but not inclined to doubt Darion's word. Darion was quite glad he'd made a point of never exaggerating in front of Val. This was turning out as he'd hoped. Darion shrugged and tried to look weary and worldly wise. That's because no one wants to remember those parts. But ask your weapons master, and let him know you want to know what it's really like on a battlefield, before, during, and after the battle. If he's honest, he'll tell you the same things I did. He thought of something else. If you want, I can get one of the Daihili to give you the memory. They were in on the forest battle four years ago. Oh, Val remained silent, looking out over the lake for a while. Darion let him stew things over. He needed some time to get his mind wrapped around Darion's blunt description. But Val had, out of incredulity, gotten a Daihili to give him a memory of Kevala Vale. He hadn't believed the descriptions he'd heard of it until he'd experienced Tercel's memory— and he knew that Darion would never have offered him access to a memory of combat if it wasn't as vivid, or more so, than Darion's own description. Actually, given that the Daihili aren't predators, their memory is going to be a lot nastier than my description. Bloodletting offends every instinct they've got. I wondered why, father, and you— Val shook his head and looked mortified— I came very close to making a serious mistake. I have to apologize to you. Thought I was a coward? To Val's obvious surprise, Darion grinned. I'm not offended. I used to think the same things that you did about fighting. Honor, glory, adventure, fame, all that stuff. Probably everybody does, until he does it himself. Maybe a mercenary's children know better, and probably anyone who's had a fight go over his land does, but unless you've seen it for yourself, how can you know? His grin turned cynical. Well, think about it. How could they get us boneheaded youngsters to go out to get bits hacked off if they didn't make it sound glorious? Val managed a sickly sort of smile himself. You've got a point. He blinked, as if something had just occurred to him. Now that I think about it, battles almost never happen in empty land, do they? Not unless somebody manages to force it that way, no, Darion replied. The fellow was thinking, all right. Obviously, we're going to try to choose the ground ourselves, but we may not get to make that choice. So father isn't going to want something like that rampaging through the village, or over the crops, ruining them. Darion decided on a final, ghoulish touch. Imagine trying to eat crops that came up the next year in a field where people died. Crops fed on blood. Val shuddered. I'd rather not. So we bluff them, or negotiate with them, or, well, Fire Song, Snowfire, and your father have a lot of ideas, I expect. They've all fought before, and they've got all the reasons in the world to make peace first, if it can be done without making a bad bargain. It was Darion's turn to look pensively out over the lake. Believe me, if it were up to me, these people, or ones like them, killed Justin right in front of me. They hurt a lot of people I knew and killed a couple. They tried to kill me twice, and they nearly managed it. I'm the last person to want them to get off easy, but... He shook his head and looked back at Val... If we force them to fight, things will almost certainly be bad, and more people I know will be dead or hurt. 
I don't want revenge half badly enough for that. You know, I think Justin would be very happy to hear me say that. Val nodded very slowly, and Darion decided to change the subject so that they could part on a good note. So, tell me about this girl you're marrying. When does she get here? What is she like? How did you meet her? Since Belinda was obviously a subject Val could wax eloquent on for hours, this was the best thing he could have done. Until Lord Breon came to fetch his son for the trip home, Darion heard so much about Belinda that he suspected he could write a book, or at least several pages, about her many virtues. Val was completely smitten. When Breon did come to get Val, though, the hand clasp Darion got from the younger man, coupled with the thoughtful look and the nod they shared, let him know that Val had not forgotten the earlier subject. As Breon and his son rode off on the trail back to Kelmskeep, Darion felt quite proud of himself. Firesong came up beside him at that point. You look like a cat that's gotten into the cream, he said. What have you been up to? Convincing Val that fighting in battle isn't the way the bards sing about it, he glanced sideways at Firesong to see how the mage would react. Firesong laughed aloud, crossing his arms over his chest. Good for you. I knew you had more sense than he did about that particular subject, but I didn't know you'd take it on yourself to talk to him. Somebody had to. I'd as soon not see his bride become a widow, you know. He turned to Firesong and grinned. I'd have felt responsible. Good, Firesong nodded. You are responsible. It's when we stop feeling responsible for each other, for the people we know we can affect— that we become the barbarians. Firesong waited, and Darion sensed that there was another talk with his teacher in the offing. On the whole, he didn't mind those, except when Firesong seemed to expect an unreasonable level of magical expertise from him, given how short a time he'd been studying with good teachers— one of those had been just yesterday, in fact. Firesong had shouted impatiently at him, and he had left the lesson abruptly rather than lose his temper. Firesong cleared his throat, and Darion put on an attentive look. If there was any chance his teacher would actually apologize, he wanted to encourage it. Silver Fox gave me a bit of a lecture this morning before the meeting. Firesong finally said, actually sounding sheepish. When you do something that is exceptionally mature, like taking on young Val and disabusing him of the notion that battle equals painless glory, I start thinking of you not as a student, but as a potential peer. I get both of us in trouble when I do that, because then I expect a similar level of skill in magecraft— I expect that's what happened last night. He glanced at Darion out of the corner of his eye, and Darion just nodded warily. He didn't quite trust himself to actually say anything yet, but this was certainly a promising start. I got very impatient with you last night, and that was wrong of me. Silver Fox very properly reminded me that you are someone who has not had the benefit of working with unlimited energy, and that you are a real youngster, not an adult like the people I'm used to training. You act like them, but you simply haven't got experience. He tossed his hair back over his shoulder, a habit Darion noticed he had when he was nervous— the herald mages I've trained have almost all been in their twenties, or even older. I keep forgetting that you're only eighteen, and at the same level of teaching I was when I was only twelve or fourteen. Now, Darion gingerly cleared his throat. One year with poor Justin, and four years working with teachers who are not healing adepts, doesn't equal the kind of education you had, no— but you are right in that sometimes I just am not grasping what's going on. 
You were wrong in thinking it was because I'm too stubborn to admit my way is wrong. What you expect me to do simply doesn't occur to me. He flushed, thinking about how angry he'd gotten. The accusations still stung because they were so unjust. You're supposed to be my teacher, and it isn't fair to force me to guess answers I can't possibly reach. I think it might be because I'm not really Taledras, and I'm not used to thinking and seeing things as so intimately interconnected. Hellfires, your entire religion is built around that. He scratched his head and managed a sheepish grin of his own. Maybe that's why I got so hot and walked out of the lesson. It wasn't until I cooled down that I was able to figure out what you were saying and put it to use. Maybe you should wear a crest of Valdemar on your forehead to remind me, Firesong suggested facetiously. He snorted. Don't tempt me. If wearing one would prevent another dressing down like last night, teach me or don't. But don't play guessing games with me. That's all I ask. Firesong's posture conveyed a certain amount of discomfort, possibly because Darion had hit on several of the things Silverfox had evidently chided him about. Silverfox has promised to sit in on our lessons, if you don't mind, and throw things at my head if I start getting unreasonable. And I wondered if you'd mind if we included that little healer for the next couple of days. Having her there will keep me on better behavior, I suspect. And according to Nightwind, she could do with some of the same lessons you're getting." Having both Silver Fox and Keisha there is all right with me, Darion said instantly, hoping he could keep himself from betraying the fact that he would welcome Keisha there for more reasons than just sharing the lessons. He was more than a little interested in Keisha, yes, indeed, and he wouldn't mind the opportunity to see more of her at all. I'd also like to get the two of you working together now, so you can mesh your skills under my eye and not have to try it on your own, Firesong continued, at last looking more at ease. I work with healers all the time, but the first time you try is often full of pitfalls. It's like trying to do the Kianshi couple dance, when all you've ever done is children's round dances— Darion sensed a sudden grin behind the mask. Just thought you'd like to know what you're in for. He rolled his eyes. Thanks, he said dryly. All I have ever done magically is children's round dances, you know. And now you want me to attempt a fiendishly complicated display piece that not one couple in a hundred ever tries. Nonsense, Firesong dismissed. Neither the magic nor the dance is as complicated as they look, which is part of the problem. Don't worry. That's why I want you to do it under my eye. I'll walk you through it, and you'll be amazed how quickly you pick it up. I'll take your word for it, Darion replied dubiously. I suppose you'll want to try this tonight? Not tonight. Maybe tomorrow. Firesong clapped him on the shoulder. Tonight I plan to go over what I attempted to hammer into your thick skull last night, since you so obligingly told me you'd gotten the trick of it. Oh, hellfires, now I'm in for it, and I don't have any excuses. Yes, Firesong, Darion sighed. I'll be at the work circle at sunset. It was morning. But there was no real reason to leap out of bed, and Darion liked having the leisure to lie in the dark, thinking and listening to the birds twitter in the vines. After the magic lessons of last night shared with Keisha, he had a lot to think about. She'd been attentive, very careful, with a fine, delicate mental touch— much to Firesong's amazement, they had meshed powers almost at once, with the same surety of mental hand reaching for hand as long-time partners. Firesong had at least been polite enough to keep his comment of, Oh, 
So you like girls, do you? Strictly sent to Darion, but he hoped that Keisha hadn't noticed his sudden blush. He'd been impressed, and although Keisha had not shown any such emotion on the surface, Darion could tell that beneath her calm exterior she had been very close to tears of relief and joy. Well, she spent a long time not knowing how to use her gift, and not only being able to use it, but to know she can ask someone else to augment her power must be just exhilarating. He stretched and turned over on his side, with the scent of fresh linens and herbs tickling his nose. He could not imagine why other people had told him that Keisha was prickly. Serious, yes, and maybe too serious, but she'd had responsibility shoved at her for so long that she probably hadn't learned how to have fun. But prickly? Yet, so far, Val, Nightwind, Healer Gill, and even Lord Breon had warned him that Keisha was touchy, difficult to get to know, and held people at arm's length. He just didn't see any of those things in her, unless, if by touchy, they meant that she didn't have any sympathy for fools, if by difficult to get to know, they meant that she didn't talk about things she wasn't sure of, and if by keeping people at arm's length, they meant that she was shy. She was certainly shy. That seemed a little odd in someone who had such a mob of siblings, but maybe she'd learned to be very self-contained because of that. People in Errol's Grove respected her, but she didn't have any suitors. She didn't even have anyone he would have called a close friend. The young men of the village didn't even seem to think of her as a girl. All the better for me. If they can't see how pretty she is, that's their problem. On the other hand, maybe it's a bit difficult for anyone to think romantically about the person who's patched you up after doing something really stupid and threatened to hold your nose and pour medicine down your throat when you've had a sick stomach. He grinned into the dimness. He could just see Keisha doing that, too. His pleasant thoughts were abruptly interrupted by the uncharacteristically rude entrance of a Herr Tassi, who burst in through the front door. "'Darion, you are needed!' it cried as soon as the door flew open. He thrashed his way free of his covers and flung himself out of bed. "'Where?' he asked, stumbling into the room. "'What's the matter?' The outsiders come, the veil pillars, the others wait there, it said, and whisked out the door again, presumably to rouse other folks. The outsiders come? Well, it can't be an enemy attack, or there would be a lot more shouting going on outside. Besides, I don't think even a Hertasi would refer to an enemy attack as the outsiders come. With that in mind, he took some care in dressing, though he did so quickly, and left his weapons behind. When he reached the two pillars at the entrance, there weren't too many of the others waiting, just Kel, Nightwind, and Snowfire. "'What's going on?' he asked, combing his hair with his fingers and confining it with a headband. He'd combed it properly before he left, of course, but all his efforts at looking neat had been destroyed when he ran. Kel spotted an armed force with a pair of heralds leading it heading this way as he started out on patrol this morning, Snowfire said, as Kel nodded. He came back to tell us, and I sent Hertasi around to wake you all up. To Darion's chagrin, Snowfire looked as if he'd been up for hours, and had gotten the Hertasi to give him a complete grooming while he waited for folk to muster out. How did he manage to do that? So our reinforcements are here? Why are they coming here instead of Kelmskeep? Darion asked, attempting to neaten himself up. They're coming from Kelm's Keep. At a guess, they overnighted there, and Lord Brian sent them on to us this morning, Nightwind hazarded. We'll find out soon enough. A drowsy-eyed fire song joined them at that moment, yawning behind his mask, followed by Starfall. 
Fire Song had thrown on a loose robe and was still in the process of belting it about his slim waist. His hair showed signs of having been hastily braided, and his eyes still looked sleepy. Ugh, Fire Song said with distaste. Military types. Why on earth they should think that it's admirable to shake everyone awake at dawn or before, I can never understand. The force is large enough to satisfy you all, I think, Kel put in, ignoring Firesong's complaints with amusement. I counted over a thousand. I hope Brion sends some supplies with them, Starfall said thoughtfully. That is a lot of hungry mouths to feed. Well, we'll manage. We generally do. I suspect that would be why he isn't bivouacking them at Kelm's Keep, suggested Nightwind, with one hand on Kel's neck and the other on Snowfire's arm. Well, we have room. I'm sure they brought tents, and we can camp them out here if there isn't enough room in the Vale itself. For one thousand to fifteen hundred, said Aishan, who with Tercel and Hashi was the last to join them. No problem. He turned with a flourish of his tail and issued orders in the hissing Hertasi language to another of his kind that had trailed deferentially along behind him. The other bobbed an agreement and scampered off. Wheel raced in beneath the branches, heading straight for Snowfire, who extended his arm and braced himself for the weight as Wheel landed. They're within sight, Snowfire reported, while Wheel transferred half his weight to Snowfire's protected shoulder. And so they were. Darion peered out into the forest, the first of the reinforcements, tiny in the distance, and further dwarfed by the giant trees, came into view on the road. They were easier to see, perhaps, because in the lead were two heralds, white uniforms and white companions, making them doubly visible. They moved at a brisk pace, which showed that they were in good shape, as they neared, just at the point where her was visible as an escort, flapping lazily along just above the heads of the leaders, Firesong suddenly laughed out loud. What? Starfall asked sharply, casting a glance at his son. Nothing to worry about, Firesong replied, his voice overlaid with humor. I just recognized someone I know very well. By this time, the group was within calling distance, and he stepped forward. I might have known you'd be unable to resist a fight, you terrible woman, he shouted. If you were a hawk brother, we'd name you Fire Eater. Aren't you ever going to retire? Not while things stay interesting, the right-hand herald called back, a woman with a long blonde braid streaked with silver, whose easy grin matched her light words. Fire song, you useless popinjay, what are you doing here? Corrupting our youth, of course, Fire song replied, backing up a pace and clapping his hand on Darion's shoulder. I'm tired of perverting Hawk Brothers. I thought I'd start on Valdemarans. This is Darion, my latest victim. The companions halted, the mixed troops behind them came to parade rest, and both heralds dismounted from their saddles with agility that gave the lie to the silver in their hair. The woman clasped Fire Song's hand first, followed by the man. My friends, permit me to introduce you to the redoubtable Herald Captain Carowin and Herald Elden, Firesong said, waving his free hand at them. Darion's mouth dropped open. First the famous Firesong, and now the equally famous Carowin. Who would show up here next, the Queen herself? Heralds, these are the elders of Kevaldemar Vale, he continued. My father, Starfall Kevala, Daihili Kingstag Tercel Kevala Kevaldemar, Eldest Hertasi Aishan Keleshia, 
Kairi Envoy Hashi, Scout Captain Snowfire Kevala, Trondirin Nightwind Kelesia, Silver Griffin Kelvrin, and my pupil, Derion Firkin Kevala Kevaldemar. Carowin saluted them all. A very great pleasure, which, in spite of what Firesong implied, I hope remains a peaceful pleasure. These are your crown reinforcements. She waved at the waiting troops behind her. Not all men, Darion saw. At least half of the mounted fighters were women. I bring one mounted company of two hundred seasoned fighters out of my own sky bolts, and two green companies of regular guard infantry at five hundred each. That's twelve hundred fighters in all, with three full healers and their six apprentices, and supply wagons and support personnel. Some faint worry lines eased from Snowfire's face. If twelve hundred fighters can't keep things under control here, we'll need an army, not reinforcements. And if Herald Captain Carowin can't get the most out of every trooper she has, then you can stew my boots and serve them to me for dinner. Carowin laughed and shook her head. Oh, I'm no miracle worker, but I think we'll do all right, provided we use our heads. Have you a place where we can pitch camp? Bring your people with me, Herald Captain. Ishan spoke up. I'll show you where to camp and the amenities that you and your people can share with us. We can discuss other arrangements on the way. Good, thank you. She nodded at Elden, then made a hand signal. The troops snapped to attention. I'll see to the troops. Elden will meet with you now, and you can brief him. I had best get to my patrol. Kel said instantly. I will make haste and bring you the latest intelligence. He made good on his word, leaping into the air and clawing his way into the sky with tremendous wing beats. None of the Valdemarans was startled, though several watched him with admiration. They might be green, yet they must be from some area where they had seen griffins before now. Elden and his companion joined the elders, while Carowin mounted hers and took her place at the head of the troops. Darion and the rest all moved off the trail to allow the troops to file past. Darion watched them, thinking how odd it was that, under other circumstances, he might have been one of them. If I'd run off, or if the village had sent me off to Lord Brion instead of apprenticing me, that could be me carrying a pike and my pack. Huh? Are you getting on all right? Elden asked Firesong in an undertone. We haven't had any news of you more recent than last summer. Actually, not at all bad," Fire Song said lightly. "We get along, Silver Fox and I. You and the lady look well. Couldn't be better. We've got four perfectly capable weapons masters now, and she didn't see any reason why they couldn't take the trainees without her looking over their shoulders. Carols teaching some classes, if you can believe it. Things are so calm between Valdemar and Cass that his diplomatic skill is scarcely needed. So he's teaching Cassite culture and language. Wonderful. He must love it. Fire Song sounded genuinely pleased. Andesha is up to his eyebrows in shamanistic business, and I've never seen him happier. I left him in Kata Shinain, helping to weave a new history tapestry. He straightened and looked about. Well, we can catch up later. Now we should deal with business. He bowed a little to Elden. So, Herald Elden, would you and your companion care to join our council for an explanation of what's going on? That I would, healing adept Fire Song. Elden replied with the same odd mingling of seriousness and humor that Fire Song displayed. Lead on. Twelve.
It took most of the day to get the reinforcements settled in their encampment. They were entirely self-sufficient, having their own cook, tents, and supplies. But everyone agreed that being able to use the Vale's facilities made their camp seem downright luxurious. They were not in the least shy about stripping and plunging into the hot pools, men and women together, and at any hour of the day or night, one was as likely to encounter a clutch of Valdemarans there as a group of Taledras. Most often, the two groups mingled. The so-called green troops were green only in the sense of not having seen real combat, for they had trained and bunked with the Skybolts and had Skybolt senior officers. Those who couldn't handle the accepting and flexible manners of Caro's troops had long since been weeded out. Taledras and guards got along very well, with the troopers holding to the attitude that once on someone else's home ground, you played by their rules and not by what was called good manners and appropriate behavior at home. Stay polite and respectful, and ask before you touch was the watchword in the camp, and as a result, everyone got along remarkably well. The next day, Lord Brian and Val arrived for a real council of war, bringing with them their weapons master, who was Lord Brian's second in command. With a storm threatening, they met in the common dining hall, taking up roughly a third of the available space. By common and unspoken consent, since this was hardly a secret council, any one of the officers of sufficient rank who cared to listen in could do so as long as they stayed quiet. What's this, Captain Carowan? Like personally, Lord Brian asked Firesong as the assembled council waited for Carow and Eldon, who were the last to arrive. Today, Fire Song's mask seemed to be made all of fresh green leaves. Taledras and a few of Caro's officers lurked around the periphery of the group, and Darion saw a couple who were clearly skybolts smile at that question. You'll like her, Fire Song promised him. Caro can be counted on not to jump to any conclusions and not to fight unless she has to. She's very straightforward. Never hedges her answers or gives you the answer she thinks you want, unless it's also the true one. She's got oh, decades of practical experience. Before she came to Valdemar and was chosen, she was a mercenary captain with her own company in Rethwellen, the Skybolts, the same group that came up here with her. So, like most mercenary captains, she doesn't believe in wasting her limited resources, her fighters. She plans things. She doesn't just charge in and hope for the best. Darion saw nods of agreement from the guards and heard a great many murmurs of approval from the Hawk brothers. Lord Brian also nodded and seemed satisfied, at least to Darion. That's exactly the kind of person we need for this situation. Now, I take it that Harold Eldon is more of the diplomat. Yes, they make a good team that way. Darion definitely heard good-humored affection in Fire Song's voice. Caro's too blunt to make a good diplomat. They've been together since Caro was chosen, and Selene prefers to keep them as an official team, since Caro would probably find a sneaky way to accomplish the same thing without actually disobeying orders. You'll like him too. Just then, Carowin and Eldon showed up, but only Eldon was wearing whites. Caro had changed into something of the same cut as a herald's whites, but it was all of grey leather, well worn and practical, but not white by any stretch of the imagination. I thought you were a herald, Val exclaimed, obviously without thinking before he opened his mouth. He really has a problem that way, Darion noted. Does he ever think before he speaks? I am. I'm also officially on war duty as of this moment, and I am not wearing one of those "oh shoot me now" outfits while I am in the front line. 
Eldon gets to be the obviously important person. He's the diplomat, and he won't be in the front line of fighting as long as I am in command, unless he changes into something inconspicuous first. She cast Eldon a significant glance, which Eldon ignored. This was evidently an argument of long standing between them. I'm the one in charge if there's fighting, and I'd better stay hard to hit if I'm going to stay that way. She managed a very thin smile. If this outfit is good enough for weapons master Harold Alberich, it's good enough for me. That doesn't sound very heroic. Val was either oblivious to the effect his blurted comments were having, or today he was just letting his thoughts go straight to his mouth without pausing to examine them. He wasn't usually this clumsy. Darion winced inside, waiting for the rebuke. But Caro actually softened a little. My dear boy, I have been fighting for all of my adult life. I don't have anything to prove any more. I never did when I was a mercenary. If a merc doesn't live, he doesn't get paid. Heroics are for the young with nothing to lose. Then she raised an eyebrow and added dryly, "When it comes down to cases, Eldon's job is more important than mine. Diplomacy is much more economical than combat, unless you just happen to have a lot of people and no food to give them." Think about it, son. Think about it in terms of these green and fertile fields, and all the people who live on them, and the possibility that these new people are very, very hungry. Distant thunder growled, and it grew darker in the dining hall. Hertasi went about quietly lighting lamps. Val finally figured out that he had been very rude and inconsiderate, and worse, perhaps, from his point of view, he'd exposed himself as inexperienced and immature. He blushed a brighter scarlet than Darion had ever managed, and looked down at the table. So much for Val's love affair with heroic ballads. What I didn't kill, Carowin flattened. But Caro was already getting down to business, and Val quickly got caught up in the plans along with everyone else. All right then, Griffin, Kell, right? Kell, give us the numbers, then we'll have something to work with. Outside, thunder rumbled, warning that the storm was upon them. The first drops of rain hit the roof heavily. Of real fighters, five hundred and twenty-two. Of old men, old women, youngsters, old enough to take a weapon, and women without babes, four hundred and eighteen. Of small children, babes, nursing and pregnant mothers, and cripples, two hundred and forty-one. Kell sounded very sure of himself and added, "I counted in many passes until the numbers always came out the same." Good for you. Wait, did you say cripples? Carowin stared at the Griffin incredulously. Are you serious? There are crippled people among them. Kelvin had to wait as a flash of lightning, followed immediately by an enormous peal of thunder, drowned out any attempt at discussion. The rain began in earnest, drumming down on the roof with the promise that this would not be a mere cloudburst. Yes, most are children, but some are adults. He scratched an ear tuft slowly and thoughtfully. I thought that seemed odd myself. Most barbarian societies that I've ever heard of wouldn't allow their cripples to live, much less cart them along on a cross-country trek. Caro said, tapping her lips with one finger. Unless, of course, the cripple had a special skill that was vital to the tribe but didn't require mobility. Obviously, no child would qualify to live in that way. What's going on here? Darion decided to speak up. That doesn't sound anything like the first lot of barbarians that came here. They killed their own wounded. Interesting. 
Caro drew out the word, intoning each syllable as if it was a magical incantation. Well, what else can you tell me, Kel? That the way behind is blocked. The storm we have now is just the first of many to come. So say the weather signs and the weather watchers among the Taledras. Kel nodded at Snowfire, who gave silent confirmation. The rivers to the north are flooded. The tribe cannot retreat. Darion listened to the rain on the roof and thought about hundreds of people trapped by rain-swollen rivers. How were they handling it? That is not good. We can figure that if these people aren't desperate now, they will be when we confront them with no way to retreat. She looked around the table, making certain that she met everyone's eyes. They'll not only be desperate, but trapped. If we fight them, we can count on them fighting to the last man, woman, and child. We'll win, but it will be expensive, and we'll end up with a gaggle of barbarian children and cripples to take care of afterward. This is, of course, assuming that the mothers don't kill the children to prevent them from falling into our hands, which is very likely. Think you can handle having to sort through and bury a lot of dead babies? Darion felt his stomach lurch, and everyone else looked rather grim. Val was white, probably his imagination working again. I don't like these people, but I don't hate them that much. Caro nodded. I thought not. Good. We will pursue diplomacy until there is no chance whatsoever that we can make it work. Fighting will be the last of a very long list of choices— are we agreed? I, for those who are. There was no dissension, and when Darion checked the expressions of the onlookers, there wasn't any discontent there either. Some of the Taledras and a couple of the guard looked dubious, but no one disagreed. More thunder rolled outside, and the windows lit whitely as lightning passed somewhere above. Now I see why Caro didn't mind having people listen. This is better than having rumors running wild through camp. Elden, I yield the table to you, she said, sitting back in her chair with her arms folded comfortably across her chest. If I've got anything to say, I'll just raise my hand like the rest. Elden chuckled, as if this was a joke only he and she understood. Right enough, Caro. The first step in a diplomatic meeting is the first contact. Does anyone have any ideas there? Lord Brion cleared his throat. We talked about it some already. Figured we'd come in looking strong enough to squash any offense without thinking about it, but holding our hands to give these people a chance to speak for themselves. Show of magic, show of strength, even bring in the birds and the non-human allies to impress them with our totem animals. That's a good plan. I think anything subtle is a waste of time, Eldon replied with an approving glance around the table. There is one thing I would like, as a just-in-case. I'd like to evacuate the village. He consulted a paper. Uh... Erold's Grove? I'd like to send the evacuees to Kelm's Keep for safety. Lord Brion protested in alarm. Wait now. In the middle of growing season, there'll be things that need harvesting soon, and herds, and... Whoa! Eldon held up his hands, cutting Lord Brion short. I didn't say everyone. Evacuate those who are too frightened to stay. Children, women with babies, the elderly. Basically, anyone who can't move in a hurry or will panic if trouble comes. This time we have warning, and we'll have time enough to clear the rest out if there's fighting and if it looks as if it will move in the direction of the village. All right? Lord Brian frowned, but agreed grudgingly. I don't think you realize how much work everyone has in growing season, though, he grumbled. This is going to leave my farmers and smallholders mightily short-handed. 
Darion saw Caro and Eldon exchange another look, and Eldon's slight shrug. I think your farmers and smallholders will be grateful that their families are somewhere safe, my lord, Eldon soothed. And if you are worried about the harvest, perhaps some of our fighters could pitch in to help. They won't be doing anything here but drill, and some of them might appreciate the change of pace. Darion thought of something that might be an incentive. There must be twenty pretty girls in that village with no husband prospects, and there's a perfectly good inn there as well. Caro grinned and winked at him. There, you see, Eldon spread his hands. We'll take our volunteers from those who grew up farming. At that rate, you can even have the mothers with young children, as well as those with babies, evacuate. In the event that the whole village needs to be cleared out, we'll have a rear guard in place to hold the road behind. Lord Brion sighed heavily. All right. It's a damned good idea, and I've no doubt my lady can keep the whole lot of them busy helping with wedding Frau Frara. Kelvren, can you fly a long sortie tomorrow? Caro asked, as if struck with a sudden thought. I'd like you to see if there's any pattern to the barbarian's migration. Kelvren slapped his foreclaw to his chest in what Darion thought must be a salute. Certainly. Right. She looked around the table. Can anybody think of anything else for now? Only that we should make this meeting a daily one, Snowfire said, and smiled apologetically at Lord Brion. Sorry, my lord, but unless you prefer to let us deal with this without your opinions or wishes, your lady will have to do without you for a while. My lady told me to pack my bags, Lord Brion replied and grinned. She reckoned Val and I were in for an extended stay. Gods forbid that fighting comes that far, but she can command my personal troops as well as I can. And as for setting up for refugees and a siege, she's as good or better than I am. That's one reason why I wed her in the first place. Val looked startled as his father bowed to Starfall and Snowfire. Afraid I'm going to have to beg quarters from you, gentlemen, and camp space for my men. Keisha felt as if she had somehow fallen into someone else's life. Here she had gone along for years, with nothing more serious than sick sheep and broken bones to take care of, and nothing more worrisome than trying to work her way through those damned, indecipherable texts. And now she was living in a Hawk Brother Vale, taking lessons from one of the most famous mages in the world. Well, in Valdemar, anyway, learning how to do things that weren't even in those texts. And if that wasn't enough, now there was an army in residence with no less than three full healers and six apprentices, all perfectly willing to give her extra lessons and advice if she thought she needed it. She had seen more new people at once in the last few days than all of the people she'd ever seen in her life added together. Not that you really need much advice, observed Gentian Arbello, the most senior of the three. He was also the oldest, bald as an egg, and the thinnest, healthy man Keisha had ever seen. You have all the basic herb knowledge so solidly there's no point in questioning it, and you could teach us a few things about the local cures. As for using your gift, he shrugged, it's more a matter of practice and getting comfortable with it than needing any advice or lessons. Still, if you want to sit in when any of us work, we'll be happy to link minds with you so that you can see exactly how we do things. Please, Keisha responded immediately, hoping she didn't sound as desperate as she felt. Please, I need experience, and I'm horribly afraid I won't have much time to get it. There is that, agreed Nala Carcinamon, the junior healer. If there's fighting, well, we're going to wish we had double our number. 
The middle, a robust and cheerful man of middling height, brown hair, eyes, and beard, who called himself Grenfin Miles, made a face. Piff! This is Captain Caro we're talking about. If there's a way to get this settled without crossed swords, she'll find it. Her and Eldon both. Meanwhile, this is an army. They're always beating on one another, and that means bruises and cuts. Likely there'll be at least one serious fight with a broken bone if we sit about for more than a fortnight. We'll have hangovers, upset stomachs from overstuffing, all manner of minor troubles. There's nothing better to practice on, my dear, and if you botch it up a bit, there's no serious consequences. He grinned first at Keisha, then at his two colleagues. We'll take her on the rounds and let her use her gift on them with us as safety. She'll get practice, we can use the time for some full exams, and that'll keep every mother's child in this mothering army up to strength. What do you say to that? Nala looked dubious, but Gentian nodded. Good idea. In fact, it would be a good idea for all of the apprentices. His grin, buried as it was in a bright red beard, was doubly infectious. By the gods, we'll spoil those soldiers, though. They'll think this is how we should always treat them. Keisha flushed, her cheeks hot, and Nala gave her a penetrating look. Have you something you'd like to say, Keisha? The plump and motherly gray-haired woman looked more like someone's grandmother than a healer who'd followed armies literally all her life. She seemed to understand Keisha's shyness and how hard it was to volunteer information. Just that I do know some remedies you may not, mostly for common things, and they don't all have to have painless healing. She flushed even more, her cheeks so warm they were painful. You want to discourage people from pretending to be sick, right? Or complaining of truly trivial problems? The medicines aren't very pleasant, but they are very efficient. All three healers burst into delighted laughter, lessening her blushes. She'll do, she'll do, Gentian crowed. Oh, yes, she'll do. You're sure you want to be here? Carowin asked Keisha as they reached the outskirts of Erald's Grove just after supper time, a time chosen when everyone would be home from the fields. They know me. You're outsiders. They know I wouldn't say anything that can be ignored. If I'm here while you tell them the bad news, they won't be so inclined to try to pretend it isn't true. Keisha really didn't want to be there, but she knew she had to be. Among other things, she figured she might as well get the inevitable confrontation with her parents over and done with. They were going to want her to evacuate with the others, and obviously she couldn't do that. The best thing to do is to ring the bell in the square, Keisha went on, thinking out loud. If we ask Mayor Lutter to assemble everyone, he'll try to find some way of putting it off. Or worse, he'll only assemble people he thinks are important. She gave Carowin a helpless shrug. He's good enough at arranging fares, but I wouldn't trust him to make any decisions in a case like this, much less make the right ones. He'll think first of how to keep his own status high and keep getting appointed mayor and not concentrate on anything useful. My guess is that he's been keeping the fact that the barbarians were coming this way a secret. The only ones who probably know are the town council members. Caro snorted and looked absolutely disgusted. Politicians, always butting in where leaders are needed. No fear, I know the type, and I can handle him easily enough. Just ahead, people wandered the village paths in the late evening sunlight. Some were women, gathering to trade gossip. Some were young people, mostly couples, and children played in the yards as they rode in, Carowin on her companion, and Nightwind and Keisha on Daihili. Carowin had changed back to her whites, grudgingly, but Eldon had said severely that her authority as a herald might be needed to get people to act instead of dithering. 
there would be no difficulty with riding back after darkness fell, since the Daihili and Caro's companion had excellent night vision, and there was going to be a full moon. As soon as the children spotted Caro, they ran back to their houses, shouting with excitement. Gods, this is an awful lot of excitement for Erald's Grove. People are going to be talking about this year for decades, Keisha mused, as folk began to gather beside the road, their faces full of expectation. Maybe we won't have to ring the bell after all, Keisha ventured, seeing the number of people appearing on their own. Good. I want to alert people, not scare them witless. Caro's companion, Saville, stopped, and Caro stood up in her stirrups. Listen, people, I want everyone in Erald's Grove assembled in the square right now. You littles, yes, you and you and you, go to all the houses and fetch everybody. The children she pointed to ran off, squealing with excitement at being given an important mission by a herald. The rest of you, follow us to the square, unless you know of someone the children won't likely find. Caro took the lead, followed by Nightwind and Keisha, and a parade of chattering, excited people. The noise alone will probably bring people out, Keisha thought, as the crowd behind grew larger with every step they took. The square had been cleaned out since the reception for Darion and the Hawk Brothers. How long ago was that? Just days, maybe a fortnight, but it seems like a year. There was nothing in the way of structures there at all, except the Hawk Brother bower near the temple. Don't dismount, said Caro, as their three mounts halted, with Caroin between Nightwind and Keisha. We'll use the height to our advantage. Anyone want to bet how long it takes for this mayor of Keisha's to appear, demanding that we go through him? He's not my mayor, Keisha protested, and at that exact moment, Mayor Lutter appeared at the edge of the crowd, face red, shoving his way through to the center. What's going on here? he demanded, as he came up to the nose of Caro's companion, Saville. What's the meaning of this? Saville looked down her long nose at him and deliberately sneezed wetly in his face. As he jumped back, as far as he could, given the crowd, wiping his face with his sleeve, Caro's lips twitched. The situation with the approaching barbarians the Hawk Brothers told you about has escalated, Mayor Lutter, Carowin said, loudly enough to be heard clearly by at least a third of the crowd. I'm here to give crown orders for Erald's Grove. That set up a buzz, as the folk in the front exclaimed in alarm, those in the back asked what had been said, and those nearest Mayor Lutter seized on him, demanding to know why he hadn't told them about approaching barbarians. This kept him very busy trying to make up an explanation, as Caro had probably intended. People continued to collect as Caro waited patiently. When it appeared that no one else was going to join them, she stood up in her stirrups, surveyed the group with an impassive face, then abruptly signaled for silence. Amazingly, she got it. Even the increasingly agitated cluster of people around Mayor Lutter quieted down. The mayor, glad enough for the respite, mopped his sweating face with his other sleeve. I am Herald Captain Carowin, commander of the Skybolts, Caro announced. As a murmur again rose, she continued, ignoring the sound. I see some of you recognize me. Those of you who do can make your explanations to everyone else later. Apparently your mayor has not passed on some information he received some time ago, so I'll repeat it in brief. Northern barbarians have been approaching this area for some time. At first it was unclear whether they were going to stop short or continue until they came to Erald's Grove, but they show no signs of stopping, so we are assuming they will come here. Interestingly, although Caro's words were practically guaranteed to cause panic, no one moved or even said anything. 
It might have been Caro's stern gaze. It might also have been that she had some rudimentary empathic control over the crowd. Or, if she didn't, perhaps Saville did. At any rate, no one ran off or even moved much. There are some significant differences between this group and the last, Caro continued. The most important of which is that this group contains women, children, old people, and even cripples. That suggests that they are not a conquering army, but rather migrants, nomads, or even refugees. People of that nature can be negotiated with. Nevertheless, the Crown is taking your safety very seriously, and I am in command of three companies of guard troops that include some of my own skybolts, who will make certain that you are protected. A spontaneous and very relieved cheer arose, which Caro permitted to continue for a moment before raising her hand again. As before, she got silence. Meanwhile, I have advised Lord Brion to let everyone who wants to evacuate Erald's Grove. I suggest that mothers with infants and small children do so, all children below the age of fourteen, all older folk, and anyone else who doesn't feel safe. I realize that this will cause some hardship, so since we wanted some troops stationed here anyway, those troopers will help out in the fields to replace people who evacuate. She allowed her gaze to travel across the crowd slowly, so that she at least gave the illusion of meeting each and every eye. There you have it. Lord Brion has agreed to accept the evacuees at Kelm's Keep, and whatever you want to bring with you, go ahead and do so. This is not an emergency evacuation, and you can take as much time to pack up and move out as you need to, within reason. I'd say four or five days is within reason. Do you think the barbarians will come here? shouted one of the fellowship folk. Caro shook her head. To be honest, not really. However, I want all possibilities covered, and if my judgment proves to be totally wrong, and it could, the gods know it's happened before, I don't want anyone here who is unable to run like a rabbit if trouble shows up. My recommendation is basically that the able-bodied and healthy can stay, but everyone else should go. Keisha chose this moment to speak up. I've been at the Vale, which is where all the news is coming. This is real, and if it were my family that had a grandma or baby, I'd not only tell them to go, I'd help them pack and escort them to Kelm's Keep. Since my folks can all not only run like rabbits, but can bite when cornered, she noted several weak grins in the crowd, and stronger ones from her brothers, I'd say it's safe enough for them to stay until the herald captain tells them otherwise. Anyone who might have been wavering until then was convinced. Caro waited a moment, then asked, Anyone have any questions? Only of Mayor Lutter, said one voice, with a decidedly grim note in it. Murmurs of agreement followed. Right. You will have several more chances to ask me things, myself or one of my lieutenants. There will be an officer stationed with the men who come here to help out, and if he or she doesn't already have orders that cover any question you might have, they'll have authority to make a decision. She took a slow, deep breath and looked satisfied with the results of her speech. Carry on. Decide who's going. Take your time. I'll send the first batch of men over tomorrow, and if you don't feel confident about getting to Kelm's Keep by yourselves, some of them will provide an armed escort over. This isn't an emergency. Yet. At this point, the only excited and agitated people were the ones around Mayor Ludder. Keisha felt rather sorry for him, but he had brought his troubles on himself. But she saw her mother and father, making their way toward her, moving slowly through the crowd with determination on their faces, and she braced herself for what was to come. "'You are going to Kelmskeep,' stated her mother, as soon as she was close enough, in the tone that warned she would accept no other answer from her daughter. 
But it wasn't her daughter who sat the back of a Daihili, not here, not now. It was the Erald's Grove healer, who knew that there was a perfectly good healer at Kelmskeep, but if she left, there would be none at Erald's Grove at a time when one would be needed urgently. Furthermore, the Erald's Grove healer knew that if it came to a conflict, her place was with the other healers caring for injured fighters, not huddling behind walls of stone far from any conflict. So, no, said the healer of Erald's Grove, just as firmly. Her mother and father simply stared at her. No wonder. I may have disobeyed, but never in anything major, and I've never refused them to their faces. Keisha hardened her shields, as well as her resolution. No matter what they said or did, she had no intention of being dissuaded. What do you mean, no? demanded Ivor and Sidoni in chorus. I believe it's my duty to remain either here or at the Vale, where I am needed, and not in Kelmskeep where I am not, Keisha replied, in a level and moderate tone. So I will not be going to Kelmskeep. She was deeply grateful that Caro told them all to stay mounted. The height advantage she had gave her an advantage in authority as well. Her father began to get a bit red in the face himself. No daughter of mine. I am your daughter only after I am a healer, Keisha countered, hoping that she sounded calm and reasonable. My first and most important duty is as a healer. Once she's a full herald, you wouldn't even think to tell Shandi to stay out of danger, would you? The trouble is, I'm afraid they would. Even through shields, she could tell that she had just set the spark to the tinder. There was going to be a very ugly outburst in a moment. She braced herself, cringing inside. Pardon, Nightwind said, stepping in before either parent could send down thunder and lightning. But Keisha is eighteen, is she not? At Sidoni's automatic nod, the Trondirin continued. Then, by your own laws, she is two years past the age when she can legally make her own choices. That she is, Caro said cheerfully, bringing her own formidable personality in on Keisha's side. She can marry, be apprenticed, take on business or a debt, choose whatsoever profession she wishes, no matter what your desires are. But she is a child, Sidoni wailed. She can't possibly make any kind of rational decision. By your law, she ceased to be a child two years ago, said Nightwind quietly. By our law, she ceased to be one four years ago, and by demonstration of responsibility, she ceased to be one at least that long ago. She smiled, a smile full of pity and sympathy, Lady, your child is in no sense a child, and has not been so for years. She was simply too dutiful to remind you of that fact, but now her higher responsibilities have forced her to that point. Don't force her to hurt you, just to prove she's long since grown up. Suddenly Sidoni's face crumbled, though at least she didn't burst into tears. Keisha swallowed, with the revelation of how difficult it must be to let children grow up. It was all there, in her father's shocked and stricken look, in her mother's heart-sick eyes. She began to waver. Was she wrong in standing against them? But Caro was not going to let the situation decay. With a wicked gleam in her eye, she stepped in again. I must remind you, she said, in a voice as devoid of pity as Nightwind's expression was full of that emotion. I am in charge of this situation, and in my opinion you would be seriously interfering with the best interests of Valdemar by trying to persuade one of my healers to cravenly abandon her post. It could even be construed as treason, she added thoughtfully. Oh, Ivor said, his face blank with shock. Sidoni took a few moments more to see what Caro was getting at, but when she did, her expression went just as blank as her husband's. 
Now it was Caro's turn to soften a little. You've been good enough, parents, to raise not only a child chosen, but another who sees her duty as a healer as more important than her own wishes. Now, be good enough, parents, to let that child live up to her potential. Ivor was the first to recover. Just promise that she'll be taken care of, he said to Caro, with the fierce glare of any thwarted father. I am Harold Captain Carowin, and I always take care of my people, Caro told him with supreme dignity. You have my leave to inquire from any of my people how they are cared for. There seemed nothing more to say at that point, and with that bee in their ears they beat a hasty retreat. Dusk had faded into darkness, and they were swallowed up by the night before Keisha could call them back. Keisha let out the breath she'd been holding in and looked at both Nightwind and Caro with gratitude. She couldn't believe how quickly the confrontation had ended, although she wished with all her heart that it had been less painful for her parents. This isn't the first time you've held off angry parents, is it? she asked Carowin, who laughed. No, it's not, she agreed. And you should see them when their baby child is going to go hit people with sharp things instead of heal them of the aftermath. She shook her head reminiscently. Hate to do it, but a child has to grow up sometime in their parents' eyes, and better they should blame me than their own flesh and blood. Well, thank you. Thank you both. Keisha sighed. I almost gave in to them. I probably would have if you hadn't helped. They all turned their mounts away from the dispersing gathering and headed back toward the vale just as the full moon appeared above the trees, gilding their path with silver. I don't think you would have, Nightwind said, after a long silence that took them right to the edge of the night-darkened forest. But don't feel ashamed that they made you feel as if you were going to. Now Keisha heard the smile in her voice. Parents always know what strings control your heart and soul. After all, they are the ones who tied them there. 13. This was, of course, not the first time that Darion and Snowfire had gone scouting an enemy encampment. The easiest way was the path they had chosen, through the treetops. The easiest way was also the safest, getting themselves into a tree near the barbarian encampment and letting the owls make overflights while they used their owl's eyes to observe. Snowfire sent out both of his birds, but Darion only had Kuari to keep track of. This, of course, meant that Snowfire had twice the work of Darion, but Snowfire might have been happier if Darion hadn't insisted on coming along in the first place. He had only agreed because they had a limited time to work in and needed as much information as they could get. Darion put his back up against the curiously smooth bark of his tree and concentrated on the non-combatants, the women, girls, and young children who were gathered around their own fire. Snowfire sent her and Wheel to single out those who seemed the most important in the clan and to look for a shaman or mage. Darion didn't know what Snowfire was seeing, but from his point of view, much as he hated to admit it, these people were nothing like the arrogant barbarians of years ago. As Kuari actually perched no more than a few feet above the heads of a gathering of women and children, he took note of a wealth of details through the owl's sight. For instance, there was one decoration repeated over and over in their clothing and ornaments. A cat. It was some sort of great hunting cat, and the colors it was portrayed in were whites, grays, and blacks, giving it a ghost-like appearance. Decorations included stylized cats in profile in every conceivable position, cat faces, cat eyes, and cat paw prints, 
As ornaments, he counted cat furs, cat teeth, cat skulls, and cat claws. This, then, was probably their totemic animal. So much for the decorations of their lives. Now for the substance. In this much, this batch of barbarians was similar to the last. The sexes were strictly segregated. Women, girls, and small children below the age of puberty grouped around one campfire, sharing one meal, the adult males crowded around another, sharing a different meal, with more of the choice cuts of meat. Snowfire was concentrating on the adult males, so Kuari and Darion ignored them. Whatever dinner the women had was long since eaten, though the men were still chewing away. The only signs of it were the cracked and gnawed bones in the fire, the two pots filled with coals to burn out the residue of food left in them. One thing did surprise him. The women did not seem particularly cowed or slavish. They chattered among themselves, scolded rowdy children, sewed hides into articles of clothing, or decorated the finished clothing. If this isolation was an indication that they were considered inferior creatures by the men, there was no sign that they were kept that way with beatings and brutality. As Kell had reported, though, there were several people, mostly children, who seemed afflicted with a curious paralysis or wasting disease. These victims lay quietly on furs beside the fire, occasionally rubbing emaciated limbs as if to ease a constant ache. An arm might be afflicted, or a leg, never both legs or both arms. On the other hand, how could a child survive long with such a profound affliction in a nomadic clan? Even in Valdemar, people with paralysis had difficulty in simply staying alive. He had the sense, gained mostly from the way that women would look at the afflicted children and sigh, that there had been other children who had been stricken worse than these and had not survived. He gleaned all he could, noting that not all the women were making or decorating new garments. Some were working on weapons, fletching arrows, fitting heads to spears. Yes, those things could be used for hunting, but they could also be used for war. Just how many spears and arrows did the tribe need for hunting anyway? A nomad tribe can't afford to carry much. Why make so many weapons when there are hectares of raw materials all around them? He could understand stockpiling spear tips, arrowheads, but not whole weapons. Spears in particular were clumsy and hard to transport for people who had no wagons. Why bother making entire bundles of extras? Because they expect conflict, that's why. Can't stop to fletch arrows or fit a point to a shaft in the middle of a fight. Finally, he figured he had gleaned as much information as he could from simple observation and called Kuari back in. As the great eagle owl landed on the limb beside him, a huge branch wide enough for two people to walk side by side on it, he looked over to the next branch to see how snow fire progressed. Her was already there, sitting quietly beside her bondmate, and from the look of it, Wheel would not be far behind. Darion began carefully stretching muscles and getting ready to move out. It wasn't long before Snowfire whistled the quiet signal that meant it was time to retreat, and Darion followed the scout's lead through the upper limbs of the trees, moving along the branches of the great trees as surely and silently as if they traveled forest paths. Where limbs crossed, they used their climbing staffs to hook the branch of the next tree, either to pull themselves up or lower themselves down. Even in Valdemar, Snowfire had drilled his younger brother in this tree-walking, and no matter that the trees there were no more than a tenth of the size of those in the Pelagiris, a hawk brother was as at home in a tree as any Valdemaran was on the ground. That was the real secret of their ability to move invisibly through the forest, though to Valdemarans it might as well have been magic." 
They didn't descend to the earth again until they were far from the encampment. Two Daihili waited impatiently in a clearing to carry them further toward safety. With the moon on the wane, the Daihili were only moving shadows below to Darion's eyes, but to Kuari's, the thick darkness made no difference. With Kuari to guide him, Darion followed Snowfire down to the ground. The Daihili, not Tercel, but a swift runner all the same, was at his side as his feet touched the moss. Faster than thought, Darion was in the saddle, and the Daihili bounded away, no more than a pace or two behind his herdmate. There was neither the time nor the leisure for either of them to talk, not with the Daihili at full gallop. Darion hung on, most of his attention with Kuari, who scouted the back trail, watchfully making certain that barbarians had not somehow detected them. Her and Wheel scouted ahead, serving as their guides as the moon set and the darkness thickened further. Darion had made so many similar rides in the last four years that his senses were keenly attuned to the signals that meant real danger. He no longer started, hand to weapon, at every little sound. The farther they got from the encampment, the more he relaxed, in so far as it was possible to do so. The mission had only begun. It would be a very long night before it was over. We got away with our spy out. That's a decent omen. So far, so good. The War Council wasn't waiting for their report in the Vale. Tonight was the night of confrontation, and the barbarians weren't as close to the Allies as that. Their own war band had an encampment of their own, near enough for an effective strike at the barbarians, but hopefully far enough away that the barbarian scouts wouldn't detect them. The Daihili slowed to a walk as they neared the periphery of the camp. With Darion just a pace behind him, Snowfire answered three low-voiced challenges before the Daihili brought them to a shallow cave in the hillside, facing away from the barbarians and into a circle of firelight, reflecting off faces that looked up at their approach. This cave was the only spot safe enough for a fire and offering enough privacy for the war council. Once they were out of the saddle and settled in among the rest, taking seats cross-legged on the soft sand floor, Darion reported his findings first. Snowfire listened as intently as the others, although, except for the identification of the clan Totem, there wasn't much real information there. "'I'm sorry I can't tell you more,' Darion ended on a note of apology." But at some point, we've got to get hold of one of their people, maybe a child, and get their language. There's too much I missed by not understanding their conversation. Snowfire then made his own report. I didn't see a mage or a shaman anywhere among the men, nor did I see a special tent or any of the sort of equipment and paraphernalia that a shaman or mage would require he said, eliciting a nod from Firesong. From the little of their speech that I understood, I believe that they call themselves the Ghost Cat Clan. If what I heard is true, they believe their totemic animal actually led them here. I also understood that they are terrified of the change circles and will make any detour to pass around them, and that corresponds with what Kel has observed. They don't seem to be aware of the existence of Erald Grove or Kevaldemar Vale. As far as they are concerned, this is completely unknown, probably empty territory. I saw some preparation for fighting, but not what I would expect if they planned a major assault. In my opinion, they are ready to fight, and will if they see the need to attack or defend. But it did not look to me as if they planned to go to war. Caro nodded, and looked first into Saville's eyes, then nodded at Eldon. Then we should go ahead with our plan. We come in, show superior abilities, and try to awe them. 
I'll have the sky bolts in place as backup for the contact party, but they won't show their faces unless the contact party has to be rescued. Sound right to everyone else? Darion followed Carowin's glance around the circle. There was no dissension, but he didn't expect any at this point. After all, they'd been over and over this plan so many times that they had, he hoped, worked any flaws out of it. Let's do it, Firesong said, before I lose my nerve. He's joking, Darion thought, as they all stood and shivered. I wish I could. Now it was time for Tercel to join the group, but as fire songs mount, not Darion's. Darion would remain with the Skybolts as advance scout, ready to mount a rescue should that become necessary. This did not make Darion feel any better. He could not help thinking about all those well-made arrows he'd seen being fletched, and imagining his friends facing a hail of them. Carowin would not be with the contact party either. That was Eldon's place. Like Darion, Caro had a different place to fill. She would be with her troops, waiting in hiding, hoping she wouldn't be needed. She isn't any happier about that than I am. Carowin hadn't said anything, certainly hadn't done anything, but there was no doubt in Darion's mind that she would gladly have accepted any excuse to get Eldon out of the contact party. But there were only two heralds, and Eldon was the diplomat of the two. It was, as he had gently reminded Carowin, his place to be conspicuous, at least for the moment. Kelvrin, who was so excited by his part in this that his hackles were up, was to be the crowning piece of the display. Whether or not these people were familiar with griffins from afar, they could never have seen one up close, and to have Kel come swooping in out of the dark would be a considerable shock. With Eldon and his companion in the lead, Snowfire and Firesong flanking him riding Daihili, and followed by a good-sized escort of mounted skybolts, the party's size should be enough to surprise the barbarians. Appearing suddenly and unexpectedly out of the night was a time-honored tactic of the Hawk Brothers. It worked as an effective way to intimidate interlopers more often than it failed. Darion hoped that tonight would not be counted as one of the failures. Lord Breon had wanted badly to be included as one of the party, and had only been dissuaded from his intention by Carowin. The herald captain had pointed out that it was her duty to protect him, not the other way around, then added that she didn't know the territory around Kelmskeep half so well as its lord. If it came to a running fight, she needed his expertise. So Lord Brian was also going to be an observer, and probably would be fretting inside as much as Caro or Darion. The darkness was their friend, not the barbarians. With the aid of the three owls, they moved into position without disturbing the few sentries, much less the sleeping camp. The barbarian sentries were posted within sight of the dying campfire anyway, too close to the camp to be an effective ward against a force like theirs. As Caro arranged her own fighters, positioning Darion and Kuari as lookouts, the others moved closer still, just barely out of the barbarian sight, as near as they dared. Darion stayed where Carowin had placed him, in another tree, halfway between her people and the camp. It wasn't as safe a perch as it might have seemed. One of the things that the contact party was going to produce was a lot of light, and he would make a tempting and easy target if anyone spotted him. In a situation like this one, the gift of mind speech was all the more valuable. Everyone knew when everyone else was in place and ready, with no clumsy signals that might be misheard or not heard at all. Without that warning, he might have been so startled as to lose his balance when the contact party made their initial move. 
As it was, he winced involuntarily when the group revealed their presence. It must have been a hundred, a thousand times worse for the barbarians. For them, there was no warning. In one moment, they slept peacefully, the forest sounds of crickets and frogs, the occasional bird call, no different than any other night. In the next, it must have seemed as if the heavens and earth opened up at once. With a great flash of light and a corresponding blare of horns supplied by Carowin's people, the contact party appeared out of the dark as if they had suddenly burst through a gate or were conjured by some other magical means. With mage lights burning fiercely above them, with the owls flying at head height on either side of the group, they galloped up to the very edge of the camp. At the last moment, Starfall and Snowfire held up their hands, and the owls landed neatly on the gloves. The whole camp was roused, of course, but very few had the temerity to burst out of their tents, and fewer still to brandish the weapons they'd seized. Giving them no time to recover from the first shock, the second descended from the dark sky, Kelvrin, in full panoply, his wings providing a thunder of his own as he landed in front of Elden. Darion had to give the barbarians credit for bravery. They were shaking, as pale as snow, and plainly terrified. But they stood their ground. Yes, but can they stand the third shock? A deep and angry voice shouted inside Darion's head and in the heads of every other creature present that hadn't shielded against it. Darion had put up just enough of a shield to keep the voice from being painful, but he wanted to hear what Tercel said. For this was Tercel's contribution, his ability to mind-speak to anyone and anything, and if the barbarians weren't familiar with mind-speech, this might well be the most frightening shock of all. "'Who are you, invaders? How dare you intrude on us?' Tercel demanded. "'Why are you here? What excuse have you for invading our lands, stealing our game, devouring our grazing? Why should we not destroy you at this moment and leave your bones to lie in the dust as a warning to others?' There was no telling how the barbarians would take this, how they would even hear it and interpret it, but this was the best that any of them could come up with, providing equal parts of threat, intimidation, and opportunity for explanation. Firesong produced appropriate stage dressing as Tercel mind spoke, sending up fountains of light on either side as his firebird made a similar entrance to Kelvrin's. Aya plunged down from the treetops, showering false sparks as he flew, then coming in to land on Firesong's outstretched hand. Darion held his breath, watching the barbarians for dangerous behavior. When it was apparent that the contact party was waiting for an answer, waiting angrily, but still waiting and holding their hand, people ventured from tents, milled around a little, talking nervously, then centered all their activity on three men in particular. As the contact party continued to wait, standing as rigid and unmoving as a group of statues, those three men walked cautiously to the edge of the camp, clutching their weapons. No eclipse amulets. That was something Darion had been watching for particularly. The mage or shaman who had led the first barbarian invasion had worn one, and Darion had gotten the impression that it was worn by the leaders of a rather nasty magical cult, even by barbarian standards. If he'd gotten even a glimpse of another one like it, he was going to call a retreat— but no, the three leaders, a wiry man with grizzled hair and beard, and two younger, much more muscular fellows, had donned quite a bit of jangling jewelry before they ventured forward, but anything like an amulet was cat-headed or cat-shaped. The one with the gray hair spoke loudly and slowly, with a great many gestures that didn't mean anything to Darion. Meanwhile, the other two shook rattles and brandished not weapons, but brightly painted rawhide shields. 
He asks if we are demons of the darkness, and if we are, says that the other two are powerful shamans who will drive us away. There was no doubt of Tercel's grim amusement with this situation. Firesong, why don't you be your theatrical self while I answer him? Firesong raised Aya over his head while Tercel stepped up beside Kelvrin. The firebird threw off a veritable waterfall of false sparks which rained down on his bondmate as Firesong conjured another mage light in the palm of his other hand. Fools! Demons of the darkness shun the light, not court it, Tercel shouted contemptuously. We are the keepers and guardians of this land, and we demand that you answer to us for your invasion. Nervously, the two would-be shamans dropped their painted shields as ineffective and took up spears instead. The leader, however, waved them back and addressed the party again. He says that if we are not demons, then he demands that we meet him in daylight. Now Tercel's mind voice held a grudging admiration. Pretty brave fellow to stand up to us like this. Whatever the answer was from the contact party, Darion didn't hear it. He only got Tercel's third and final announcement. Because we are just, we give you leave to defend your actions and time to choose your words with care, Tercel said sternly. Look for us by dawn light. The party backed up, one slow step at a time, then there was another explosion of purposefully blinding light and blare of horns, and when silence and darkness descended again, the party had vanished. At least, they had as far as the barbarians were concerned. In actual fact, of course, they simply rode or flew away, but with their eyes dazzled and ears ringing, the barbarians wouldn't have seen that. Darion waited until the Allies were safely behind the Skybolt's lines before making his own move, which was to return to the barbarian camp to see if he could make out what their reaction was. Although he couldn't understand a word they said, some things were clear enough. The children and most of the women were absolutely terrified, but not all. Several hardy souls among the women rallied and railed at their more timid sisters, suggesting to Darion that the older ones had seen magic before and knew the difference between show and substance. And they aren't afraid of magic, which means, what, that it's never been used successfully against them? Among the men, only the younger ones were cowed. Virtually all the males of Darion's age and older had gotten over their shock and gathered around the three leaders deep in a council of their own. And once the hardier women had calmed the rest, they joined the council circle as well. It was possible for Darion, watching through Kuari's eyes, to infer some things, most notably a sense of caution in the intonations of those who spoke, in the postures of those who listened. Finally, he decided that he had seen and heard enough and retreated behind his own lines. They're not as scared as we'd like, he reported, as he dropped down out of the tree into the midst of his own war council. But not aggressive, either, Caro asked quickly. Not aggressive, at least not at the moment, Darion confirmed. They've seen showy magic before. I'd bet on it. On to the next phase, then, Snowfire said. We approach at dawn and see what they have to say for themselves. He looked up at the tree branches above his head. Dawn isn't that far off. We won't have long to wait. In the mist and still pale gray of dawn, the contact group approached the barbarian camp once again, this time without the lights and noise. They stopped a bit further away, however, just out of arrow shot range where Kelvrin joined them. A cautious deputation approached from the encampment, but not immediately. 
From the haggard faces and dark-circled eyes, it appeared that the barbarians had gotten no more sleep than the Allies. Once again, Darion was in the tree branches, but hidden better this time, and without Kuari. The eagle owls had no advantage during daylight, except for show. Darion was here to satisfy his own restlessness, not as a primary scout. That duty had gone to Winter Sky, Ravenwing, and their bond birds. It appeared that at least they were going to be treated as important enough for the barbarians to put on their best finery, for the deputation jingled and clattered with every approaching step. In their own way, they are impressive, he thought, peering through his screen of leaves. The oldest man, possibly the chieftain, had donned a fur cloak of the pelt of a huge cat, with the fully preserved head of its original owner acting as the hood. Their leather tunics and breeks were as well constructed as Taledra's scout gear, and though they jangled with amulets and jewelry, and their decorations were a bit garish for Darion's taste, they were no worse than the Shinain, who had never seen a color they didn't love. But they weren't wearing armor, and there was still no sign of that eclipse amulet Darion recalled only too well. Unless they were supposed to be sacrificial lambs, they weren't expecting to meet with physical force in this parley. This time, the Allies intended to wait for the barbarians to speak first, so they waited with expressionless faces still mounted as the strangers approached. They, in their turn, stopped well short of the contact party. The leader cleared his throat ostentatiously when no one spoke, mind to mind or otherwise, and began what sounded, from the measured cadences, like a prepared speech. This is the clan of the Ghost Cat, Tercel interpreted, and with that name, images, of a huge, fierce, and reclusive predator, and of something else, a fleeting shadow by day, a call in the night, a trusted presence that guided. They claim their totem animal led them here, and by that sign from their gods, they say it is their right to stay. I must admit, as a defense, it has the benefit of being unique and probably unprovable. After a pause to confer, Tercel replied, Whether or not that is true, you are in our land, where our gods hold sway, and our laws decree the measure of what is and is not to be. This time the leader went on at some length, with many broad and flamboyant gestures. He wants to know by what right we claim this land, says that there are no boundary markers, no claiming poles to show that we speak the truth. If this land was ever settled by the whole dwelling people and diggers of dirt— that is us, by the way. It has been abandoned for decades and should belong to anyone for the taking. The leader's voice grew bolder, possibly because the contact party hadn't struck him down. He has no idea that it is me doing the talking, by the way. He thinks it is either fire song or starfall. Kelvrin impresses him, but he thinks Kel is something we've tamed. Kel remained unruffled, fixing the speaker with his unblinking gaze. Now he tells us how huge and strong his clan is, how many warriors they have, how many battles they fought. Tercel paused a moment. This is partly a bluff. Something, a disease, drove them out of their own lands, and they ran rather than face a foe they had no hope of beating. This time, Darion heard Starfall's reply. Tell him his own numbers, the mage said, with grim humor. Let's see how he reacts to the fact that we know his strength, down to the last baby. Tercel did just that, and Darion had the satisfaction of seeing the barbarian leader shaken, but he recovered quickly and spoke again. 
Now, he says, that we should know that even the babies of his clan are fighters, that if we come against them and try to force them out of the place their totem has brought them to, even the babies will take up bows and swords and slay our men. Tercel pawed the ground, roused in spite of himself. There's no doubt he means to stay, and he'll make it cost us dearly to be rid of him. His people are desperate, and that's dangerous. Darion hadn't needed that last admonition. He knew for himself just how dangerous a desperate person was. We do not need to use the spear or the sword to rid ourselves of pests, Tercel replied loftily, and Darion sensed Firesong's hand in his phrasing. As any should know who once had the misfortune to dare the killing trees of the north, we had hoped that the foolishly bold and suicidal had learned to keep a wary distance from our lands by now. The leader barked an artificial laugh and made his counter. He says that the so-called killing trees did not prevent his passage and implies that this means his magic is stronger than ours. There was a stirring in the distance, and for a single moment Caro's troops showed themselves before blending back into the shadows and undergrowth. This did affect the barbarian leader. He had not gotten long enough to count heads, for Caro had timed the moment so that all he had was an impression, an impression of great numbers. You managed to avoid the killing trees by passing to the west, and your boast is hollow as an old reed. Magic is not our only weapon, Tercel said with great boredom. It is only the easiest to use. The leader remained silent now, as his underlings whispered urgently in his ear. Tercel did not wait for them to formulate a reply, not when the negotiations had just turned in the favor of the Allies. Here are our fighters, our magic, and our gods, barring your way. But we are a generous people, and compassionate to those who are willing to serve. These lands have no current tenant, it is true. What have you to offer us in return for leave to remain? If anything, that startled the leader even more than the presence of the troops. His posture full of confusion, he made an abrupt gesture, spoke a few words, and retreated with his party. He wants to go discuss this with his people, Tercel said unnecessarily. Back in camp, with Winter Sky spying on the barbarians and Caro's sentries keeping careful watch, Tercel gave them a fuller account of what he had read in the barbarians' thoughts. Darion fought back a yawn, clamping his jaws on it. It seemed an eternity since the last time he'd slept, and with his excitement and fear wearing off, he felt a bit light-headed with weariness. You all know, of course, that without taking his mind in such a way that he would know I had done so, I could only read what came to the surface of his mind, Tercel began as a preamble. If we didn't before, we do now, Caro replied logically. So, what information came along with those surface thoughts? This ghost cat... I am forced to believe it is either a very powerful hallucination or it is very real. Tercel shook his head in irritation as a fly buzzed around his ears. Darion fought another yawn. I am quite serious, and I am inclined to think that it would be difficult to hallucinate such a thing during the course of a migration lasting moons. Firesong and his father exchanged sharp glances, and Caro and Eldin did the same. That puts an interesting kink in our plans, Caro ventured. But until this ghost cat shows itself to me, I'm leaving it out of the calculations for now. What else? 
The disease I mentioned. The three of us managed to get bits and pieces of the whole story. Tercel sounded proud of himself and his underlings, as well he should be. That would be a difficult proposition to read from the surface thoughts. Darion wondered about this ghost cat. Firesong had told him about the two avatars that helped his friend Andesha. Could this ghost cat be something like them? And if so, then what did that mean for the Taledras and Valdemar? There was a tradition of an annual gathering of clans and sects of clans every midsummer, and the last year it ever took place, it was held in Ghost Cat territory. Just as a matter of caution, they always avoided change circles, but as we know, other clans don't. Someone from Blood Bear Clan found a circle and went into it, and came out with more than he'd expected. The disease, Snowfire stated with surprise. We were afraid something like this would happen, and we took precautions against it. Obviously they didn't, Caro said dryly. Exactly so. It ran through the assembled clans like a wildfire. They call it summer fever, since it disappears in winter, though they don't know why. Is this disease the cause of the crippled children? Snowfire asked. It is. It begins as coughing, sneezing, chills and fever, then becomes a wasting disease. It kills more often than not, as the chest muscles waste away and breathing becomes impossible, or as full paralysis sets in and the victim is helpless to keep up. Only the very lucky survive. Tercel was uncharacteristically sober. Evidently he found the images that had come with that knowledge to be disturbing. Usually death from disease comes to the old and weak or the young and helpless. This death does not pick and choose in that way. Enough fighters died in the first sweep that every clan feud was called off, but new outbreaks have occurred every summer since then. Darion wasn't sleepy any more. Whether he was picking up images from Tercel or his own imagination was working hard, but he had seen those children lying beside the fire. All right, but why come here? Firesong asked. Their shaman was one of the victims, but before he died, he told them that a sign would lead them to a place where they would find healing and an end to the sickness. And after he died, the ghost cat appeared and led them south. That was when their lore keepers recalled that we of the south reputedly have many powerful healers. Oh, really? Eldon's eyebrows rose, and he turned to Starfall. Was this cat a revenant, do you think, or an avatar? Great minds follow the same path, Darion thought. It could be, Starfall said cautiously, but we shouldn't discount either. Well, now we know why they avoid change circles. Before he died, their shaman declared that their own gods and magic were helpless against this plague from outside, and that they must look outside for help. They aren't down here purely by chance, following the ghost cat. They've heard of the Valdemaran-style healers, as I said, and have come looking for some. Their initial intentions were to kidnap some and coerce them into helping, if they had to. Huh, Caro snorted. They don't know healers very well, do they? Darion had to agree with that. However, confronted by our strong force, that doesn't seem like too good an idea anymore. Tercel's sides heaved with an enormous sigh, and that is all I can tell you. I think we'd better bring the healers in on this, Darion put in, with visions of more crippled children in Erald's Grove. How do we know we won't catch this fever? We don't, and that is a damned good point, Caro responded. She rose, but halfway to her feet was interrupted. 
Captain! Visitors! One of the guards entered the cave and saluted Carowin smartly. Two to see you urgently, Captain! I didn't send for anyone, Caro began crossly as she straightened, and I'm certainly not expecting anyone. I know you aren't, Captain Carowin, said a high, young, female voice. I came here on my own. Around the edge of the cave stepped a young woman dressed in heraldic trainee greys, and trailing her was her companion, who had a distinctly hangdog and guilty look about him. Darion cast a quick glance at Carowin's Saville, who was glaring at the new companion with much the same expression that Carrow was using with the trainee. Darion knew an incipient explosion when he saw one, and he was quite glad that he wasn't standing in the footprints of either the pretty young woman or her companion. There was something about the girl that was naggingly familiar to Darion, even though he was certain that he had never seen her in his life. I also brought my sister, the girl continued, undaunted, and since you just now mentioned healers, I can't help thinking that my premonition was accurate. She beckoned, and around the same edge of the cave, looking nervous and determined at the same time, stepped Keisha Alder. Keisha hadn't had a moment to think from the time that Shandi scooped her up until the moment they both intruded on the war council. Much to Keisha's relief, Darion rose and worked his way over to her, and both of them escaped from the council as quickly as they could. The fierce interrogation that Caro was putting Shandi Alder through was also an extremely uncomfortable and public grilling. No less public, though silent, was the similar set of coals that Shandi's companion was being hauled over by Saville. Your sister must be crazy. I can't believe she ran away from the Collegium, Darion said, shaking his head. Keisha just sighed. I can't either, though to give her credit, she didn't exactly run away. Darion gave her a quizzical look. So what did she do? He found a place for them both to sit. Keisha was only too glad to sink down onto a cool stone and stretch her aching legs out. Riding pillion, even on a companion, was about as uncomfortable as riding a dihele. She bullied them into letting her come back, if you can believe that. She said she had some sort of premonition, and since she obviously wouldn't take no for an answer, they gave in. Keisha thought incredulously about the Shandi who had left Erald's Grove, Shandi the Peacemaker, Shandi the Gentle, and shook her head with disbelief. I hardly recognized her. Start from the beginning, Darion interrupted. I want to hear this in sequence. Keisha took a deep breath and began at the beginning, just after dawn this morning. I was in Erald's Grove. Nightwind told me to spend half my time there, since I'm supposed to be the on-station healer now, and I'm supposed to take care of anything that happens to the volunteers now that most of the other healers are here with Carowin. I just checked the camp at morning call for anyone sick. No one was, but I always check. It was just about dawn. Then one of the sentries reported a herald coming. We expected Eldon, of course, so stayed to see what had brought him there. Obviously, we thought something might have happened out here, and out of absolutely nowhere, up comes Shandi, acting as if she had every right to be there and not at the Collegium where she belongs. She couldn't keep her indignation to herself. It crept out and colored her last sentence. Darion cocked his head to one side. Are you aware of how much you sound like your mother? He asked dryly. She flushed. I suppose I do. Well, being someone's big sister tends to make you feel that way. Anyway, she somehow managed to bluff the lieutenant into thinking she had orders to find Harold Captain Carowin. She found out where you all were, and before anyone could question her about anything, she just scooped me up and kidnapped me. She says she had a premonition that she and I had to be here for some reason, and that was why the Collegium let her go. Do you believe her? Darion asked. 
She hugged her knees to her chest and rested her chin on them. I don't know, she confessed, if it was anyone else, but it's hard to think of Shandi as, as having premonitions I'm supposed to believe in. She rubbed the side of her head, easing the ache in her temple. I mean, Shandi, of all people. She never showed any signs of anything like that before. People often don't. Not until they're chosen, anyway, Darion reminded her. She says her gift is foresight, but that it isn't properly trained yet, so all she gets is bits and pieces. I just don't know. Keisha rubbed her tired eyes and wished that this had happened to anyone but her. Can you think of any other reason why she should come pounding up here? Darion asked reasonably. And can't you think of a lot of reasons why she would avoid doing so if she could? Keisha had to smile at that. Well, she admitted, now that you mention it, if Mum and Da got word she was here, they'd have a worse fit than they did over my staying. She'd never hear the end of it. And as for the captain, she shuddered. I'd rather die than have to explain something like this to Captain Caro. Darion spread his hands. There you have it. I'd trust that premonition personally. Everything she told you sounds perfectly logical to me. I don't think her companion would have gone along with this if she had been making it up, do you? Keisha nodded slowly and felt a little better. You're right. You're absolutely right. The only thing is, she said her premonition involved me. I don't like the sound of that. Darion interrupted her worrisome thoughts. Now, would you like to hear what we've been finding out, since it seems that you're going to be involved? Keisha nodded, and when Darion was done, she remained silent, thinking everything he told her over carefully. This summer fever, she ventured. I don't like the sound of it. It sounds more dangerous than the barbarians. Why? he asked, puzzled. They've had a few years to get used to it. I've never heard of anything like it down here, she told him, feeling a little chill in her heart. If it got loose here, it could go through us like a wildfire. We have healers, he objected. Surely they can do something first. You have to know what you're up against, how it works, before you can fight it, she pointed out. Otherwise, it's like fighting an enemy blindfolded. Sure, you can flail around with a sword and hope you hit something, but you're more likely to get hit yourself first. He winced. I see your point. That's not all that bothers me, but it's the main thing, she continued, wondering if he would understand how she felt. I think you aren't going to like this, but I think we have to help them. As he'd described the children with their withered limbs, she'd felt that old familiar tug, that insistent call to do something. The only difference was now she had the tools to act on that call. What do you mean by that? Darion asked sharply. I mean, I'm a healer now, in everything but the robes. It's part of the vow. I have to help where there's need, and you can't deny that these people need help. She watched him closely, begging with her eyes for his understanding. Don't you see? That's why healers are what we are. We don't take sides. We just help, no matter what. She watched strong emotions flit over his expression, watched him fight down an immediate retort and give his anger a little time to cool. I know it sounds crazy, even disloyal, but you can ask any of the others, and they'll tell you the same, she said softly. I don't doubt you, he said brusquely, but I think it's madness. He smiled crookedly. Maybe that's why I'm not a healer. Still, you did say that in order to deal with this sickness, you have to know what it is you're fighting and how to combat it, right? She nodded and I've never heard of a fever or a plague that would stay politely in one place or attack only certain people, no matter what some priests would claim. So if you're going to be able to battle it when it finally decides to jump to our side, I'd rather you did your flailing around on patients that aren't Taledras or Valdemarin. 
He turned his hands palm upward and shrugged. Chauvinistic of me, but there it is. It's a point, she agreed, relieved that he had conceded the potential conflict. She already had the germ of an idea in her head, but for it to succeed, she would need him. She stood up. First things first, though. Let's go see if Captain Caro left anything of Shandi. I want to know more about this premonition of hers than she told me on the ride. 14. They spotted Shandi, San's companion, walking toward them through the camp as they returned to the cave. Keisha was glad that the herald captain hadn't significantly damaged her sister. In fact, Shandi was remarkably composed for someone who had just faced the redoubtable Carowin on the wrong side of a situation. Nevertheless, she was clearly glad to see Keisha and Darion, and equally glad to be taken off to Darion's campsite. Woo, she said, collapsing on Darion's bedroll and stretching out flat, both eyes closed. I faced off against Captain Carowin with a weapon, and I never wanted to do that again, but getting a dressing down from her is a hundred times worse. She opened one eye and looked up at both of them. Whose bed am I taking up anyway? Yours? Your Darion, the half-hawk brother, I presume? Right on both counts, Darion said, his mind still clearly elsewhere, but his tone quite cool and unimpressed with Shandi's casual attitude. And I presume that the Herald Captain has informed you just how dangerous this situation is that you've casually barged into without so much as a by-your-leave. Keisha was astonished. She had never heard a young man take that tone with her sister— they usually couldn't keep themselves from near servility, but Darion had just done a little dressing down himself, had come within a hair of sounding angry with her, quite as if she were his little sister and not Keisha's. There was no doubt that the comment was intended as a rebuke, and Keisha hadn't ever heard a young man rebuke her sister since Shandi had turned ten. Shandi sat straight up, also taken aback by Darion's tone. She did, she replied, nettled. She also gave me leave to remain, on the basis of my premonition and the Collegium's acceptance of it, as long as I understood I was under her orders, absolutely and without exception or excuses. Darion leveled a look at the trainee that was just as severe as Carowin would have wanted. She means it, and we'll back it, he told her flatly. If you're ordered out of here, you will go, even if I have to knock you out and tie you onto that companion of yours. And don't think you can hide somewhere if you're ordered out either. You can't hide from the eyes of our birds, or the noses of our Kairi, no matter where you go or how cleverly you think you can conceal yourself. I've no intention of disobeying orders, Shandi snapped back, eyes flashing and her temper beginning to show. Keisha stepped in before it turned into a quarrel. I've got to know more about this premonition, she said earnestly. You didn't give me anything to make any kind of judgment on. I don't have that much myself, Shandi replied in irritation, still annoyed with Darion and giving him a dagger-laden glare. All I got was a few flashes and a feeling, a flash of me, one of you, one of him, though I didn't know who he was at the time, and a very, very strong feeling that I had to be where the captain was, so strong that I was halfway to Companion's Field to get Carless before I came to my senses. That's it. That's all? Darion asked incredulously, and on that basis the Collegium gave you leave to come to a battle zone? Are they crazed? So far I've had a grand total of four days of training in my gift, Shandi said tartly. It's not exactly under my control, all right? I have to make do with what I get. It was good enough for the senior herald at the Collegium— 
Now, why am I so certain that the senior herald at the Collegium didn't even know that we'd contacted the barbarians yet? Darion shook his head in disbelief, but didn't challenge her any further, which made Keisha grateful. Shandi didn't lose her temper often, at least the Shandi she knew didn't, but when she did, the results were often spectacular. At the moment, that was one spectacle she'd prefer not to witness. Darion took a deep breath, closed his eyes a moment, probably counting to ten or invoking patience, and then opened them again. You're probably tired, he said. You must have ridden like a madwoman to get here as quickly as you did. Why don't you get some sleep while I make sure someone gets a billet set up somewhere else for me? A bed's a bed, and I don't care where I sleep. Shandi heaved a great sigh and lay down again. Thanks. Sorry to be so sharp. I am pretty dread... She closed her eyes and didn't so much fall asleep as pass out. She did it so quickly that Keisha realized she must have gone without sleeping, except in the saddle, for her entire journey. Darion obviously realized it, too. He managed a little smile and took Keisha by the elbow, leading her silently away through the rows of tents. You're the only one of us that looks like she got any sleep last night, he observed, when they were out of earshot. I probably am, she replied, noting with concern the deep shadows under his eyes. That was awfully good of you, to give up your bedroll to her. He waved the compliment aside. It's just a bedroll. The Herr Tassi can move my things elsewhere, and they will as soon as I... Hey, la, he interrupted himself as a Herr Tassi poked its snout out of a larger tent. It waited expectantly while he hissed something at it, bobbed its head, and ran off. There, he said with satisfaction, I've got myself a new bunk with winter sky, and you one with the healers, which I'd better take you to so you can all get your heads together over this summer fever thing. Thank you, she replied, feeling more confident than she had since Shandi carried her off this morning. Maybe I'm wrong, but it seems more important to me than the barbarians fighting with us. And maybe you're right, was Darion's thoughtful reply. After all, there's always the tactic of bottling them up in their camp and starving them into submission, but a line of fighters isn't going to keep a plague inside their pickets. Listen, I hope you weren't offended by the way I treated your sister, but, well, he scratched his head, then shrugged, I'm not impressed. She strikes me as used to getting her own way a lot, pretty immature, actually, Honestly, she hasn't half the brains and good sense you have. She's probably so tired that half her brains aren't working, Keisha pointed out. Besides, she's not used to boys who treat her like... like... Like a brat who's getting away with something she shouldn't, Darion offered with a half-smile. Like a spoiled village princess who expects fellows to melt just because she looks at them with those sweet brown doe eyes... Oh, please. Keisha was so surprised by his answer that she simply stared at him for a moment. Well, she is so very pretty. Not prettier than you, Darion said bluntly, and you have a great deal more than being pretty, if you'll pardon my saying so. A hawk brother could turn a mud doll into a beauty. We aren't that impressed by prettiness alone. For all his bluntness, he started to blush as he said that, and looked quickly away as she continued to stare at him in further astonishment. Right, here's the healer's tent, he said quickly, waving at the large tent pitched at the end of the path they were on. You go right on up. The Herr Tassi will have told them you're coming. I'll find Winter Sky's billet and get a nap myself before something else happens. Still blushing, he left her and made a sharp turn to the right, as she watched him hurry away with bemusement. Then she shook herself into sense and made straight for the healer's tent and business. 
Granted, it was entirely a new and rather delightful feeling to have a young man tell her she was pretty and blush over her, but this was neither the time nor the place to get moonstruck. When she got within earshot of the tent, she heard the debate already going on inside. She pushed open the flap and was greeted immediately. Keisha, Nala called with relief. Good. We need all the minds on this that we can get. What do you know about this wasting disease? The healers had arranged themselves in a rough circle in the middle of the large infirmary tent, which at the moment had no patients in it. Nala and her apprentices squeezed over on the bench they were using, and Keisha took her place beside them. She detailed everything that Darion had told her, and then added, Tercel the Kingstag is the one who had direct contact with the chieftain's mind. Would you like him to come give us everything he got? That would be extremely helpful, Gentian said thoughtfully, not at all disturbed by the notion of having the Daihili dump a basket load of mental images directly into his mind. Keisha turned in time to see a Hertasi coming into the tent with what must be her bedroll. In Taledras, she asked it if Tercel could be invited to the tent and why. Easily done, healer, it answered with a bow of profoundest respect and left the bedroll on the tent floor to answer her request personally. I believe that we must assume that this illness is both contagious and a grave danger to us, Nala said, as Keisha turned her attention back to the group. Remember the description, that it first went through the barbarians like a wildfire? Now we can expect them to have built up some immunity, but we have no such protection at this point. Grenthen mopped his brow and the back of his neck with a kerchief. You surely know what the villagers and even Lord Breon would insist on if we let it be known that we consider it very dangerous, Grenthen said reluctantly. They'd want us to surround the camp and burn them and it down to the ground. That's unacceptable, Gentian snapped, rounding on his fellow healer as if Grenthen were an enemy. We cannot condone anything of the kind. I don't advocate that, Grenthen protested, his hands up as if to ward off a blow. I'm just telling you what Lord Breon would say. But we have no cure, no treatment, Nala pointed out. We don't even know what we're facing. Where does the oath put us? Are we to serve everyone, or the greatest good? Are we to try to save outsiders at the possible expense of unleashing a plague on thousands of our own innocent people? I don't think that there is any doubt that we are to serve everyone, friend and enemy alike. The oath is crystal clear on that point, Gentian replied stiffly. I can't imagine how you could interpret it otherwise. You can't serve anyone if you're all dead, Keisha said slowly and shook her head. We don't even know how this thing spreads. You could all be infected by now for all we know. Eldon and the rest brought it back with them from their parley, and it's only a matter of time before we all get it. Instantly their faces all went blank. She waited while they searched within themselves for signs of infection of any kind. It didn't take very long, they were so used to doing so, and the looks of relief told her that at least that fear was groundless. So it isn't instantly contagious. Still, she let the sentence hang in the air, not needing to add, it could have been. She let the thought sink in, then continued, I can't see how we have the right to expose our own folk just so we can treat these strangers. We won't get anywhere by not treating it, Nala said at last. The question is, how? From what you told us, these barbarians would welcome us if we just marched straight into their village. And they might equally slit our throats if we couldn't provide instant cures, Grenthen countered, fanning himself with his sleeve as the air inside the tent became close and warm. 
Yes, I agree. We must act. But I don't relish the notion of putting myself so completely at their mercy, which might well be non-existent. Look, I do agree with the oath in principle, but I have serious reservations about applying it to a pack of folk who eat their meat raw. At that moment, the Herr Tassi returned, with Tercel at its side. Keisha quickly explained what she wanted, and the king's stag readily agreed. Do brace yourselves, please, the Daihili said calmly. You are unused to this, and it will be something of a shock to your minds. The experience wasn't anywhere near as traumatic as getting the Hawk Brother language, but the lump of memory images hit each of them with a palpable impact, much as if they'd been struck by a stone, leaving them reeling for a moment. Keisha managed to stammer thanks. Tercel nodded gravely in return and left the tent without a word, giving them all the peace to sort out the jumble of sights and sounds, emotions and visceral sensations that came with the memory fragments. The three experienced healers actually sorted things through a lot faster than Keisha would have thought, possibly because they were all used to sorting through the chaos of a battlefield. Of the six healer trainees, three felt unwell and had to go lie down, and the other three sat blinking owlishly and a little stunned during the rest of the discussion. Keisha had been ready for the experience and was the first to recover, waiting for the rest to make what they could of what they'd been given. This definitely isn't anything we've seen before, Grenthen acknowledged. At a guess, it spreads through direct contact, the way a cold does. I think it might be less contagious than a cold, Nala added thoughtfully. Otherwise, everyone would have been struck down when it first appeared. And I think that low temperatures, winter chill probably kills it, or at least makes it dormant. After all, these people spend their winters in tents in a chillier climate than we have. Did any of you get that memory? Of the way they go from fall to spring without ever once getting out of their fur clothing, not even to couple? They must smell to high heaven, but that might be why they don't catch the disease in winter. It can't spread through the frigid air, and there's nothing I'd call physical contact during the cold moons. It could spread through flea bite, I suppose. Fleas hibernate when the cold doesn't outright kill them. I did get those memories, Gentian seconded and shuddered. The cleanliness of these people leaves a great deal to be desired, at least in winter. Well, given how cold it gets, I can't see that I blame them, Grenthen said diplomatically. It's all beside the point, which is the question of what we are to do. I'll tell you what you won't be doing, said a wrathful voice from the open tent flap. You won't be marching into a barbarian village, giving aid and comfort to plague carriers, not while I'm in command here. Carowin strode into the center of their circle and glared at all of them with impartial impatience. What's more, if any of you try, I'll personally have you bound hand and foot and tied to a tree to prevent you from going anywhere. Dear gods, why am I being saddled with a wagon load of idiots? Where is your sense? Where is your loyalty? Our loyalty is to our oath, as it should be, shouted Gentian, who had gone red in the face with anger as Carowin spoke. Captain, I might remind you that it was a healer who stuck to his oath many years ago who kept you from becoming a cripple. Healers don't take sides, Nala seconded, with a little less volume but no less force, and a glare just as fierce as Carowin's. That's the oath, and a good thing, too. Damn you people! What about the rest of us? Carowin shouted right back, her eyes so cold with rage that they sent chills down Keisha's spine. 
Just what are we going to do if you all get sick and die, and the barbarians decide to make a fight of it anyway? What are we supposed to do if they decide you aren't trying hard enough to cure them, and figure to encourage you with a bit of creative torture, or slit your throats because you couldn't help the ones already crippled? What idiot would assume all of us would go into the camp? Grenthen countered with derision. Great Lord! Since when have healers ever abandoned a post they'd been assigned to? The same idiot who heard you discussing just that would naturally make that assumption. Carowen snarled right back. Whoa! Keisha shouted, jumping to her feet and bringing the entire shouting match to a halt. When they all turned to stare at her, she fought down the impulse to run out of the tent, swallowed, and sat down. We can't go into the camp, Harold Captain. She said in a more normal tone of voice. We'd already decided that. We don't know these people or what they'll do. We don't know their language, customs, or superstitions, and we have no way of predicting anything they might assume. All we do know is that they have legends of healers, and as we are aware, legends are difficult things to live up to. Not to mention that not even an idiot puts himself completely into the hands of people who already considered kidnapping and coercion. Gentian said gruffly. Captain Caro, some of us have been with you for a very long time, and the very last thing we do is leave you in the lurch. What we do agree on is that our oath demands that we try to help these folk, and that the oath comes first, even before our loyalties. And you wouldn't have it any other way. There have been plenty of your people who have been cared for by the healers on the side opposite yours, and you know it. The other thing we agree on is that this disease is enough of a danger to Valdemar that we don't dare ignore it and hope it sticks to the barbarians. Nala said stiffly, "Whether you like it or not, we can't leave until we've found a treatment, and we can't do that without treating the barbarians. Even burning the camp and its occupants might not stop it." Keisha put in softly but shrewdly. Since we don't know how it spreads at all, some of the biting insects might well be carrying it now, and it will be only a matter of time before it spreads to us. We really do have to find a cure, or at least a palliative. Carowin looked very sour indeed, but conceded their points. Just promise me that you won't do anything until after you've consulted me," she added, with a look that told Keisha that if they didn't agree, she would follow through on the threat to truss them up like dinner-time fowls. She got that promise from everyone but Keisha, and Keisha could hardly believe it when she didn't seem to notice the omission. I hope it spreads by fleas," sighed Nala when Carowin had left. "Dear and gracious gods, I hope it spreads by fleas the way boil plague does. Fleas we can do something about, but who can stop the air from flowing?" Keisha got up for a moment and took a quick peek outside the tent. Then she returned as the others watched her curiously. I actually have an idea," she said diffidently. "If you want to hear it, go right ahead," Gentian urged. "At the moment, we're dry. If we could get the barbarians to send one of the sick people out, one of us could go into quarantine with the sick person. That way, no one would be at risk except a single healer." She swallowed, then continued. I figured I'm probably the best one to do that. You can't send an apprentice, and you know that. You all say I have a really strong gift. You all agree that I'm as good as any of you with herbs and medicines. I'm the obvious choice because I'm the easiest one to replace. That started another argument entirely, with all three of them coming up with whatever they could think of to deter her from any such idea. The strongest argument against her plan was that she didn't have experience in using her gift, especially not against something deadly. Oh, 
I agree that you've done very well so far, Gentian half scolded, but that was against tiny infections, colds, belly aches, not against a fatal illness, not against something no one has ever seen before. Keisha shrugged, pretending indifference. Diseases work the same, whether they're mild or serious, she pointed out. A tiny infection and a rotting limb are the same. It's just a matter of degree. The idea does have merit, though, Nala said, after keeping her own counsel while the others argued. It would keep infection from spreading to the rest, and it would keep the healer out of the hands of the barbarians. I'd be willing to try treatment on that basis. I've survived plenty of plagues before this. What's one more? And just how are we going to get a volunteer barbarian? Grenthen asked shrewdly. We could ask, Keisha suggested timidly. No one laughed at her, although she more than half expected them to. Well, the barbarians have obliged me by falling in with my second choice of tactics, Carowin sighed, as Darion belatedly scrambled into his place in the council circle, feeling much better for a good, long sleep. Your hawk brother scouts reported that they were building up walls around their camp and fortifying them. I sent a deputation out to them to see what they'd do. They didn't meet my people with arrows, but they also didn't show so much as the tips of their noses. Grand, groaned Lord Brion. We've frightened them, and now they aren't going to move one way or the other. Not without a visitation from their miraculous ghost cat, is my guess, Carowin agreed, and ran her hand along the top of her hair. She cast a speculative eye at Firesong, who shook his head. Don't even start on what you're thinking, he warned. I wouldn't create a ghost cat illusion for anyone under circumstances like this. Firstly, I don't know how it's expected to behave. And secondly, what if it is an avatar? Are you willing to risk the anger of a god? I'm not. Not even one who's working outside his own lands. It was a thought, she replied wistfully. A bad one, he countered, leaving no room for further argument. Why don't you just set up a siege and hold them in place until they give up and surrender? They do have to eat, so they are going to come out at some point, but a siege under these conditions is far from ideal, she responded. It certainly wasn't what I had in mind, and only their gods know what they're planning in there. It could be anything. Remember, only a third of our troops have seen combat. All of theirs have. There's that sickness of theirs, too. What if part of their plan is to somehow spread it to us? What are we going to do then? Darion was worried, and he wasn't the only one, for he heard Lord Brion confide to Eldon in a whisper, I wish I could just pour oil on that entire nest of vipers and burn them out. Perhaps we're pushing them too hard, Eldon said aloud in reasoned, measured tones. After all, these people have been through a very great shock in meeting us. They've had their lives threatened, and they've seen that we have animal spirits of our own. We meant to intimidate them. We may actually have intimidated them so completely that they feel they are in a corner. What we should do, I think, is to give them time. We need to cultivate patience in dealing with them. In fact, I think we ought to pull back all our visible troops and leave only the birds as sentries. He smiled thinly. They've seen that we have birds who might well be totemic spirits with us. The birds standing sentry alone should be enough, because now they will never know when a bird is one of ours, or just a simple forest creature. Carowin shot him a strange glance, as if she hadn't expected that from him, began to open her mouth, then closed it again, looking very thoughtful. 
That's got some merit, she said after a moment. What do the rest of you think? Darion kept his mouth shut. He had an idea of his own, and he wasn't going to broach it. What he didn't reveal, he couldn't be forbidden to undertake. Personally, I think that's reasonable. Starfall spoke first. It's not as if we're under an arbitrary deadline to get this solved. We can afford to be patient with them. If they bottle themselves up, their own summer fever may solve the problem for us, Snowfire added. Harsh, Starfall said, but true. Maybe you aren't under a deadline, but I've got harvesting coming up, and my lady has a wedding planned. She's going to take it poorly if it's got to be delayed because we're playing nursemaid to a lot of greasy, fur-wearing barbarians, Lord Breon muttered, but he made no further objections. They've come out of a terrifying situation, and just when they thought themselves safer, were met by more frightening people. Eldon spoke as if he had thought this over already. If we meet them with mercy, who knows how they will react? They could become the best allies Valdemar has ever had. Our ancestors were refugees, just as they are, and who knows— Maybe our own forefathers were closer to being greasy, fur-wearing barbarians than to us, their descendants. He cast a glance at Lord Brion, who had the grace to look a little ashamed. We have never refused a refugee, because he came with a burden of powerful enemies. And even though the enemy this time is a disease, I don't see why that should change our attitude." Give them at least three or four days, Firesong urged. That's my counsel. Who knows, but maybe they've bottled themselves up to invoke this cat spirit of theirs, and if it is the avatar of any reasonable deity, it should tell them to be sensible and go along with us. Oh, surely, Carowen replied, with more than a touch of sarcasm. I don't know how many gods you've had to deal with in your time, but being sensible has not been on the agenda of many of the ones I've come across. Perhaps not sensible according to your needs and desires, Captain, Snowfire said with absolute politeness, but I'm certain it was sensible to those who worshipped those gods— always providing, of course, that the ones interpreting the gods' will were honest. Case in point, Kars before Solaris. Ha! Huh, good point. She sat down and looked all around the circle. So, pull back and patience it is. Anybody have any objections? Clearly there were none that anyone thought worth mentioning, so Carowin declared the meeting at an end and she and Snowfire left to meet with their respective troops and scouts and give them their new orders. The debate in the healer's tent had gone on for most of the day and showed no signs of stopping. Nightwind had joined them as the only representative of the Hawk Brothers, and she had concurred with the consensus that something would have to be done about the summer fever and quickly, before it crossed to the Allies. It's summer now, Keisha pointed out. What if another outbreak starts among them? What do we do then? We'd have to impose some sort of quarantine, I suppose, began Grenthen. That could be difficult if we're in the middle of armed conflict with them, Nightwind said dryly. Just how would we enforce it? Insist that only healthy people be allowed on the battlefield? Hold inspections for fever and sneezes before anyone can fight? Keisha choked back an involuntary laugh at the absurd image that conjured up. No one else seemed to find it funny, except, perhaps, Nightwind herself. I wonder, she started to say, then stopped. What? asked Gention, who had become the default leader at this point. Well, 
I just wonder why these Northerners don't have any real healers of their own. She continued, flushing, thinking that it was probably a stupid question. I mean, the shaman seems to have done herb healing and that sort of thing, but no one uses the gift. Apparently, no one else thought it was a stupid question because a wary silence descended on the group. Finally, Nala cleared her throat uneasily. In Kars, before Solaris, they used to test children for the gift of healing and sacrifice them if they were too old or too strong-willed to be indoctrinated into the priesthood. She said slowly. You don't suppose that these barbarians do the same thing, do you? In Kars, they also sacrificed children with mind speech on the grounds that it was a mark of demons. Gentian reminded her, but the use of mind speech didn't frighten these people. And I have very clear images from Tercel's gleanings that the shamans have never used the healing gift in the way we do. I suspect that healing is a gift they either don't possess or don't recognize. If they thought it was an evil thing, they wouldn't be looking for healers. Nightwind added, "No, I don't think this is a case of doing away with children showing the gift." Any one with an untrained, unused gift of healing would just go off by himself to get away from the things he started to pick up from everyone else, and that's hardly unusual behavior among these folk. From what I've gleaned, people split off from their clans all the time, either because of feuds or jealous protection of a good hunting range or basic dislike of others in the clan. One of the apprentices cleared his throat. This was a young man Keisha would have picked for a scholar, not a healer. It makes more sense in a society like theirs for people who don't fit to go off on their own. They'll never find a mate, and dissension weakens the group. A scholar's reasoning, if ever I heard it, but he's right. Still, wouldn't at least a few of them learn what the gift meant? Nala asked. I've known plenty of self-trained healers, but those self-trained healers knew not only that there was such a thing in the first place, but what it meant and what signs to recognize it by. Nightwind replied, "Not only that, but think of what their lives are like, particularly now." With that much pain and illness all around them, children with the gift might well shut themselves down completely, just out of instinctive self-defense. They'd probably do so long before any other real signs manifested. It's happened that way before, and if you don't know that the bad feelings you are getting are coming from other people, or that they mean that you can actually help those other people. You'd welcome anything that made them go away. There are times when I'd welcome it now," Nala put in wryly. At that point, Darion arrived with a message that made all of their debate moot, at least for a few days. "May I interrupt you?" he asked, poking his head inside the tent and bringing with him a breath of cooler air. Be my guest," Gentian responded. "You aren't interrupting anything that hasn't been talked to death by now. We're arguing in circles. The barbarians have shut themselves up in their camp, and the war council has agreed to pull back and let them settle for a couple of days anyway." He joined the circle, squeezing in next to Keisha, who obligingly moved over for him. The thought is that maybe we were a bit too good at giving them a scare, and that they may need some time to stew things over and figure out that we don't want to wipe them out. Well, some of us don't. Anyway, no one is going to do anything for the next day or two, or even three. Thought you'd want to know. That gives us some breathing room, Gentian said with obvious relief. Then looked around the circle. Go think about these things, and we'll talk them over tomorrow. Maybe a little sleep will give us a new direction.
Keisha already had a direction in mind, but she was going to need Darion's help to make her plan work. She waited while the others went their separate ways, then said, before Darion could leave, I'd like to get your opinion on something. May I borrow a little of your time? Of course, he agreed, eagerly enough to give her a little thrill of pleasure. Let's collect some dinner, and we can talk while we eat. At that point, she realized that the chaya and vegetables that had been passed around the healer's conference had worn off a very long time ago, and she was only too happy to follow his lead. He seemed to want real privacy as much as she did, for he found a place near the brook that supplied water for the camp, practically on top of a set of fist and head-sized water-rounded rocks that broke up the flow where the babbling waters effectively masked low-voiced speech. I have an odd feeling that our minds are running along the same lines, he said, managing to get his dinner eaten while avoiding talking with his mouth full. So, what did you have in mind? She stared at the water for a moment, phrasing her plan in her mind. I think we ought to try and catch a barbarian, she replied. First of all, we need to be able to talk to them in their own language. We can't do anything by just going through Tercel, not really. Maybe they've experienced mind speech before, but talking to them in their own language would make them feel more comfortable. You are either reading my mind, or we're reasoning along exactly the same lines, he exclaimed, with muted surprise. And you are absolutely right. That's precisely what we need to do. I had it in mind that we weren't going to really learn what's going on in their camp unless our watchers knew their tongue. But you have something more in mind than that, don't you? We need to find out directly whether or not this summer fever is in their camp and just what they expect a Valdemarin healer to be able to do about it, she told him firmly. At that point, we'll have a basis for negotiations, don't you think? Negotiations or not, we do need to know if there's anyone that can spread the fever to us, absolutely. He toyed with a bit of bread, his expression so opaque that Keisha couldn't read it. We aren't going to get any of that from the leaders. They probably have some stupid code about fighting honor, and they'll certainly have their status tied up in warfare. We'll have to catch someone ordinary, someone who isn't a fighter, who'd be perfectly happy if there wasn't a battle, or at least wouldn't be looking to start a fight, she continued. An old man, or a woman, perhaps. Or a child, he mulled that over, while she held her breath, hoping that his answer would be the same as hers. Whatever, it should be someone who'll sneak out of the camp alone, so with you, me, Kel and Tercel at most, we can overpower him long enough for Tercel to get the language. Exactly, she beamed at him. I guessed you'd be clever enough to see that, and willing to have me along to help. Willing? Havens, I can't see trying this without you. Kel can subdue someone, but we're going to have to immobilize our man, and Kel's claws aren't dexterous enough for that. He grinned back. Now this is just what I meant about you having good sense, with courage to match it. She flushed and looked down at her stew bowl, eating very rapidly while she tried to subdue her blushes. When do you want to try this? she asked. And I know you're not enamored of her, but I think we ought to bring Shandi in on this too. She's very clever, and she's another set of hands. What about that companion of hers? he replied skeptically. I'm sure she wouldn't give us away, but what's to stop him from tattling to Carowin Saville? She covered her mouth with her hand, embarrassed at her own stupidity. It was just so alien to think of Shandi with a companion. Oh, I completely forgot about him. No, you're right. We shouldn't bring her into this. Carlos would have to tattle to Saville, especially after the way that Saville dressed him down. And what Saville knows, Carowin will soon find out. Companions are pretty bad about keeping any secrets but their own. Well, 
As to when, we can try tonight. Have Kuari keep a watch on the camp, and let us know if anyone from the women's fire sneaks out. He scratched his head, thinking. My guess is the women will probably try to get out under cover of darkness to fetch water, and some of the older children might have some snares out in the forest they'll want to check. With our people withdrawing, they aren't going to be quite as willing to do without fresh food and water when there's no apparent danger. I know I was perfectly capable of running snares when I was only seven or eight. I can't see why they wouldn't be able to. During a siege, every little bit of food is valuable, and a boy might well get manhood status by daring to go outside the palisade to bring in rabbits. She considered that, although she didn't like the idea of trying to run about in the dark. She could see that this would offer the best opportunity— We'll have to catch our quarry far enough away from the barbarian camp that help won't be able to come, she said cautiously. It'll have to be so far that even if our prey raises a fuss, she won't be heard, for there's no point in taking the chance that someone would mount a rescue. It could get touchy when someone vanishes out in the forest, you know. With any luck, the barbarians will think that a forest monster caught her, Darion replied, with just a touch of callousness. Then he looked faintly apologetic at his own attitude. Oh, I know that sounds bad. It's just that I still can't help but think back and want some kind of revenge. She nodded, fully able to understand his feelings. Revenge doesn't get you anything productive, though and it tends to breed more of the same. Yes, he sighed. You know, sometimes it's an awful lot of trouble to be a civilized, reasonable, passably good person. She thought back on all the times when she'd been tempted herself to just lash out at the world, the things she could have inflicted on poor stupid Peel, for instance, and nodded. I know, she replied, with profound understanding. Believe me, I know. If we're going to keep doing this, we've got to get a Kyrie on our side, Keisha whispered to Darion as they crept, slowly and with many pauses for Darion to check with Kuari, through the undergrowth near the barbarian camp. She had made it very clear to him that she had no intention of climbing through the trees, and with some reluctance he agreed that she was probably justified in refusing. She didn't have the skills, the practice, or even Kuari to lend her his sight. She'd be going blindly, depending on Darion, and hoping she didn't make a fatal false step. The tree root would be extremely difficult by daylight, but impossible for her at night. No matter how much she trusted Darion's competence, she didn't trust it that much. Kel was with Kuari in the trees above, Tercel trailing along with them below. And thanks be to all the gods, Shandi is still sleeping like a bag of rocks, or she'd have found out what we were going to do. I just know it. Keisha had thought she was used to moving through the woods, but it was a different proposition in this thick, damp darkness. Sudden noises startled her, twigs caught at her clothing and her hair, and she couldn't seem to go three steps without making noises that sounded very loud to her. Darion was able to slip through the undergrowth as easily and noiselessly as a bit of mist. By contrast, she blundered through everything in her path like a blind calf. Nervous sweat plastered her hair to her scalp and her shirt to her back, and it was a tremendous relief when Darion's hand on her wrist signaled a halt, and they crouched in the shelter of some bushes— Kuari says there's someone sneaking out of the camp right now, he whispered. It's not a warrior, so this might just be our best chance at getting what we need. It looks as if he's coming this way, so we'll just stay where we are and let Kel ambush him. He? Well, as long as it isn't a fighter, it should still be all right. We should still be able to handle him if Kel takes him down. She nodded, hardly able to believe their luck. 
She'd assumed that they'd have to spend many nights like this, that this one was probably going to be nothing more than a rehearsal for an opportunity to come. But she reminded herself not to count on anything, and suppressed the nervous excitement that made her hands tremble and stomach clench. They didn't have a captive yet. I don't believe this, Darion whispered a moment later. He's still coming straight for us. He paused, and puzzlement crept into his voice. He's following something. Kuari can't quite see it, but there is something there. Maybe a pet escaped, and he's trying to catch it? A hunting dog, more like? Too valuable to get away, Keisha suggested. But out of nowhere came a strange shiver of premonition, a certainty that of all things a dog was definitely not what was out there. But Darion seemed satisfied with that explanation, or if he wasn't, he didn't say anything to her. If it brings him this way, it's fine with me, he said fervently. He's already too far from their camp for anyone to hear if he yells. A bit more, and he'll be so far out that the bond birds watching the camp won't notice anything either. Even better. That was something that had worried them both, that they'd give their plan away the instant Kel made his capture, that they'd be in trouble with their own side before they got a chance to see their plan through. In fact, he added with growing excitement, it looks like Kel is going to be able to bring him down practically at our feet. Try as she might, there was nothing to really see in these dark woods except variations in the degree of darkness. She already knew that she could peer out there until she got a headache and still see nothing. As time crawled as slowly as the ant making its way up her leg, Keisha swatted at insects and tried to be as quiet as possible while doing so, straining her ears for any sound that might signal the approach of this stranger. But when such a sign came, it wasn't a sound, but, much to her astonishment, a sight. Out beneath the trees, out on the edge of vision, she saw light— Something out there moved lithely from bit of cover to bit of cover, something very large and very pale, shimmering with a ghostly iridescence so faint that for a while she was half certain that the effect was nothing more than her own imagination or eye strain. The only reason she noticed it in the first place was its movement. It certainly wasn't human, nor was it a dog or any other beast Keisha recognized. She didn't get a good look at it. Either it was adept at hiding itself, or it changed shape from moment to moment. Was this what their quarry was stalking? If so, they owed it a debt. Just when it seemed that the creature was getting near enough that she'd be able to identify it, it faded into a wall of shadow and vanished completely, while the hair on the back of her neck stood up in atavistic alarm but it had been visible long enough for the young barbarian following to get exactly where Kelvrin wanted him. From somewhere up above came a blood-curdling screech, the slight shadow making his way carefully through the undergrowth in the wake of the ghostly light froze, still balanced on one foot. Then he made a break for it, but it was too late. Everyone had told Keisha that seeing Kelvrin make an attack was one of the most thrilling spectacles imaginable. It was too bad that it was far too dark for her to see anything except a pair of shadow wings for a fraction of a second, followed by a tremendous crash in the undergrowth. I have him, Kel crowed happily over the sound of hysterical screams. Now come and tie him up. Darion conjured a mage light in one hand and stared into the sullen eyes of their captive. He looked to be just around Darion's own age, perhaps a little younger. He was angry, frightened, and Darion would not have given a copper bit for their lives if he got a weapon in his hands. Physically, he was a little shorter than Darion, with weathered, scratched skin that would be pale beneath his tan, and a shock of unwashed, tangled black hair. 
His eyes were as black as his hair, and his teeth, clenched in a grimace, had the canines filed to points. They'd tied his hands behind him and his feet together and sat him up against a tree trunk while they moved on to the next part of the plan. He wasn't going to cooperate in any way whatsoever, not that Darion cared. He doesn't have to be cooperative in order for Tercel to get his language. Darion looked up at Tercel, who had watched the entire proceedings with intense interest. Are you ready? I am. I rather doubt that he is, however. The Daihili snorted. And you, healer, are you ready? As much as I can be, poor Keisha looked horribly nervous. This must have been so foreign to her, even though she had already undergone the process once. I know it's no help to say this, but if you can relax, this should be relatively easy for you, he told her with as comforting a smile as he could manage. The first time is always the hardest. You're used to it now, and you've had lots of practice in mind gifts. It's generally the fact that you're resisting something so entirely new that you instinctively fear it that gives you the worst headache. She blinked at him as if that hadn't occurred to her. Oh, was all she said, but as the hostile eyes of their prisoner went from him to her and back again— she visibly relaxed. Well done, Tercel said with approval, and then they were both lying flat on their backs, staring up at branches and leaves reflecting the mage light, as Kel and Tercel watched them with interest. Darion didn't have more than a touch of headache this time. He hoped Keisha had fared as well. Her first words seemed to indicate that she had. Forty-one words for snow? Keisha exclaimed in disbelief. Why would anyone need all those words for different kinds of snow? Snow is snow. All I care about is the words for what the hell do you people think you're doing here? Darion replied as he sat up, pleased to discover that he still had no more than a vague ache behind his forehead to show for this latest language acquisition. The young man had not fared so well. He was still out cold. I took the liberty of giving him Taledras, but not Valdemarin, Tercel informed them loftily. That way he will understand some of the negotiators and can act as a translator, but you will still have a language he does not know so that you can speak freely before him. Besides, it was a useful way to keep him from getting into mischief until you awoke. The king stag wrinkled his nostrils with his head high, testing the air. If you have no further need of me, I will be off. No further need, but we couldn't be doing this without you. Thank you, Tercel, Darion replied with feeling. You are most welcome. I hope that your plan succeeds. Tercel slipped away into the darkness, leaving them alone with the young barbarian who was just waking. What did you do to me? he demanded angrily, his face contorting with the pain of his headache. Is this some demon-born torture you've worked on me? No, Keisha said. It only feels like one. As the young man's eyes widened to hear her speak his own language, she continued, Our magics enable us to take what we wish from your mind, and it seemed useful to have command of your tongue. So, as you can see, there is nothing that you can keep secret from us, but taking your knowledge exacts a toll in pain from you, and we would spare you that. You can suffer more of this, or you can answer our questions." The choice is yours. Personally, I'd answer her, Darion added sternly, or you're likely to wish someone would kill you to be rid of the pain in your head. The more we take, the worse it will get. His face paled, and he appeared to wilt, and without that sullen, defiant expression, he looked several years younger than Darion. What do you want to know? he asked, defeat written large in his expression. 
Your name first, Keisha said. Highwell, son of Pedron, son of Hofgar the Ugly, son of... He began, obviously quite prepared to recite a lineage back to the beginning of his tribe. That's enough, Keisha interrupted, stopping him. Highwell will do. So, Highwell, why have your people fortified their camp? Darion asked, keeping his stern expression. We offered to treat with your people, but they are rejecting our offers with apparent hostility. Because we are not fools, the youngster retorted. You threaten us. You come upon us with magic and warriors. Are we to simply lie down and allow you to slaughter us? Why are you so hostile to us? We had heard that the peoples of the South were hospitable and welcomed strangers. You mean soft, don't you? Darion asked cynically, and the young man flushed, then paled. Well, you've found out differently. We've seen your kind. We know what to expect from you. Four years ago, one of your clan war parties came down here, looting and killing, making slaves and worse out of my folk, ruining what they didn't steal. Why shouldn't we meet you with fighters and magic? We should have met you with fire and the sword for what you did the last time. He started to warm to his subject, but the young man interrupted him with a curious look on his face. Why do you say it was my people who did this to yours? You're from the north, Darion replied stubbornly, anger burning in the pit of his stomach. You look the same, barring a few decorations. There are many clans and tribes in the north, and most of them look the same to an outsider, Highwell retorted, eyes flashing. Nevertheless, they are not all the same. My people have done nothing to yours. It was not my people who put yours to the sword. My people, he added proudly, do not trade in, keep, or make slaves. Our fighters do not make up war parties to loot the wealth of others. I do not know which of the marauding tribes brought harm to you, but we are not them. That simple statement brought Darion to a halt. It had never occurred to him that the tribes of the north could be as different as, say, Valdemar and Kars. My clan is Ghost Cat, Highwell continued, with such pride that Darion was surprised. And we are very like our totem. We are solitary hunters. We have our own herds. Our fighters are not thieves. They serve and protect the clan from those who would steal our wealth. We prefer being unseen, like the cat. None fight more bravely when we must, he continued with bravado, but we do not seek conflict. We walk by ourselves, seek our own path, and all places are alike to us. He tilted his head to one side, looking at Darion curiously. What totem did your enemies follow? A bear, Darion replied, wondering how much of Highwell's speech to believe and the shaman bore the sign of the eclipse. Highwell's eyes nearly popped with surprise. And you drove them off? Indeed, you are either lucky beyond belief or God-touched. That is blood bear, and they live for battle. When they can find no enemy, they fight among themselves. Most clans avoid them at all cost. They have even violated midsummer truce in one of their rages. He dropped his voice to a whisper and looked anxiously from side to side. Some of their warriors gained the aspect of the great bear itself by venturing into the forbidden places with their shaman. This I know, for I saw some of the bear warriors when I was still at the women's fire. It is said that they are the ones who brought the summer fever out of the forbidden places, which they dared to enter in their madness and their search for further unnatural powers and monstrous servants. That seemed to clinch it. The entire speech rang of the truth, for Darion hadn't mentioned the half-bear warriors or the lizard-like creature that had served as one of the leaders. Further, the youngster could not possibly know that they knew about summer fever and how it began. 
That brought Darion to a momentary standstill, at a loss for what to ask next, his anger running out of him. Keisha, however, was fully prepared to take over. What brought you out here in the darkness? she asked sternly. Why were you skulking about like one who would do ill? Were you planning to steal from us? No, Hywell said indignantly. We are ghost cat, not thieves. I would not soil my honor by theft. But if your people had closed themselves into their camp, why were you outside the walls and at night? Keisha persisted. Did you mean to spy upon us? He stared at her, stubbornly, but with fear at the back of his eyes. I can and will take the knowledge from you, she threatened. Do you give it to me freely, or would you care to have your pain redoubled and have me gain it regardless? He closed his eyes and whispered miserably, For my brother, I came for my brother. He has the summer fever, and I prayed to our gods to send me a sign, to send me a guide, to find one of the wise ones who can cure all ills. The fever has taken two of my brothers already, and I think to lose Jendi would kill our mother. I prayed and fasted, and tonight the ghost cat that has led us for so long appeared to me and led me here. Darion felt chill mixed with awe, for there had been that strange, ghostly shape leading the boy, and it had vanished utterly just before they caught him. And what if this is the hand of their god leading him to us because of Keisha? He exchanged glances with Keisha, and she changed to Valdemarin. This is a little too spooky, she said, shaken. I saw him following something. Kuari saw it too, didn't he? I know. I guess you saw what I saw? At her nod, he shivered. Now what? If a bout of fever has started in the camp, the odds are that it's going to cross over to us, she replied. But... This might be what I was hoping for. Earlier today, I suggested to the healers that if we could get a single victim outside the camp, we might be able to find a treatment without being under threat ourselves. She shrugged. What do you say about letting him bring his brother out and letting me take a chance with him? I wouldn't be in their power, and he wouldn't dare hurt me, not after what we've done to him. We could just go back and let the healers make sure we haven't caught it, but that would be throwing this gift back in the face of the god, who clearly intended that he and Keisha should do something. He didn't think that would be a very politic move at this point. Besides, Keisha continued with a grimace, there are two more things going for this idea. First of all, this is a child we're talking about. Not even Lord Breon would object to helping a child. Secondly, we obviously have to decide right now, and we can't afford to wait around to ask for permission. Hywell isn't going to have a lot of time to sneak in, get his brother, and sneak back out again, and this may well be the last time he can get out. The grimace turned into a crooked smile. It's easier to beg forgiveness than get permission, so I think we ought to figure on begging forgiveness. You're sure you want to go through with this? Darion asked dubiously, trying to think of good reasons to veto the notion, but fairly sure that anything he could think of, she'd have a counter for. She sighed, I don't want to, but I have to. I can't explain it any other way except to say that this is something that I have responsibility to handle. I was given the healer's gift. It's my duty to use it. But he already understood. Hadn't he said essentially the same thing to Firesong? He drew his knife, and Hywell tried to shrink back, clearly expecting that he was about to be murdered. But when Darion slit his bonds instead and stood up, he remained seated, staring up at Darion and rubbing his wrists. Go, Darion snapped, gesturing with his knife. If you want a wise one for your brother, go now and bring him back here, just you and him and no one else. 
We have a hundred eyes in the night, and if you bring anyone else, we will not be here, and your brother will die. Hywel's expression changed from fearful to hopeful and back again. Is this true? he breathed. Do you mean this? Do you believe in the guidance of your ghost cat? Keisha asked softly. I am a wise one. That was enough to decide him. He sprang to his feet. You will never regret this, he cried. Never. I will serve you all my days, and my spirit will defend your children and your children's children after I am ashes. With that, he turned and ran off into the dark, running as surely as if his feet had eyes, and the eyes in his head were those of an owl. Darion looked askance at Keisha. Did we do the right thing? he asked, suddenly unsure. Oh, yes, she replied, staring into the darkness after Highwell. We did the only thing we could all live with. Fifteen. I have an idea, Kelvrin said, a few moments after Highwell had vanished into the darkness. I hear the stream not far from here. Go there and wait for my return. He took to the air, leaving the two of them alone. Darion listened for a moment, then moved off to the right, the mage light bobbing along over his head. Keisha followed him, and within a few moments heard the sound of the stream herself. Darion brought them to a spot on the banks of the stream, a large version of the freshet beside their camp, which tumbled noisily over flat rocks in a series of small waterfalls. Here they found a place where moss made a thick, soft carpet beneath their feet, kept well nourished by the spray from the stream. Keisha sat down with a sigh, and Darion did the same. Are you sure you're up to this? he asked, worried for her sake. This isn't anything like you've done before. She licked her lips and stared off into the darkness for a moment, wearing an expression that suggested she was testing her own resolve. I know, and I'm not sure, but the rest of you can't do without Nightwind, Gentian, Grenthen, and Nala, and the apprentices aren't even as far along as I was two years ago. I thought that learning to use my gift was going to be hard, and it was at first, but only at first. It was a lot like riding. Once I knew what to do and what it felt like to do it right, it was just a matter of exercising those muscles until they were strong and didn't hurt any more. And I've been doing that a lot, as much as I could stand. Plus, I can talk to Jendi and it's going to be scary enough for him to be handled by a stranger. It would be worse if they couldn't even speak to him. If not me, who else? She made a face as she thought of the endless wrangling in the healer's tent earlier that day. Besides, the others would want to debate this idea for hours, and all the time this little boy would be getting sicker. I need to stop this fever as early as possible." Darion rubbed his tired eyes. I wish there were some other way, but I can't think of anything. Neither can I. She cocked her head to the side, listening intently as she heard the sound of labored wing beats. Is that Kel? It was, and he carried a clumsily wrapped bundle. I have provisions, a tent, and your herb bag, Keisha, he said smugly once he was down on the ground. Also, bedrolls. You can make a little healer's tent right here, and best of all, no humans will know that these things are missing until you tell them, Darion. How? Darion asked, staring at the bundle. How did you manage to get all that? Kel looked even more smug, if that was possible. I have my ways. Keisha hugged his neck, much to his pleasure, before seizing the bundle. Darion helped her untie it and get the tent and camp set up. 
It was a very small tent, barely big enough for two people, but if the weather turned, it would keep Keisha and her patient dry and sheltered. It wasn't long before they had everything set up, with a tiny campfire to keep the mage light company, and there was nothing more to do but sit and wait for Highwell's return. I wish I'd brought handiwork, Keisha sighed, fidgeting with her medicine bag, pulling things out, looking at them, and putting them back in again. Even mending, something to keep my hands busy. You could scratch my crest, Kel suggested brightly. It is very lucky to scratch a griffin's crest. Is that true? We're going to need plenty of luck, Keisha replied, as Kel stretched out his head in her direction. It is well known, Kel assured her, as Darion kept back a laugh at Kelvrin's bare-faced ploy to get a scratch. A long and treasured tradition. Kel's eyes glazed with pleasure as Keisha's dexterous fingers rubbed the sensitive skin under his feathers. Ah, the griffin sighed. Don't you feel luckier already? We're going to have a chance to test that tradition, Darion said, jumping to his feet as Kuari alerted him. Here comes Hywel with the boy. Boy? Closer to a toddler, rather. When Hywel ran up to them, panting with exertion, the little one he carried in his arms could not have been more than five or six years old at the most. Keisha waved Darion away and took the fur-wrapped burden from Hywel herself. Don't come near us, she warned, before Darion could move to help her. There's no point in two of us being exposed. She laid the boy down on one of the bedrolls. How long has he been sick? she asked Highwell. A day, no more. He stroked his brother's damp forehead with surprising tenderness. You see, already he is lost in fever, and that is not good. It is those whom the fever takes hard and early who die. The last three words came out, sounding strangled, as Highwell choked back what could have been a sob. He rubbed his eyes fiercely as Darion stood well off, feeling distinctly awkward and useless. Highwell, you stay with me. All I need is an extra pair of hands, and if Jendi wakes up, he'll be easier with you here. She looked up from the boy and shrugged. You and Kel might as well go back and tell them what I've done. I'm sorry to have to leave you that unpleasant chore, but you can always tell them that I did it before you had any idea what I was planning. Oh, and try to lie to Firesong and Starfall? Digging a well with my teeth would be easier, and a lot less painful. He smiled crookedly. No, we're in this together, and I'd better get back and get it over with. He wanted to ask if she was going to be all right, and knew it was a stupid question. Remember all that luck you just got, he said instead, feeling horribly helpless. I will, she said, as she put the child down on one of the bedrolls, but it was clear that her mind was on the boy and nothing else, and he was just distracting her. He started to leave, then turned back. I don't want anything to happen to you, Keisha, he managed, and stopped himself before he said anything ill-omened. At that, she looked up and smiled with surprising warmth. Thank you, she replied softly. Now go, because I don't want anything to happen to you either. Don't let the Herald Captain eat you alive. Knowing then the best way to help her would be to obey her, he left, but slowly, looking back over his shoulder until he couldn't even see the light from the tiny campfire anymore. Oh, this is a very sick little boy, she thought, taking the child into her arms. He was so fevered that heat radiated from him. Keisha's first act was to unwrap the child from his bundle of furs, strip him of his sweat-sodden clothing, and wash him down with cool water to bring his fever down a little. 
Fever was a good thing in principle, but this boy's fever was so high that he was in danger of going into convulsions unless she cooled him. She sponged him a second time with something that killed body insects, wrapped him briefly in the furs so that the fumes would work on whatever bugs he carried, then unwrapped him and sponged him a third time with plain water. If fleas did carry the sickness, she just protected herself. That done, she dressed him in one of her old shirts and bundled him into the bedroll. Take those furs and things out of here and put them out somewhere to air for about five days, she ordered Hywell. Either that or bury or burn them. She heard a choked-off sound, as if he were about to object, then silenced himself. A moment later, he and the filthy furs were gone. Only a day. I've never seen a fever progress so quickly— she waited impatiently for Hywell to return as she checked reflexes in Jendi's arms and legs. Whatever this illness was, at least the paralysis and wasting hadn't set in yet, or at least it hadn't set in so much that there was a noticeable difference from healthy reflexes. Deep down inside, she was afraid, horribly, desperately afraid, but she buried that fear in work. As long as she could keep working, she could keep the fear at bay. Hywell returned as she checked Jendi's breathing. When this fever kills, how does it do so? she asked, frowning as she listened to the lung and heart sounds through a hollow tube she placed on his chest. It smothers, he said simply. You fight for breath, but there is no strength in the chest, and it smothers. Paralysis of the chest muscles? That would make sense. So what do these things all have in common? Could the fever be attacking the network of nerves that told muscles when to move and how? That network came from the spine. Even the newest trainee knew that. There were fibers that were said to carry orders from the brain to the spine and out to the muscles, as well as carrying sensation back to the brain, just as blood flowed from the heart out to the body and back. Accidents and wounds had proved that if you cut them, paralysis and loss of feeling was the result. So could this fever be killing or damaging them to get the same effect? She seized a silver point and a notebook from her medicine bag and wrote down her speculations. If what she tried failed, and if she succumbed to this fever, at least the next healer would have a little more to go on. "'What are you writing?' Hywell asked, with awe in his voice. "'Spells,' she said briefly, which seemed to impress him further. "'Tell me all you know about how the summer fever started.' He didn't seem taken aback that she asked the question, and she made notes as he talked. It was the midsummer gathering, he said obediently. It was held that year in Ghost Cat territory. I was still at the women's fire then, so it was, oh, many cold seasons ago. Oh, many indeed, I'm sure, she thought, guessing his age at fourteen. Three, maybe four at the most, around the time the first lot came down here. Blood Bear was there, and that was when I saw the Bear Warriors, who were as much bear as man, he continued. Our fighters brought back tales that they had monsters at their fires also, some as slaves and some among the warriors, and that there was boasting around the men's fire that they had brought only half their numbers, for the rest were out raiding. We shunned the forbidden circles, for the ghost cat had sent warning dreams to our shaman, but the blood bear shaman scoffed at our dreams, swore that such places brought power and strong spirits, and he and more warriors went a-hunting forbidden places. So they brought back the fever, she asked, as she put down the silver point and selected carefully from among her medicines. Not at once, no, he told her. They brought out strange animals, like small, hairy people who chattered like magpies and howled like dogs. These I did not see, but my father told me of them. 
They tried to make slaves out of the beasts, but the creatures were weak, acted sickly and odd, and soon died. A few days later, the fever began. He shrugged. That is all that I know. So this came from contact with sick animals from the change circle. That makes a little more sense. She finished mixing her draft of medicines with juice and honey and carefully raised the feverish boy, putting it to his lips. He was very thirsty, in spite of being mostly out of his head. He sucked at the cup eagerly and perhaps because of the sweet taste, drank it down to the last drop. He's getting dehydrated. I have to get more liquid into him. She filled the empty cup with cool water and repeated the process until he turned his head, refusing further drinks. She smoothed back the damp black hair from the flushed forehead. This child was so different from the littles of Erold's Grove, yet so very much the same, with a mother who would mourn his loss deeply and a brother who loved him enough to do anything to save him. She made him as comfortable as she could, finished her note-taking, then turned to Highwell. I am going to work magic to read his fever, she said sternly, fighting down panic that threatened to paralyze her. You must not interrupt me. Nah, you go to the spirit world, I know, he said wisely, interrupting her, just as our shaman did. If our shaman had not been struck down with the first to suffer summer fever, he would have chased the fever spirits with the good spirits he brought back. I have seen him walk with the ghost cat in the spirit world many times. I will guard you when your spirit travels from your body as the warriors did for him. Have no fear. As good an explanation as any, she thought, when she recovered from the startlement she'd felt at his easy acceptance of what she was going to do. At least he knows what to do. There was no time to put it off further. She had done everything she could for the boy with hands and herbs. Despite doubts and soul-numbing fears that she had hidden from both Darion and Hywel, she must rely on a gift she had only recently learned to use. Now only her gift could help him further. She settled herself at the child's side and sank into healing trance. She was aware at first only of herself because she was still within the shields that she had managed to make second nature and automatic. To her own inner eye, she radiated a pure, clear, emerald green light contained within a skin of radiant yellow. Taking heart from this, she reminded herself that this was something she had done before. The job was larger, but no different than fighting simpler illnesses. She took the shield skin inside herself, absorbing the energies, and fixed her attention on the living creature nearest her, the muddled and roiled energy bundle that was the sick child. Even at this distance, it was obvious to her oversight that the boy was dreadfully, dangerously ill. To examine the nerve net, she would have to sink deeper than she ever had before and look more closely. Examining the surface would tell her nothing. She moved herself to hover over the boy, then slowly let herself merge with him. Her awareness passed through the skin, a protective envelope of sickly pink energy, damaged here and there by the tiny scratches and cuts any active child could get in playing, and which also had its share of insect bites, which appeared to her as inflamed half-spheres, glowing a sullen red. There was no sign of major infection in the skin, however, and she passed on without soothing the insignificant hurts, saving her strength for a greater foe. His muscles were next, muscles that were well developed for a child so young, tough and strong, flexible ropes that twisted and sent off sparks that meant pain as Jendi tossed in fever. There was something deeply amiss here but it was not within the muscles themselves. So far, I've guessed right. Just to be certain that she had not missed something, she did not sink further to examine the nerves quite yet. 
Instead, she went to the torso, as she had been taught, to make certain that the source of his sickness was not in the organs, and began with the heart. An infection of the organs could have been pouring paralyzing poisons into Jendi's blood, poisons that affected the nerve net, but which originated elsewhere. At this time, there was no sign of strain or irritation there either, nor in the gut, but the lungs were congested and irritated, displaying the sullen red glow of inflammation, but they were, as yet, no more serious than a bad cold. But there was definitely something desperately wrong, for all the body's defenses were mobilized. All along the paths of the blood, the body's defensive armies swarmed. Healing energies flowed, yet they traveled to no central battleground, as if they were confused and could not find a target. Just as confused and desperate as I am, she shoved away the thought, failure was not an option. She turned her awareness to the spine, sank deeper yet, looking for the black miasma of damage, the sullen murk of attack. Then she found it, and nearly withdrew, appalled at the magnitude of the problem she faced. The enemy was tiny, tiny, but numbered in countless millions. It subverted the child's own body to create millions more selves with every passing moment. No wonder this fever could not be fought with herbs and medicines. It overwhelmed by sheer numbers, killing the child in the act of spawning more selves from his very substance. But she had seen this kind of enemy before, just not so virulent and not centered in the nerve net and spine. At least she knew the enemy's face now, and she knew how to combat it, provided she had the strength. She drove down her fear, fear that threatened to send her fleeing back to her own body, all her work left undone. She gathered her own energies and lashed out at the enemy with lances and light shafts of purest emerald green. The enemy swallowed her energies, and millions of attacking creatures perished, a little damaged, but only a little, and in the next moment the multitude surged back to life and strength. Now it didn't matter. Now there was nothing but action. This was the moment when she should have been afraid. She should have given up. But now the instinct of the healer had her in a grip that drove everything else out of her mind. She was caught in the battle and could not have pulled away if she wished it. She had been warned of this suicidal drive for self-sacrifice, the trap that the strongest healers were all too prone to fall into, and if there had been another healer there, he would have pulled her out. It was too late. Thought had been squeezed into a tiny compartment, cut off from action, crammed in with the terrible, ice-cold fear. Nothing existed for her but the enemy hordes and the energies with which she lashed them, heedless of what the energy drain was doing to herself. And more, energy drained from her faster than she could replace it. This was a battle she was doomed to lose. And when she lost it, the enemy would move to take her. But she no longer cared. You know... This would probably be going better if we hadn't awakened the captain out of a sound sleep. One lantern illuminated the inside of the tent the two heralds shared. Birds twittered outside, expecting the dawn. Inside, Carowin made her feelings known, while Eldon had made himself vanish in a sound diplomatic move. "'You did what?' Carowin shouted with incredulous wrath when Darion finished his report. Darion stood his ground, backed by the Valdemaran healers, by Nightwind, and by Firesong. They made quite a crowd in Carowin's tent, but didn't quite spill out into the open. He was backed by them, but he had insisted on doing his own talking. I did this, and I'm not a coward who hides behind other people when it comes to standing by what I did. I can defend myself, he had told them, and had been rewarded by the approval in the eyes of both Nightwind and Firesong. 
He felt a little sorry for Carowin's officers, who by now, if they had intended to sleep until true dawn, had been denied that opportunity by the shouting. And if it hadn't been that he'd never been so sure in his entire life that he had done the right thing, he might well have bolted. We had a tactical opportunity that wasn't going to come along again, Harold Captain, he said steadily, looking straight into her eyes and refusing to be intimidated by her fury. Furthermore, you may be in command of the assembled fighters, but I'm not one of the fighters. I'm a mage, and not one under your command. I'm a mage with four years of field experience as well, and I am accustomed to being expected to think for myself. We had our primary objective. We've gotten the language, which Tercel can now take from his own memory and give to anyone else. Keisha and I took the opportunity that was presented to us precisely because, in terms of personnel, it offered a substantial gain, versus, at worst, the minimal loss of a single non-combatant. We had the boy in a vulnerable position, and a moment of opportunity to extract a single fever victim, a moment that was rapidly vanishing. Neither of us is a good enough mind-speaker to contact superiors for advice. There wasn't time to do anything but act. Talk to her in tactical terms, was what Firesong had advised him. Don't talk to her in terms of healer's oaths or humanitarian motives. Give her gains versus losses. I'm not saying she won't see and appreciate the humanitarian motives, just that she's a commander first, and that's how she's going to react. Once she finishes reacting to the insubordination, she'll move right into thinking and analyzing. Firesong was right. As she listened to him, the scowl faded to a mere frown, and the frown to a grimace. Finally, she threw her hands in the air. All right, she acknowledged. I can see that. I just thank the gods that I don't have anyone else in my ranks who's got the curse of thinking for himself. Yes, you do, Caro, Firesong said mildly. You generally make them into officers if they manage not to get themselves or anyone else killed. You can make yourself useful by finding that Daihili and having him drop that language into Elden's skull, she replied sternly to Firesong. She waited for his nod and withdrawal from the tent, then turned back to Darion. You are going to stay here and give me every single detail of what you saw, heard, and did. What about us? Gentian asked, with a wink for Darion that told him he'd won this round. Back to your healer business, she said, making shooing motions with her hands. Everyone else spilled out into the gray light of false dawn, wasting no time in putting some distance between themselves and their commander. Nightwind stayed with Darion, and Carowin didn't object. When everyone else had left the tent, she wearily waved at them to sit. There were only three places to do so in her tent, and she was already occupying the only chair, still dressed in the old shirt and hose she wore to sleep in, her hair coming undone from its braid. So he took a seat on a small campaign chest, leaving the stool for night wind. He went back over the night's events in excruciating detail, leaving out nothing, not even the changes in Highwell's expression. He also did not leave out the alleged ghost cat, although his description was as vague as his own sighting of the thing had been. When he had finished, Carowin brooded in silence for some time, her fingers automatically undoing and rebraiding her hair. Despite the fact that Darion knew they had been right to act as they had, the tension in the tent built until he thought he couldn't bear much more. Granted, he wasn't under Carowin's direct command, but she could order him back to the Vale, and the Taledras would probably enforce her orders. Finally, damn it, you did right, she growled as she bound up the end of her braid. I don't like it one bit. 
but you did right. The tension snapped, replaced by the feeling that someone had removed the weight of a horse from his back. Captain, if anything had been different, if Highwell had been less cooperative, if the victim hadn't been a small child, if that ghost or whatever hadn't been leading him out in the first place, we'd never have done what we did, he replied with feeling. I swear. It's that so-called ghost cat, Carowin said, chewing her lower lip. That's the thing that's... bothering me isn't the right word. It's a more spooky feeling than that. It's not like some shaman's trick or wishful thinking. It seems as if every time it shows up, it guides these people properly, and I have to wonder if it can and will do more than that. You say you saw it. Tercel says he thinks it's real. And whenever anybody so much as mentions it, I get a shiver down my spine that I can't stop. I've had that same shiver before. And, Nightwind prompted alertly, Carowin smiled crookedly, let's just say that it's a sign of one of my gifts. She turned back to Darion. It's a good thing that you aren't under my command, because even if you are right, this is way too close to insubordination for my comfort. However, you aren't, and that lets me out of having to find a way to discipline you for exercising your brains without orders. Yes, Herald Captain, he said, and deemed it wise to say nothing more. Now, you go make yourself useful and try not to get into any more trouble, Carowin ordered. I'd like to talk to this lady for a bit. Darion left, with the distinct impression he'd had a narrow escape indeed, but also with the nagging feeling which grew with every moment that there was something of critical importance that he had left undone. He got no chance to think about it, for the situation that had been at stalemate just a moment before suddenly avalanched down around their ears with no prior warning whatsoever. Oh, hellfires, came the explanation from behind him. Carowin suddenly shot out of her tent as if her hair were on fire, followed by Nightwind, who was moving just as quickly. She sprinted up the path and grabbed Darion by the elbow, startling him into an undignified yelp. I need you, now, she said, as Nightwind grabbed his other elbow. Before he could even blink, the white bulk of Carowin's companion thundered down on them from out of nowhere, and Caro and Nightwind literally threw him up on Saville's bare back. A heartbeat later, Carowin was up behind him, and it was a good thing that he had automatically grabbed a handful of mane, because the companion launched herself into an all-out gallop as soon as the herald's rump touched her back. He clung with hands and thighs, the wind of their passing whipping through Saville's mane until it lashed his face and eyes unmercifully, leaving tiny, stinging welts. He'd heard of the legendary speed of a companion. Now he got a first-hand experience, which would have been breathtaking if it hadn't been so terrifying. In a much shorter time than he would have dreamed possible, they were among Carowin's fighters, and Caro slid down off Saville's back, leaving him still perched there in confusion. Just beyond the screening of trees and bushes, someone shouted in a voice torn by anguish, fear, and rage. "'What's the situation?' she demanded, as one of the fighters separated from the rest and saluted. Things were dead quiet, then all of a sudden there was a ruckus in the camp, the scarred and weathered veteran reported brusquely. Lots of shouting, carrying on, women wailing. Then the men started raising hell over there, and the chief comes tearing through the barricades and starts waving weapons around and shouting at us. You! Carowin slapped Darion's leg to get his attention. We're looking for Tercel, but until then, what's he saying? Belatedly, Darion realized that he understood the shouting perfectly well, and paused to listen to it. What he heard made his jaw drop. Well, Caro demanded, what? Darion licked dry lips. 
He says we sent child snatching demons into his camp last night, and he wants us to bring back his sons right now. Or else. Never mind, I can guess the or else, Carowin swore softly, and it's just our bad luck that your little friends happen to be the chief's offspring, which obviously the older one didn't bother to mention. She chewed on her lower lip, then turned her gaze to her companion. Saville, go take him back to camp, then get your tail back here. This is no place for him. By now, Tercel's given Eldon this language, and we'll see if his silver tongue can lie us out of this mess when he gets here, and we'll pray that Keisha can come up with a cure fast. Saville didn't wait for Darion to object. She all but launched herself out from underneath him, and only a quick grab for her mane kept him from tumbling over her rump. He had the presence of mind to slide over her shoulder as soon as she reached the edge of camp, where his first tent still stood, and slowed a little. He hit the ground running to absorb his own momentum, and it was a good thing that he did. She didn't stop, not at all. She just pivoted on her hind hooves and galloped away again, leaving him panting in the path behind her, staring after her, absently recognizing that there was another companion standing behind him. Gods, now what do I do? What in hell is going on? A voice shrilled behind him. He whirled to find Shandi, clad only in a knee-length shift and barefoot, staring at him out of confused and terrified eyes. Her sleep-tangled hair had fallen half over one of her eyes, and she shoved it out of her face with impatient fingers. The camp's gone crazy. Carlos is frantic, and Keisha's gone, and there's something I, we, have to do with her, she exclaimed, sounding more than a little frantic herself. What's happening? Where's my sister? What is it we have to do? As quickly and succinctly as possible, Darion explained the events of the last twelve candle marks. He got a little shrill toward the end himself, and Shandi stared at him with a blank expression while her companion fidgeted and pranced with anxiety. She hit her forehead with the butt of her palm, muttering to herself, You, me, Keisha, what do we have in common? Balling both hands into fists and pressing them into her temples, she squeezed her eyes shut and her features contorted with pain. What in hell do we have in common? Why am I here? Why do I have to be here? Gods, he thought bitterly, thinking that she meant that she didn't want to be there. Why couldn't she be another healer? Then at least she'd have been of some use to... From out of the thin morning air, the answer came to him, in the dryly amused voice of his teacher, Firesong. He ran to Shandi and shook her shoulders with impatience. Can you work with healers, he demanded. Have you? Her eyes sprang open, and she gaped at him. Yes, of course. As they stared into each other's eyes, they all but shouted in unison, That's it! For the second time that morning, Darion found himself clinging to a companion's bare back, this time with Shandi behind him. Carlos must have taken directions straight from his memory, for the companion wove his way through the forest unerringly, and at speeds that would have guaranteed an accident had he been anything but a companion. He had only time to call to Kuari. Find Daihili, find Tercel, bring him where we were last night, and quickly. Then there was no time for anything but hanging on. When they burst into the little glade where the tent was pitched and flung themselves from Carlos's back, Highwill jumped to his feet with his dagger drawn, then stopped himself just short of attacking them. Darion paid the boy no attention. His eyes looked only for Keisha, and when he saw her, he exclaimed in shock, "'Damn!' Shandi swore. "'She's lost. Darion, link with her, now!' He didn't have to be told." Keisha was a ghostly white. She trembled where she sat, and it looked as if they hadn't reached her a moment too soon. She was caught, trapped in battling a disease she couldn't conquer. If she'd had more practice, she would know how to break free. But of course, she had never healed a life-threatening illness before. 
Darion flung himself down beside her and grabbed one hand as Shandi did the same on her opposite side. They threw their spirits into linkage with hers as swiftly as if they had done so every day for their entire lives. There was a rude shock for a moment as they jockeyed for position, and then they melded into a seamless whole. He poured energies, spun out of the life all around them, into the fading healer. Shandi did the same, but her energies came not from around her, but from her companion. Neither of them saw what Keisha saw and fought, but they felt the battle going on within the boy, and Keisha's renewed strength, as she threw off the intolerable burden of exhaustion, gathered her resources, and flung herself back into the fight. And for a moment, Darion felt her soul-tearing fear that even this would not be enough. He willed more than energy into her. He willed courage, and the memory of that anguished voice crying out, demanding that his sons be returned to him. Whether that was the reason or not, at that moment the tide of battle turned. Keisha began to gain ground against the fever. Shandi and Darion held steady, and with a last desperate outpouring of power, Keisha broke the fever's hold. Shandi dropped out of the meld. Darion held longer, as she chased down the last traces of the illness and burned them away. Only then did he separate himself from her and return his focus to the ordinary world. We're still not done, Shandi said grimly, as he opened his eyes and caught Keisha as she half collapsed against him. There's a war about to start out there. She turned to Hywell. Your father thinks we've sent demons to kidnap you and your brother, and he's got every intention of cutting his way through us to get to you. Hywell's mouth and eyes went round, and Darion's estimation of his intelligence took a giant leap upward. Take Jendi, he cried. Take him up before you on the spirit horse. We will follow with the wise one. Hywell placed one hand on Carlos's forehead as Shandi threw herself on the companion's back. Carlos snorted and nodded vigorously. The young northerner bent and picked up his brother, sleeping deeply, too deeply to stir, but without the hectic flush of fever in his cheeks and no longer tossing in delirium. Shandi reached down for the child and cradled him in front of her, seizing a handful of mane to keep herself steady. Carlos shot off. Hywell leaned down to help Keisha to her feet. She was still coming out of healing trance, blinking at them with bewildered eyes, her legs as shaky as a newborn fawn's. Hywell's the chief's son? she murmured, proving that although she looked no more than half aware, there was little wrong with her mind or her ears. Darion draped her arm over his shoulder as Hywell did the same on her other side. Why didn't you tell us? she asked, turning her gaze on the young northerner. I did not think of it, was his honest reply. For us, to be chief's son is to be no different from any other man. It does not mean that I will be chosen as chief. I am just another hunter of Ghost Cat. Obviously your father doesn't see things that way, Darion retorted. The call of an eagle owl rang out above their heads, startling all of them. Bondmate, they come, Kuari called in his mind as the hoofbeats of several Daihili at the gallop reached their ears. Tercel skidded to a halt on the moss with Pyrene and Marie right beside him. Darion helped Keisha up onto Marie's back, then aided the slightly reluctant Highwell onto Pyrene. This was no time to worry about the mere discomfort of naked Daihili spines. Don't grab the horns, grab the neck brush, Darion ordered as he clambered onto Tercel, and hang on tight. Daihili weren't quite as swift as companions, but they came a close second. They caught up with Carlos and Shandi, who had inexplicably stopped at the edge of the cleared area containing the ghost cat encampment. Then they saw why the others had stopped. There were two heavily armed forces in that clearing, forces who had been about to face off against each other in a battle for blood. 
Both sides had weapons drawn, and there should have been a fight going on at that very moment. The two reasons why that wasn't happening were planted in the clear space, separating the two groups of fighters and holding them apart. Both reasons were white, one glistening in the sunlight, one ephemeral as fog. Both reasons stood side by side in unity, holding off the fighters loyal to them by a force of will so strong that it might just as well have been a solid wall a hundred feet high. One was Eldon's companion. The other was a huge shape, faintly glowing, that could have been an enormous feline. Just as Darion, Hywel, and Keisha arrived, lining up beside Carlos, the ghostly feline turned to face them all. It regarded them with an unwinking gaze as the faces of the northerners turned to see what it was looking at. Stunned silence. Then, with a roar of joy, the chief flung down his axe and shield and hurtled toward them, arms outstretched, his men a scant pace behind him, cheering themselves hoarse. Only Darion continued to watch the ghost cat, so only he saw it wink at him, slowly and deliberately, before it faded entirely from view. Three days later, the morning sun overtopped the trees and golden light illuminated a scene that could not possibly have seemed likely the last time Darion had been here. Where two armies had faced off, an open-sided pavilion stood. Within it, a table and two chairs, one holding Chief Vorden of Ghost Cat Clan, the other Harold Eldon of Valdemar. Around the pavilion, an impromptu festival was going on, as northerners and Valdemarans, Hawk brothers and Lord Breon's folk, cautiously mingled, slowly learning one another's languages. Those who had already undergone torture by Tercel acted as willing translators. Darion finally felt as calm as he looked, and had actually managed to catch up on his lost sleep. It hadn't been easy, though. He'd been much in demand by Ghost Cat and Caro's forces both, though not nearly as much as Keisha. She was their heroine, their savior, practically their saint, right up until the point where she got tired of it all and tartly informed them that they were an affront to her nose, and if they really wanted to do something for her, they could all take baths right now. The subsequent rush for the stream had been something to behold, as were the newly scrubbed northerners, their skin bright red from being scoured so hard. They still treated her with respect, but after that with less awe, which was something of a relief to everyone. The wise ones cannot be disturbed on a whim, or frivolously, Eldon said as Chief Vorden nodded. So the sacred houses of healing will be secret. Of course, Vorden agreed, as if nothing pleased him better. Well, we're making reasonable demands here. I bet Vorden would show a different face if we demanded all the firstborn sons as hostages, say. The holy Dai Healy will conduct the wise ones from their sacred houses to your camp, Eldon continued after a glance at Tercel. The holy Dai Healy will carry your need to the wise ones. Naturally, Vorden replied, shaggy head bobbing. Did he figure this out in advance, or is he making it up as he goes along? Darion whispered to Keisha as they stood solemnly on the Valdemaran side of the negotiation pavilion. Making it up, I think. With some help, Keisha whispered back. Heralds are very good at improvising. So far, Valdemar and the Allies were doing very well out of these negotiations. Things were particularly advantageous for the Daihili, for the holy Daihili were getting the protection of Ghost Cat's warriors, shelter for the winter in barns that Ghost Cat pledged to build, and grain in the winter from Ghost Cat's stores. Virtually everything Eldon asked for, Vorden was agreeing with. 
care for the Daihili in exchange for access to the healers, a set territory in exchange for alliance with Valdemar and the Hawk Brothers, with Ghost Cat guarding the borders against other northern clans. They even agreed to settle and learn to farm in place of their nomadic life of hunting and grazing. They couldn't be more unlike the last lot in that— Blood Bear clan would rather have slit their own throats than take up farming. First, though, they'd have done their best to slit ours. There had been some disappointment when the other healers had examined the survivors of the last bouts of summer fever and had been forced to confess that they could not reverse what movement and strength had already been lost. That disappointment had been overpowered by the relief of knowing that summer fever would never kill or cripple again. Darion kept a steadying arm around Keisha's waist, under the excuse that she was still weak and not entirely easy on her feet. She let him under the same excuse. He didn't think he was going to miss summer dance nearly as much as he had anticipated. He had every intention of taking things slowly, though. This wasn't a veil, and Keisha Alder wasn't Taledras. And I'm not stupid. Offend the local healer? No thank you. What was it Nightwind said once? The ones who know how to put you together also know how to take you apart. Besides, he liked Keisha's friendship. He didn't have nearly enough friends to risk losing one to bad manners. The Northerners hadn't even been the least reluctant about improving their bathing habits after Keisha's initial scolding. As it turned out, they had more wistful tales about a valley full of hot springs that they had been driven out of by a stronger clan, and traditions of steam houses that they hadn't been able to build in far too long. They knew all about flea-killing herbs, but since such things only came into their hands at the midsummer gathering by means of trade, they'd had to do without since the first attack of the fever. Grenthin and several of the Herr Tassi were already constructing a Taledra-style community bathhouse and steamhouse for them at the edge of the village, and Keisha's gifts of fleabane and rosemary had been greeted with cries of joy from the women. In short, these barbarians, at least, were not nearly as barbaric as their appearance had led everyone to believe. Even Kelvrin was happy, for he had an entirely new set of humans to oo and aw over him. And we have this all settled before Harvest Fair and Val's wedding, which makes absolutely everyone happy. Darion felt full of warm contentment and dared to believe that Kevaldemar Vale was going to be hailed as an immediate success, which makes me look awfully good, and which should put Kel's status up a few points as well. Thinking of Kel, Darion took a look around for him and soon saw him the center of a group of awestruck women who admired his handsome feathers and timidly touched the talons he offered for their inspection. Darion strained his ears and discovered with no surprise that the griffin had already gotten Tercel to bestow the ghost cat language on him. But when he heard what Kel was saying to the women, he nearly choked and had to work very hard indeed to keep a properly solemn expression, one in accordance with the gravity of the making of such an important treaty. For Kel had some treaty ideas of his own. It is good luck to scratch a griffin's crest, Kel told the enraptured group. It is, said the boldest of the lot, Hywel's sister, if Darion recalled correctly. She reached out immediately and began gently scratching Kel's outstretched head. Oh, yes, Kel sighed happily. It is well known, an old and treasured tradition. This concludes Owl Sight by Mercedes Lackey and Larry Dixon. Narrated by Kevin T. Collins. 
Copyright 1998 by Mercedes R. Lackey and Larry Dixon. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Mercedes Lackey and Larry Dixon, care of Scoville, Galen, and Gauche Literary Agency, and was produced in the year 2017 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers.